Idle Days on the Yan by Lord Dunsany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Clark. Idle Days on the Yan by Lord Dunsany. So I came down through the wood to the bank of Yan and found, as had been prophesied, the ship Bird of the River about to loose her cable. The captain sat cross-legged upon the white deck with a scimitar lying beside him in its jeweled scabbard, and the sailors toiled to spread the nimble sails to bring the ship into the central stream of Yan, and all the while sang ancient soothing songs, and the wind of the evening descending cool from the snowfields of some mountainous abode of distant gods came suddenly, like glad tidings, to an anxious city, into the wing-like sails. And so we came into the central stream, whereat the sailors lowered the greater sails, but I had gone to bow before the captain, and to inquire concerning the miracles and appearances among men of the most holy gods of whatever land he had come from. And the captain answered that he came from fair Belzund, and worshipped gods that were the least and humblest, who seldom sent the famine or the thunder, and were easily appeased with little battles. And I told how I came from Ireland, which is of Europe, whereat the captain and all the sailors laughed, for they said, there are no such places in all the land of dreams. When they had ceased to mock me, I explained that my fancy mostly dwelt in the desert of Kuparnambo, about a beautiful blue city called Galthoth the Damned, which was sentineled all round by wolves and their shadows, and it had been utterly desolate for years and years because of a curse which the gods once spoke in anger and could never since recall. And sometimes my dreams took me as far as Pungarvis, the red-walled city where the fountains are, which trades with the isles and Thala. When I said this, they complimented me on the abode of my fancy, saying that, though they had never seen these cities, such places might well be imagined. For the rest of that evening I bargained with the captain over the sum that I should pay him for my fare, if God and the tide of Yan should bring us safely as far as the cliffs by the sea, which are named Bar Wool Yan, the Gate of Yan. And now the sun had set, and all the colors of the world and heaven had held a festival with him, and slipped one by one away before the imminent approach of night. The parrots had all flown home to the jungle on either bank. The monkeys in rows in safety and high branches of the trees were silent and asleep. The fireflies in the deeps of the forest were going up and down, and the great stars came gleaming out to look on the face of Yan. Then the sailors lighted lanterns and hung them round the ship, and the light flashed out on a sudden and dazzled Yan, and the ducks that fed along his marshy banks all suddenly arose and made wide circles in the upper air and saw the distant reaches of the Yan and the white mist that softly cloaked the jungle before they returned again into their marshes. And then the sailors knelt on the decks and prayed, not all together, but five or six at a time. Side by side there kneeled down together five or six, for there only prayed at the same time men of different faiths, so that no god should hear two men praying to him at once. As soon as any one had finished his prayer, another of the same faith took his place. Thus knelt the row of five or six with bended heads under the fluttering sail, while the central stream of the river Yan took them on towards the sea, and their prayers rose up from among the lanterns and went toward the stars. And behind them in the after end of the ship the helmsman prayed aloud the helmsman's prayer, which is prayed by all who follow his trade upon the river Yan, of whatever faith they be. And the captain prayed to his little lesser gods, to the gods that bless Belzund. And I too felt that I would pray. Yet I liked not to pray to a jealous God there where the frail affectionate gods whom the heathen love were being humbly invoked. So I bethought me instead of Sheol Nuganoth, whom the men of the jungle have long since deserted, who is now unworshipped and alone. And to him I prayed. And upon us praying the night came suddenly down as it comes upon all men who pray at evening and upon all men who do not yet our prayers comforted our own souls when we thought of the great night to come and so yan bore us magnificently onwards 
for he was elate with molten snow that the Poltiads had brought him from the hills of Hap, and the Marn and Migris were swollen full with floods. And he bore us in his might past Kif and Pir, and we saw the lights of Gulunza. Soon we all slept except the helmsman, who kept the ship in the midstream of Yan. When the sun rose, the helmsman ceased to sing, for by song he cheered himself in the lonely night. When the song ceased, we suddenly all awoke, and another took the helm, and the helmsman slept. We knew that soon we should come to Mandaroon. We made a meal, and Mandaroon appeared. Then the captain commanded, and the sailors loosed again the greater sails, and the ship turned and left the stream of Yan, and came into a harbor beneath the ruddy walls of Mandaroon. Then, while the sailors went and gathered fruits, I came alone to the gate of Mandaroon. A few huts were outside it, in which lived the guard. A sentinel with a long white beard was standing in the gate, armed with a rusty pike. He wore large spectacles, which were covered with dust. Through the gate I saw the city. A deathly stillness was over all of it. The ways seemed untrodden, and moss was thick on doorsteps. In the marketplace huddled figures lay asleep. A scent of incense came wafted through the gateway, of incense and burned poppies. And there was a hum of the echoes of distant bells. I said to the sentinel in the tongue of the region of Yan, Why are they all asleep in this still city? He answered, None may ask questions in this gate for fear they wake the people of the city. For when the people of this city wake, the gods will die. And when the gods die, men may dream no more. And I began to ask him what gods that city worshipped. But he lifted his pike, because none might ask questions there. So I left him and went back to the bird of the river. Certainly Mandaroon was beautiful, with her white pinnacles peering over her ruddy walls and the green of her copper roofs. When I came back again to the bird of the river, I found the sailors were returned to the ship. Soon we weighed anchor and sailed out again, and so came once more to the middle of the river. And now the sun was moving towards his heights, and there had reached us on the river Yan the song of those countless myriads of choirs that attend him in his progress round the world. For the little creatures that have many legs have spread their gauze wings easily on the air, as a man rests his elbows on a balcony, and gave jubilant, ceremonial praises to the sun, or else they move together on the air in wavering dances, intricate and swift, or turned aside to avoid the onrush of some drop of water that a breeze had shaken from a jungle orchid, chilling the air and driving it before it as it fell whirring in its rush to the earth. But all the while they sang triumphantly. For the day is for us, they said, whether our great and sacred father the sun shall bring up more life like us from the marshes, or whether all the world shall end tonight. And there sang all those whose notes are known to human ears, as well as those whose far more numerous notes have never been heard by man. To these a rainy day had been as an era of war that should desolate continents during all the lifetime of a man. And there came also from the dark and steaming jungle to behold and rejoice in the sun the huge and lazy butterflies. And they danced, but danced idly on the ways of the air, as some haughty queen of distant conquered lands might in her poverty and exile dance, in some encampment of the gypsies, for the mere bread to live by. But beyond that would never abate her pride to dance for a fragment more. And the butterflies sung of strange and painted things, of purple orchids and of lost pink cities, and the monstrous colors of the jungle's decay, and they, too, were among those whose voices are not discernible by human ears. And as they floated above the river, going from forest to forest, their splendor was matched by the inimical beauty of the birds who darted out to pursue them. 
or sometimes they settled on the white and wax-like blooms of the plant that creeps and clambers about the trees of the forest, and their purple wings flashed out on the great blossoms as, when the caravans go from neural to face, the gleaming silks flash out upon the snow, where the crafty merchants spread them one by one to astonish the mountaineers of the hills of Nur. But upon men and beasts the sun sent a drowsiness. The river monsters along the river's marge lay dormant in the slime. The sailors pitched a pavilion with golden tassels for the captain upon the deck, and then went, all but the helmsman, under a sail that they had hung as an awning between two masts. Then they told tales to one another, each of his own city, or of the miracles of his god, until all were fallen asleep. The captain offered me the shade of his pavilion with the gold tassels, and there we talked for a while, he telling me that he was taking merchandise to Perdendaris, and that he would take back to Fair Belzund things appertaining to the affairs of the sea. Then, as I watched through the pavilion's opening, the brilliant birds and butterflies that crossed and recrossed the river, I fell asleep, and dreamed that I was a monarch entering his capital underneath arches of flags, and all the musicians of the world were there, playing melodiously their instruments. But no one cheered. In the afternoon, as the day grew cooler again, I awoke and found the captain buckling on his scimitar, which he had taken off him while he rested. And now we were approaching the wide court of Astahan, which opens upon the river, Strange boats of antique design were chained there to the steps. As we neared it, we saw the open marble court, on three sides of which stood the city fronting on colonnades. And in the court, and along the colonnades, the people of that city walked with solemnity and care, according to the rites of ancient ceremony. All in that city was of ancient device. The carving on the houses, which... When age had broken it remained unrepaired, was of the remotest times, and everywhere were represented in stone beasts that have long since passed away from earth, the dragon, the griffin, and the hippogriffin, and the different species of gargoyle. Nothing was to be found, whether material or custom, that was new in Astahan. Now they took no notice at all of us as we went by but continued their processions and ceremonies in the ancient city, and the sailors, knowing their custom, took no notice of them. But I called, as we came near, to one who stood beside the water's edge, asking him what men did in Astahan, and what their merchandise was, and with whom they traded. He said, Here we have fettered and manacled time, who would otherwise slay the gods. I asked him what gods they worshipped in that city, and he said, All those gods whom time has not yet slain. Then he turned from me and would say no more, but busied himself in behaving in accordance with ancient custom. And so, according to the will of Jan, we drifted onward and left Astahan. The river widened below Astahan, and we found in greater quantities such birds as prey on fishes and they were very wonderful in their plumage, and they came not out of the jungle, but flew with their long necks stretched out before them, and their legs lying on the wind behind, straight up the river over the midstream. And now the evening began to gather in. A thick white mist had appeared over the river, and was softly rising higher. It clutched at the trees with long, impalpable arms. It rose higher and higher, chilling the air, and white shapes moved away into the jungle, as though the ghosts of shipwrecked mariners were searching stealthily in the darkness for the spirits of evil that long ago had wrecked them on the yon. As the sun sank behind the field of orchids that grew on the matted summit of the jungle, the river monsters came wallowing out of the slime in which they had reclined during the heat of the day and the great beasts of the jungle came down to drink. The butterflies a while since were gone to rest. In little narrow tributaries that we passed, night seemed already to have fallen, though the sun which had disappeared from us 
had not yet set. And now the birds of the jungle came flying home far over us, with the sunlight glistening pink upon their breasts, and lowered their pinions as soon as they saw the yan, and dropped into the trees. And the widgeon began to go up the river in great companies, all whistling, and then would suddenly wheel and all go down again. And there shot by us the small and arrow-like teal, and we heard the manifold cries of flocks of geese, which the sailors told me had recently come in from crossing over the Lispassian ranges. Every year they come by the same way, close by the peak of Mluna, leaving it to the left, and the mountain eagles know the way they come, and, men say, the very hour, and every year they expect them by the same way as soon as the snows have fallen upon the northern plains. But soon it grew so dark that we saw these birds no more, and only heard the whirring of their wings and of countless others besides, until they all settled down along the banks of the river, and it was the hour when the birds of the night went forth. Then the sailors lit the lanterns for the night, and huge moths appeared, flapping about the ship and at moments their gorgeous colors would be revealed by the lanterns. Then they would pass into the night again, where all was black. And again the sailors prayed, and thereafter we supped and slept, and the helmsman took our lives into his care. When I awoke, I found that we had indeed come to Perdendaris, that famous city, for there it stood upon the left of us, a city fair and notable, and all the more pleasant for our eyes to see after the jungle that was so long with us and we were anchored by the market-place and the captain's merchandise was all displayed and a merchant of perdendaris stood looking at it and the captain had his scimitar in his hand and was beating with it in anger upon the deck and the splinters were flying up from the white planks for the merchant had offered him a price for his merchandise that the captain declared to be an insult to himself and his country's gods, whom he now said to be great and terrible gods, whose curses were to be dreaded. But the merchant waved his hands, which were of great fatness, showing the pink palms, and swore that of himself he thought not at all, but only of the poor folk in the huts beyond the city, to whom he wished to sell the merchandise for as low a price as possible, leaving no remuneration for himself. For the merchandise was mostly the thick tumorund carpets that in the winter keep the wind from the floor, and talib, which the people smoke in pipes. Therefore the merchant said, if he offered a piffic more, the poor folk must go without their tumorunds when the winter came, and without their talib in the evenings, or else he and his aged father must starve together. Thereat the captain lifted his scimitar to his own throat, saying that he was now a ruined man, and that nothing remained to him but death. And while he was carefully lifting his beard with his left hand, the merchant eyed the merchandise again, and said that, rather than see so worthy a captain die, a man for whom he had conceived an especial love when he first saw the manner in which he handled his ship, he and his aged father should starve together, and therefore he offered fifteen piffics more. When he said this, the captain prostrated himself and prayed to his gods that they might yet sweeten this merchant's bitter heart to his little lesser gods, to the gods that bless Belzund. At last the merchant offered yet five piffics more. Then the captain wept, for he said that he was deserted of his gods. And the merchant also wept, for he said that he was thinking of his aged father, and of how he soon would starve. And he hid his weeping face with both his hands, and eyed the talib again between his fingers. And so the bargain was concluded, and the merchant took the tumorund and talib paying for them out of a great clinking purse. And these were packed up into bales again, and three of the merchant's slaves carried them upon their heads into the city. And all the while the sailors had sat silent, cross-legged in a crescent upon the deck, eagerly watching the bargain. And now a murmur of satisfaction arose among them, and they began to compare it among themselves with other bargains that they had known. And I found out from them that there are seven merchants in Perdendaris, 
and that they had all come to the captain one by one before the bargaining began, and each had warned him privately against the others. And to all the merchants the captain had offered the wine of his own country, that they make him fair Belzoond, but could in no wise persuade them to it. But now that the bargain was over, and the sailors were seated at the first meal of the day, the captain appeared among them with a cask of that wine, and we broached it with care, and all made merry together. And the captain was glad in his heart, because he knew that he had much honor in the eyes of his men because of the bargain that he had made. So the sailors drank the wine of their native land, and soon their thoughts were back in fair Belzoond, and the little neighboring cities of Durl and Duz. But for me, the captain poured into a little glass some heavy yellow wine from a small jar which he kept apart among his sacred things. Thick and sweet it was, even like honey. Yet there was in its heart a mighty, ardent fire which had authority over souls of men. It was made, the captain told me, with great subtlety by the secret craft of a family of six who lived in a hut on the mountains of Hianmen. Once in these mountains, he said, he followed the spoor of a bear, and he came suddenly on a man of that family who had hunted the same bear, and he was at the end of a narrow way with precipice all about him, and his spear was sticking in the bear, and the wound not fatal, and he had no other weapon, and the bear was walking towards the man very slowly because his wound irked him, yet he was now very close, and what the captain did he would not say, but every year as soon as the snows are hard and traveling is easy on the Hanmin, that man comes down to the market in the plains and always leaves for the captain in the gate of fair Belzund, a vessel of that priceless secret wine. And as I sipped the wine and the captain talked, I remembered me of stalwart noble things that I had long since resolutely planned, and my soul seemed to grow mightier within me, and to dominate the whole tide of the Yan. It may be that I then slept, or, if I did not, I do not now minutely recall every detail of that morning's occupations. Towards evening I awoke, and wishing to see Perdendaris before we left in the morning, and being unable to wake the captain, I went ashore alone. Certainly Perdendaris was a powerful city. It was encompassed by a wall of great strength and altitude, having in it hollow ways for troops to walk in, and battlements along it all the way, and fifteen strong towers on it in every mile, and copper plaques low down where men could read them, telling in all languages of those parts of the earth, one language on each plaque, the tale of how an army once attacked Perdendaris and what befell that army. Then I entered Perdendaris and found all the people dancing, clad in brilliant silks, and playing on the tambang as they danced. For a fearful thunderstorm had terrified them while I slept, and the fires of death, they said, had danced over Perdendaris, and now the thunder had gone leaping away large and black and hideous, they said, over the distant hills, and had turned round snarling at them, showing his gleaming teeth, and had stamped as he went upon the hilltops until they rang as though they had been bronze. And often and again they stopped in their merry dance, and prayed to the God they knew not, saying, O oh God, that we know not, we thank thee for sending the thunder back to his hills. And I went on and came to the market-place, and lying there upon the marble pavement, I saw the merchant fast asleep, and breathing heavily, with his face and the palms of his hands towards the sky, and slaves were fanning him to keep away the flies. And from the market-place I came to a silver temple, and then to a palace of onyx, and there were many wonders in Perdendaris, and I would have stayed and seen them all. But as I came to the outer wall of the city, I suddenly saw in it a huge ivory gate. For a while I paused and admired it. Then I came nearer and perceived the dreadful truth. The gate was carved out of one solid piece. 
I fled at once through the gateway and down to the ship, and even as I ran, I thought that I heard far off on the hills behind me the tramp of the fearful beast by whom that mass of ivory was shed, who was perhaps even then looking for his other tusk. When I was on the ship again, I felt safer, and I said nothing to the sailors of what I had seen. And now the captain was gradually awakening. Now night was rolling up from the east and north, and only the pinnacles of the towers of Perdendera still took the fallen sunlight. Then I went to the captain and told him, quietly, of the thing I had seen, and he questioned me at once about the gate in a low voice that the sailors might not know, and I told him how the weight of the thing was such that it could not have been brought from afar, and the captain knew that it had not been there a year ago. We agreed that such a beast could never have been killed by any assault of man, and that the gate must have been a fallen tusk, and one fallen near, and recently. Therefore he decided that it were better to flee at once, so he commanded, and the sailors went to the sails, and others raised the anchor to the deck, and just as the highest pinnacle of marble lost the last rays of the sun, we left Perdendaris, that famous city. And night came down and cloaked Perdendaris, and hid it from our eyes, which as things have happened will never see it again. For I have heard, since, that something swift and wonderful has suddenly wrecked Perdendaris in a day, towers, and walls, and people. And the night deepened over the river Yan, a night all white with stars, and with the night there rose the helmsman's song. As soon as he had prayed, he began to sing to cheer himself all through the lonely night. But first he prayed, praying the helmsman's prayer. And this is what I remember of it, rendered into English, with a very feeble equivalent of the rhythm that seemed so resonant in those tropic nights. To whatever God may hear. Wherever there be sailors, whether of river or sea, whether their way be dark or whether through storm, whether their peril be of beast or of rock, or from enemy lurking on land or pursuing on sea, wherever the tiller is cold or the helmsman stiff, wherever sailors sleep or helmsmen watch, guard, guide, and return us to the old land that has known us, to the far homes that we know, to all the gods that are, to whatever God may hear. So he prayed, and there was silence. And the sailors laid them down to rest for the night. The silence deepened, and was only broken by the ripples of yawn that lightly touched our prow. Sometimes some monster of the river coughed. Silence and ripples ripples and silence again and then his loneliness came upon the helmsman and he began to sing and he sang the market songs of durl and duz and the old dragon legends of belzund many a song he sang telling to spacious and exotic yan the little tales and trifles of his city of durl and the songs welled up over the black jungle and came into the clear, cold air above, and the great bands of stars that look on Yan began to know the affairs of Durl and Duz, and of the shepherds that dwelt in the fields between, and the flocks that they had, and the loves that they had loved, and all the little things that they hoped to do. And as I laid wrapped up in skins and blankets, listening to those songs, and watching the fantastic shapes of the great trees like to black giants stalking through the night, I suddenly fell asleep. When I awoke, great mists were trailing away from the yan, and the flow of the river was tumbling now tumultuously, and little waves appeared, for yan had scented from afar the ancient crags of Glorm, and knew that their ravines lay cool before him, wherein he should meet the merry wild Irillion, rejoicing from fields of snow. 
So he shook off from him the torpid sleep that had come upon him in the hot and scented jungle, and forgot its orchids and its butterflies, and swept on turbulent, expectant, strong. And soon the snowy peaks of the hills of Glorm came glittering into view. And now the sailors were waking up from sleep. Soon we all eat, and then the helmsman laid him down to sleep while a comrade took his place, and they all spread over him their choicest furs. And in a while we heard the sound that the Aurelian made as she came down, dancing from the fields of snow. And then we saw the ravine in the hills of Glorm, lying precipitous and smooth before us, into which we were carried by the leaps of Jan. And now we left the steamy jungle and breathed the mountain air. The sailors stood up and took deep breaths of it, and thought of their own far-off Acrochin hills, on which were Durl and Duz. Below them in the plains stands fair Belzund. A great shadow brooded between the cliffs of Glorm, but the crags were shining above us like gnarled moons, and almost lit the gloom. Louder and louder came the Aurelian's song, and the song of her dancing down from the fields of snow. And soon we saw her white and full of mists, and wreathed with rainbows delicate and small, that she had plucked up near the mountain's summit from some celestial garden of the sun. Then she went away seawards with the huge grey yawn, and the ravine widened and opened upon the world, and our rocking ship came through to the light of the day. And all that morning and all the afternoon we passed through the marshes of Ponduvery, and Jan widened there, and flowed solemnly and slowly, and the captain bade the sailors beat on bells to overcome the dreariness of the marches. At last the Erusian mountains came in sight, nursing the villages of Penkai and Blut, and the wandering streets of Mlo where priests propitiate the avalanche with wine and maize. Then night came down over the plains of Tlun, and we saw the lights of Capardania. We heard the path knights beating upon drums as we passed Imaut and Golzunda. Then all but the helmsmen slept, and villages scattered along the banks of the Yan heard all that night in the helmsmen's unknown tongue the little songs of cities that they knew not. I awoke before dawn, with a feeling that I was unhappy before I remembered why. Then I recalled that by the evening of the approaching day, according to all foreseen probabilities, we should come to Bar Wol Yan, and I should part from the captain and his sailors. And I had liked the man because he had given me of his yellow wine that was set apart among his sacred things and many a story he had told me about his fair Belzund between the Akrokchen hills and the Hyanmin, and I had liked the ways that his sailors had, and the prayers that they prayed at evening side by side, grudging not one another their alien gods, and I had a liking, too, for the tender way in which they often spoke of Durl and Daz, for it is good that men should love their native cities and the little hills that hold those cities up. And I had come to know who would meet them when they returned to their homes, and where they thought the meetings would take place, some in a valley of the Akrokchen Hills, where the road comes up from Yan, others in the gateway of one or another of the three cities, and others by the fireside in the home. And I thought of the danger that had menaced us all alike outside Perdendaris, a danger that, as things have happened, was very real. And I thought, too, of the helmsman's cheery song in the cold and lonely night, and how he had held our lives in his careful hands. And as I thought of this, the helmsman ceased to sing, and I looked up and saw a pale light had appeared in the sky, and the lonely night had passed and the dawn widened, and the sailors awoke. And soon we saw the tide of the sea himself advancing resolute between Jan's borders, and Jan sprang lithely at him, and they struggled a while. Then Jan and all that was his were pushed back northward, so that the sailors had to hoist the sails, and, the wind being favorable, 
we still held onwards. And we passed Gondara, and Narl, and Haz, and we saw memorable holy Golnas, and heard the pilgrims praying. When we awoke after the midday rest, we were coming near to Nen, the last of the cities on the river Yan, and the jungle was all about us once again, and about Nen. But the great Mloon ranges stood up over all things and watched the city from beyond the jungle. Here we anchored, and the captain and I went up into the city and found that the wanderers had come into Nen. And the wanderers were a weird, dark tribe that once in every seven years came down from the peaks of Mloon, having crossed by a pass that is known to them from some fantastic land that lies beyond, and the people of Nen were all outside their houses, and all stood wondering at their own streets. For the men and women of the wanderers had crowded all the ways, and every one was doing some strange thing. Some danced astounding dances that they had learned from the desert wind, rapidly curving and swirling till the eye could follow no longer. Others played upon instruments beautiful, wailing tunes that were full of horror, which souls had taught them, lost by night in the desert, that strange far desert from which the wanderers came. None of their instruments were such as were known in Nen, nor in any part of the regions of the Yan. Even the horns out of which some were made were of beasts that none had seen along the river, for they were barbed at the tips, and they sang in the language of Nun, songs that seemed to be akin to the mysteries of night, and to the unreasoned fear that haunts dark places. Bitterly, all the dogs of Nen distrusted them, and the wanderers told one another fearful tales, for though no one in Nen knew aught of their language, they could see the fear in the listeners' faces, and as the tale wound on, the whites of their eyes showed vividly in terror, as the eyes of some little beast whom the hawk has seized. Then the teller of the tale would smile and stop, and another would tell his story, and the teller of the first tale's lips would chatter with fear. And if some deadly snake chanced to appear, the wanderers would greet him as a brother, and the snake would seem to give his greetings to them before he passed on again. Once that most fierce and lethal of tropic snakes, the giant Lythra, came out of the jungle and all down the street, the central street of Nen, and none of the wanderers moved away from him, but they all played sonorously on drums, as though he had been a person of much honor and the snake moved through the midst of them and smote none. Even the wanderer's children could do strange things, for if any one of them met with a child of Nen, the two would stare at each other in silence with large grave eyes. Then the wanderer's child would slowly draw from his turban a live fish or snake, and the children of Nen could do nothing of that kind at all. Much I should have wished to stay and hear the hymn with which they greet the night, that is answered by the wolves on the heights of Mloon. But it was now time to raise the anchor again, that the captain might return from Bar Wul Yan upon the landward tide. So we went on board and continued down the Yan. And the captain and I spoke little, for we were thinking of our parting, which should be for long. And we watched instead the splendor of the westering sun, for the sun was a ruddy gold, but a faint mist cloaked the jungle lying low, and into it poured the smoke of the little jungle cities, and the smoke of them met together in the mist, and joined into one haze, which became purple, and was lit by the sun, as the thoughts of men become hallowed by some great and sacred thing. Sometimes one column from a lonely house would rise up higher than the city's smoke, and gleam by itself in the sun. And now, as the sun's last rays were nearly level, we saw the sight that I had come to see. For from two mountains that stood on either shore, two cliffs of pink marble came out into the river, all glowing in the light of the low sun, and they were quite smooth and of mountainous altitude, and they nearly met, 
and Jan went tumbling between them and found the sea. And this was Bar Wol Jan, the gate of Jan. And in the distance through that barrier's gap, I saw the azure indescribable sea, where little fishing boats went gleaming by. And the sun set, and the brief twilight came, and the exultation of the glory of Bar Wol Jan was gone. Yet still the pink cliffs glowed, the fairest marvel that the eye beheld, and this in a land of wonders. And soon the twilight gave place to the coming out of stars, and the colors of Bar Wol Jan went dwindling away, and the sight of those cliffs was to me as some chord of music that a master's hand had launched from the violin, which carries to heaven or fairy the tremulous spirits of men. And now by the shore they anchored and went no further, for they were sailors of the river and not of the sea, and knew the Yan, but not the tides beyond. And the time was come when the captain and I must part, he to go back again to his fair Belzund in sight of the distant peaks of the Hian Min, and I to find my way by strange means back to those hazy fields that all poets know, wherein stand small, mysterious cottages through whose windows, looking westwards, you may see the fields of men, and looking eastwards, see glittering elfin mountains tipped with snow, going range on range into the region of myth and beyond it into the kingdom of fantasy, which pertained to the lands of dream. Long we regarded one another, knowing that we should meet no more, for my fancy is weakening as the years slip by, and I go ever more seldom into the lands of dream. Then we clasped hands uncouthly on his part, for it is not the method of greeting in his country and he commended my soul to the care of his own gods, to his little lesser gods, the humble ones, to the gods that bless Belzund. End of Idle Days on the Yan The Little Maid at the Door by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dahlman. The Little Maid at the Door by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. Joseph Bailey and his wife Anne came riding down from Salem Village. They had started from their home in Newbury the day before and had stayed overnight with their relative, Sergeant Thomas Putnam, in Salem Village, and they were on their way to the election in Boston. The road wound along through the woods through Salem to Lynn. It was some time since they had passed a house. May was nearly gone. The pinks and the blackberry vines were in flower. All of the woods were full of an indefinite and composite fragrance, made up of the breaths of myriads of green plants and seen and unseen blossoms, like a very bouquet of spring. The newly-leaved trees cast shadows that were as much part of the tender surprise of the spring as the new flowers. They flickered delicately before Joseph Bailey and his wife Anne on the grassy ridges of the road, but they did not remark them their own fancies cast gigantic projections which eclipsed the sweet show of the spring and almost their own personalities that year the leaves came out and the flowers bloomed in vain for the people in and about salem village there was epidemic a disease of the mind which deafened and blinded to all it save its own pains anne bailey on the pillion snuggled close against her husband's back her fearful eyes peered out the road around his shoulder. She was a young and handsome woman. She had on her best mantle of sad-colored silk and a fine black hood with a top knot, but she did not think of that. Joseph, what is it on the road before us? She whispered timorously. He pulled up the horse with a great jerk. Where? He whispered back. There, there, at the right, just beyond that laurel thicket. "'Tis somewhat black, and it moves. "'There, there, oh, Joseph!' 
joseph bailey sat stiff and straight in his saddle like a soldier his face was pale and stern his eyes full of horror and defiance see you it anne whispered again there now it moves what is it i see it said joseph in a loud bold voice and whatever it be i will yield not to it and neither will you good wife anne reached around and caught at the reins let's go back she moaned faintly oh joseph let us not pass it my spirit faints within me i see its back among the laurel blooms tis the black beast they tell of let us turn back joseph let us turn back be still woman returned her husband jerking the reins from her hands what think ye twould profit us to turn back to salem village i trow that if it be one of the black beasts here there's a full herd of them there there is not left but us to ride past it as best we may sit fast and listen you not to it whatever it promise you joseph looked down the road towards the laurel bushes his muscles now as tense as a bow and hid her face in his shoulder suddenly he shouted with a great voice like a herald away with ye ye cursed beast away with ye we are not of your kind we are gospel folk we have naught to do with you or your master away with ye the horse leaped forward there was a great cracking among the laurel bushes at the right a glossy black back and some white horns heaved over them and then some black flanks plunged heavily out of sight oh shrieked anne has it gone good men has it gone the lord hath delivered us from the snare of the enemy answered joseph solemnly what looked it like joseph what looked it like like no beast that was saved in the ark had it fiery eyes asked anne trembling tis well you did not see them ride fast oh ride fast anne pleaded clutching hard at her husband's cloak it may follow our track the horse went down the road at a quick trot anne kept peering back and starting at every sound in the woods do you mind the tale of samuel endicott told last night she said shuddering how on his trip to barbados he sitting on the windlass on a bright moonshiny night was shook violently and saw the appearance of that witch goody bradbury with a white cap and a white neckcloth on her it was a dreadful tale it was not the sight of mercy lewis and sergeant thomas putnam's daughter anne when they were set upon and nigh choked to death by goody proctor know you that within a half mile we must pass the proctor house anne gave a shuddering sigh i would if i were home again she moaned they say twas full of evil things and that the black man himself kept tavern there since goodman proctor and his wife were in jail did you mind what goodwife putnam said of the black head like a hog's that goodman pearly saw it at the keeping-room window as he passed and the rumbling noises and the yellow birds that flow around the chimney and twittered like a psalm tune oh joseph there is a yellow bird now in the birch tree see see they had come into a little space where the woods were thinner joseph urged his horse forward we will not slack our pace for any black beasts nor any yellow birds he cried in a valiant voice there was a passing gleam of little yellow wings in the birch tree he has flown away said anne tis best to front them as you do good men but i have not the courage what looked like a common yellow bird his wings shone like gold think you it has gone forward to the proctor house it matters not so it but fly up before us said joseph bailey he was somewhat older than anne fair-haired and fair beard with blue eyes set so deep under heavy brows that they looked black his face was at once stern and nervous showing not only the spirit of warfare against his foes but the elements of strife within himself they rode on and the woods grew thicker the horses hoofs made only a faint liquid pad on the mossy road 
Suddenly he stopped and whinnied. Anne clutched at her husband's arm. They sat motionless, listening. The horse whinnied again. Suddenly Joseph started violently and stared into the woods on the left, and Anne also. A long defile of dark evergreens stretched up the hill, with mysterious depths of blue-black shadows between them. The air had an earthy dampness. Joseph shook the reins fiercely over the horse's back and shouted to him in a loud voice. "'Did you see it?' gasped Anne, when they had come into a lighter place. "'Was it not a black man?' Fear not, we have outridden him, said her husband, setting his thin, intense face proudly ahead. I would that we were safe in Newbury, Anne moaned. I would that we had never set out. Think you not Dr. Mather will ride back from Boston with us to keep the witches off? I will bide there forever if he will not. I will never come this dreadful road again else. What is that? Oh, what is that? "'Tis a voice coming out of the woods, like a great roar. "'Joseph, what is that? "'That was a black cat run across the road into the bushes. "'Twas a black cat, Joseph. Let's turn back. "'No, the black man is behind us, and the beast. "'What shall we do? What shall we do? "'Oh, oh, I began to twitch like Anne and Mercy last night. "'My feet move. I cannot stop them. "'Now there is a pin thrust in my arm. I am pinched.' There are fingers at my throat. Joseph, Joseph! Go to prayer, sweetheart, shouted Joseph. Go to prayer. Be not afraid. Twill drive them away. Away with ye, goody Bradbury. Away, goody Proctor. Go to prayer. Go to prayer. Joseph bent low in the saddle and lashed the horse, which sprang forward with a mighty bound. The green branches rushed about their faces. Joseph prayed in a loud voice. Anne clung to him convulsively, panting for breath. Suddenly they came out of the woods and into a cleared space. The Proctor House! The Proctor House! Anne shrieked. Mercy Lewis said twas full of devils. What shall we do? She hid her face on her husband's shoulder, sobbing and praying. The Proctor House stood on the left of the road, where there was some peach trees in front of it, and their blossoms showed a pink spray against the gray unpainted walls. On one side of the house was a great barn, with its doors wide open, on the other a deep ploughed field, with the plough sticking in a furrow. John Proctor had been arrested and thrown into jail for witchcraft in April before his spring planting was done. Joseph Bailey reined in his horse opposite the Proctor house. Anne, he whispered, his voice full of horror. What is it? she returned wildly. Anne! Goodman Proctor looks forth from the chamber window, and Goody Proctor stands outside by the well, and they are both in jail in Boston. Joseph's whole frame shook in a strange, rigid fashion, as if his joints were locked. Look, Anne, he whispered. I cannot. Look. Anne turned her head. Why, she said, and her voice was quite natural and sweet. It even had a tone of glad relief in it. I see not but the little maid in the door. See you not, Goodman Proctor, in the window? Nay, said Anne, smiling. I see not but the little maid in the door. She is in a blue petticoat, and she has a yellow head. But her little cheeks are pale, I trow. See you not, good wife Proctor, in the yard by the well? asked Joseph. Nay, Goodman, I see not but the little maid in the door. She has a fair face. But now she falls a-weeping. Oh, I fear lest she be all alone in the house. I tell you, Goodman Proctor and Good Wife Proctor are both there, returned Joseph. Think you I see not with my own eyes? Goodman Proctor has on a red cap, and Good Wife Proctor holds a spindle. He urged on the horse with a sudden cry. Now the prayers do stick in my throat, he groaned. I would that we were out of this devil's nest. Joseph implored Anne, Prithee, wait a minute. The little maid is calling mother after me. Saw you not how she favored our own little Susanna who died? Hear her. There was not there but the little maid. Joseph, I pray you stop. Nay, I will ride till the nag drops, said Joseph Bailey with a lash. This last will be too much. I tell you, they are there. They are also in jail. Tis hellish work. 
and said no more for a little space a curve in the road hid the proctor house from sight suddenly she raised a great cry oh oh she screamed tis gone tis gone from my foot joseph stopped what is gone my shoe but now i miss it from my foot i must alight and go back for it joseph started the horse again and caught at the reins stop goodman she cried imperatively i tell you i must have my shoe and i tell you i'll stop for no shoe in this place were it made of gold goodman you know not what shoe tis tis one of my fine shoes in which i have never taken steps they have the crimson silk lacings i have even carried them in my hand to a meeting-house on a sabbath wearing my old shoes and only put them on at the door think you that i will lose that shoe stop the nag but joseph kept on grimly think you that i will go barefoot or with one shoe into boston said anne know you that these shoes which were a present from my mother cost bravely i trow you will needs loosen your purse strings well before we pass the first shop in boston well go on and you will and tis but a matter of my slipping down from the pillion and running back a few yards joseph bailey turned the horse about but anne remonstrated nay she said i want not to go thus i am tired of the saddle i would like to feel my feet for a space her husband looked around at her with wonder and suspicion dark thoughts came into his mind she laughed nay she said make no such face at me i go not back to meet any black man nor sign any book i go for my fine shoe with the crimson lacing tis but a moment since you were afraid said joseph have you no fear now his blue eyes looked sharply into hers she looked back at him soberly and innocently in truth i feel no such fear as i did she answered if i mistake not your bold front and your prayers drove away the evil ones i will say a psalm as i go and i trow naught will harm me anne slipped lightly down from the pillion and pulled off her one remaining shoe and her stockings they were her fine worked silk ones she could not walk with them over the rough road then she sat forth very slowly peering here and there in the undergrowth beside the road until she passed the curve and the reach of her husband's eyes then she gathered up her crimson taffeta petticoat and ran like a deer with long graceful leaps looking neither to the right nor left straight back to the proctor house in the door of the house stood the tiny girl with a soft shock of yellow hair she wore a little straight blue gown and her baby feet were bare curling over the sunny doorstep when she saw anne coming she started as if to run and then she stood still her soft eyes wary her mouth quivering anne bailey ran up quickly and threw her arms around her kneeling down on the step what is your name little maid she asked in a loving agitated voice abigail proctor replied the little maid shyly in her sweet childish treble then she tried to free herself but anne held her fast nay be not afraid sweet she said i love you i once had a little maid like you for my own tell me dear heart are you all alone in the house then the child fell to crying again and clung around anne's neck is there anybody in the house sweet anne whispered fondling her and pressing the wet baby cheek to her own the constables came and took them sobbed the little maid they put my poppet down the well and they pulled mother and sarah down the road they took father before that and mary warren did gib and point the constables pulled benjamin away too i want my mother your mother shall come again said anne take comfort little dear heart they cannot have the will to keep her long away there there i tell you she will come you watch in the door you will see her come down the road she smoothed back the little maid's yellow hair and wiped the tears from her little face with the corner of her beautiful embroidered neckerchief then she saw that the face was all grimy with tears and dust and she went over to the well which was near the door and drew a bucket of water swiftly with her strong young arms then she wet a corner of the neckerchief and scrubbed the little maid's face bidding her to shut her eyes then kissed her over and over now you are sweet and clean she said little dear heart 
I have some sugar cakes in my bag for you, and then I must be gone. The little maid looked at her eagerly. Her cheeks were waxen, and the blue veins showed in her full childish forehead. Anne pulled some little cakes out of the red velvet satchel she wore at her waist, and Abigail reached out for one with a hungry cry. The tears sprang to Anne's eyes. She put the rest of the cakes in a little pile on the doorstone and watched the child eat. Then she gathered her up in her arms. "'Good-bye, sweetheart,' she said, kissing the soft, trembling mouth, the sweet hollow under the chin, and the clinging hands." Before long, I shall come this way again, and do you stand at the door when I go past? She put her down and hastened away, but little Abigail ran after her. Anne stopped and knelt and fondled her again. Go back, dearie, she pleaded. Go back and eat the sugar cakes. But this beautiful, kind vision in the crimson taffeta, with the rosy cheeks and the sweet black eyes, looking out from the French hood, with the gleam of gold and delicate embroidery between the silken folds of her mantilla, with the ways like her mother's, was more to the deserted Abigail Proctor than the sugar cakes, although she was sorely hungry for them. She stood aloof with pitiful, determined eyes until Anne's back was turned then as she followed anne looked around and saw her and caught her up again my dear heart my dear heart she said and she was half sobbing now must you go back else i fear harm will come to you my good man is waiting for me yonder and i know not what he will do or say nay you must go back i would i could keep you my dear abigail but you must go back anne bailey put the little maid down and gave her a gentle push Go back, she said, smiling, with her eyes full of tears. Go back and eat the sugar cakes. Then she sped on swiftly. As she neared the curve in the road, she thrust a band in her pocket and drew forth a dainty shoe with dangling laces of crimson silk. She glanced around with a smile and a backward wave of her hand. The glowing crimson of her petticoat showed for a minute through the green mist of the undergrowth. Then she disappeared. The little maid Abigail stood still in the road, gazing after her. Her soft pink mouth opened, her hands clutching at her blue petticoat, as if she would thus hold herself back from following. She heard the tramp of a horse's feet beyond the curve, then it died away. She turned about and went back into the house, with tears rolling over her cheeks, but she did not sob aloud, as she would have done had her mother been near to hear. A pitiful conviction of the hopelessness of all the appeals of grief was stealing over her childish mind she had been alone in the house three nights and two days ever since her sister sarah and her brother benjamin had been arrested for witchcraft and carried to jail long before that her parents john and elizabeth proctor had disappeared down the boston road in charge of the constables none of the family was spared save this little abigail who was deemed too young and insignificant to have dealings with satan and was therefore not thrown into prison but was left alone in the desolate proctor house in the midst of the woods said to be full of evil spirits and witches to die of fright or starvation as she might there was but little mercy shown the families of those accused of witchcraft let some of goody proctor's familiars minister unto the brat one of the constables had said with a stern laugh when abigail had followed wailing after her brother and sister on the day of their arrest yea said another she can send her yellow bird or her black hog to keep her company i wot her tears will soon be dried then the stoutly tramping horses had borne out of sight and bearing the mocking faces of the constables sarah's fair agonized one turned backward towards her little deserted sister and benjamin raised a brave youthful clamor of indignation let us loose abigail heard him shout let us loose i tell ye ye are fools rather than we are witches ye are fools and murderers let us loose i tell ye abigail waited long thinking her brother's words would prevail but neither he nor sarah returned and the sounds all died away and she went back to the house sobbing the damp spring night was setting down in a palpable mist and the woods seemed full of voices the little maid had heard enough of the terrible talk of the day to fill her innocent head with vague superstitious horror she threw her apron over her head and fled blindly through the woods and now and then she fell down and bruised herself and rose up lamenting sorely with nobody to hear her 
as soon as she was in the house she shut the doors and barred them with the great bars that had been made as protection against indians and now might wax useless against worse than savages according to the belief of the colony all the night the little maid shrieked and sobbed and called on her father and her mother and her sister and her brother men faring in the road betwixt boston and salem village heard her with horror and fled past with psalm and prayer their blood cold in their veins they related the next day to the raging terror-stricken people how at midnight the accursed proctor house was full of flitting infernal lights and howling with devilish spirits and added a death-dealing tale of some godly woman of the village who outrode their horses on a broomstick and disappeared into the proctor house the next day the little maid unbarred the door and stood there watching up and down the road for her mother or some other to come but they came not although she watched all day that night she did not sob and call out she had become afraid of her own voice and discovered it had no effect to bring her help then too early in the night she had heard noises about the house which frightened her and made her think that perchance the dreadful black beast for which she had heard them discourse was abroad the next morning she found that two horses and a cow and a calf were gone from the barn also there was left scarce anything for her to eat in the house there had been some loaves of bread some boiled meat and some cakes now they were all gone and also all of the meal from the chest and the potatoes and the pork from the cellar but for the last she did not care since she was not old enough to make a fire and cook she had left for food only a little cold porridge and a blue bowl and that she ate up at once and had no more and a little buttermilk and a crock which she not being over fond of it served her longer but that was all she had for a day and a night until goodwife ann bailey gave her the sugar cakes these she ate up at once on her return to the house then again she stood watching in the door but nothing passed along the road save a partridge or a squirrel it was accounted a bold thing for any solitary traveller to come this way save a witch and she it was supposed might find many comrades in the woods beside the road and in the proctor house which was held to be sort of a devil's tavern but now no witch came nor any of her uncanny friends unless indeed a squirrel or a partridge were familiar demons in disguise nothing was too harmless and simple to escape that imputation of the devil's mask abigail took her little pewter porringer from the cupboard and got herself a drink of water from the bucketful that goodwife bailey had drawn and then she stood on a stone and peered into the well leaning over the curb her poppet was in there her dear rag doll that sarah had made for her and dressed in a beautiful silver brocade made from a piece of a wedding gown that was bought from england one of the constables had caught sight of little abigail proctor's poppet and being straightway filled with a suspicion that it was an image whereby goody proctor afflicted her victims by proxy had seized it and thrown it into the well the other constables had chidden him for such rashness saying it should have been carried to boston and produced as evidence at the trial and little abigail had shrieked out in panic for her poppet she could see nothing of it now and she went back to her watching place in the door in the afternoon she felt sorely hungry again and searched through the house for food then she went out to the sunny field behind the house and found some honeysuckle on the rocks and sucked the honey greedily from their horns on her return to the house she found a corn cob which she snatched up and folded in her apron and began tending she sat down in the doorway in her little chair which she dragged out of the keeping room and hugged the poor poppet close and crooned over it be not afraid she said i will not let the black beast harm you i promise you i will not that night she formed a new plan for her solace and protection in the lonely darkness all of the garments of her lost parents and her sister and her brother that she could find she gathered together and formed a circle on the keeping room floor then she crept inside with her corn cob poppet and lay there hugging it all night the next day she watched again in the door but now she was weak and faint and her little legs trembled so under her that she could not stand and watch but sat in her small straight-backed chair holding her poppet and peering forth wistfully 
in the course of the day she made a shift to creep out into the fields again and lying flat on some sun-heated rocks she sucked some more honey drops from the honeysuckles she found too on the edge of the woods some young wintergreen leaves and she even pulled some blue violets and ate them but the delicate sweet and aromatic fare in the spring larder of nature was poor nourishment for a human baby poor little abigail proctor could scarcely creep home still clinging fast to her poppet scarcely lifted herself into her chair in the door scarcely crawled inside her fairy ring of her loved one's belongings at night she rolled herself tightly in an old cloak of her father's and it was a sweet and harmless outcome of the dreadful superstition of the day grafted on an innocent childish brain that it seemed to partake of the bodily presence of her father and protect her all night long she lay there her mother cooked good meat and broth and sweet cakes and she ate her fill of them but in the morning she was too weak to turn her little body over she could not get to her watching place in the door but that made no difference to her for she did not fairly know that she was not there it seemed to her that she sat in her little chair looking up the road and down the road she saw the green branches weaving together and hiding the sky to the northward and the southward she saw the flushes of white and rose in the flowering undergrowth she saw the people coming and going there were her father and mother now coming with a store of food and presents for her now following the constables out of sight there was that fine pageant passing as she had seen it pass once before of the two magistrates their worshipful masters john hawthorne and jonathan corwin with the marshal constables and aides splendid and awe-inspiring in all of their trappings of office to examine the accused in the salem meeting-house there were the ministers paris and noise coming with severe malignant faces to question her mother as to whether she had afflicted mary warren their former maidservant who was now bewitched there went benjamin clamouring out boldly at his captors there came sarah with the poppet which she had drawn out of the well shaking the water from its silver brocade all this the little maid abigail proctor saw through her half delirious fancy as she lay weakly on the keeping-room floor but she saw not the reality of her sister sarah coming about four o'clock in the afternoon sarah proctor tall and slender in her limp bedraggled dress with her fair severe face set in a circle of red shawl which she had pinned under her chin came resolutely down the road from boston driving a black cow before her with a great green branch she was nearly fainting with weariness but she set her dusty shoes down swiftly among the road weeds and her face was as unyielding as an indian's when she came in sight of the proctor house she stopped a second abigail she called abigail there was no answer and she went more swiftly than before when she reached the house she called again abigail but did not wait except while she tied the black cow by a rope which was around its neck to a peach tree then she ran in and found the little maid her sister abigail on the floor in the keeping room she got down on her knees beside her and abigail smiled up at her face waveringly she still thought herself in the door and she had just seen her sister come down the road abigail what have they done to you asked sarah in a sharp voice and the little maid only smiled abigail abigail what is it sarah took hold of the child's shoulders and shook her but she got no word back only the smile ceased and the eyelids drooped faintly are you hungry abigail the little maid shook her head softly it cannot be that said sarah as if half to herself there was enough in the house but what is it abigail look at me how long is it since you have eaten abigail yesterday whispered the little maid dreamily what did you eat then some posies and leaves out in the field what became of all the bread that was baked and the cakes and the meat i have forgot no you have not tell me abigail the black beast came in the night and did eat it all up and the cow and the calf and the horses too the black beast i heard him in the night and in the morning twas gone sarah sprang up 
robbers and murderers she cried in a fierce voice but the little maid on the floor did not start she shut her eyes again and looked up and down the road sarah got the bucket quickly and went out in the yard to the cow down on her knees in the grass she went and milked she then carried in the bucket strained the milk with trembling haste and poured some into abigail's little pewter porringer she was wont to love it warm she whispered with white lips she bent close over the little maid and raised her on one arm while she put the porringer to her mouth drink abigail she said with tender command tis warm the way you love it the little maid tried to sip but shut her mouth and turned her head with weak loathing and sarah could not compel her she laid her back and got a spoon and fed her a little by dint of much pleading to make her open her mouth and swallow afterward she undressed her and put her to bed in the south front room but the child was so uneasy without the ring of garments which she had arranged that sarah was forced to put them around her on the bed then she fell asleep directly and stood in her dream watching in the door sarah herself stood in the door looking up and down the road there was a sound of a galloping horse in the distance it came nearer and nearer she went down to the road and stood waiting the horse was reined in close to her and the young man who rode him sprang off of the saddle it is you sarah you are safe home he cried eagerly and would have put his arm about her but she stood aloof sternly for what else do you take me my apparition she said in a hard voice sweetheart know you that i have but just come from the jail in boston where i have lain fast chained for witchcraft see you my fine apparel with a prison air in it know you that they called me a witch and said that i did afflict mary warren and the rest i marvel not that you kept your distance david carr i might perchance have hurt you and they might have accused you since you are in fellowship with a witch i marvel not at that i would have no harm come to you though far greater than this came to me but wherefore did you let my little sister abigail starve that i cannot suffer coming from you david the young man took her in his arms with a decided motion and indeed she did not repulse him but began to weep sarah he said earnestly i was an ipwich i knew not of you and benjamin being cried out upon until within this hour when i returned home and my mother told me i knew not you were acquitted and was on my way to boston to you when i saw you at the gate and as for abigail i knew not at all and so twas with my mother for she but now wept when she said that the poor little maid had been taken with the rest but you mean not that sweetheart she has not been let to starve they stole the food away in the night said sarah and the horses and the cow and calf i found the cow straying in the woods but now on my way home and drove her in and milked her but abigail would take scarce a spoonful of the warm milk she has had but little to eat for three days and has been distracted with fear being left alone she has ever been but a delicate child and now i fear she has a fever on her and will die with her mother away i will go for my mother sweetheart said david carr eagerly bring her under the cover of night then said sarah else she may be suspected if she comes to this witch tavern as they call it oh david think you she will come i am in a sore strait i will bring her without fail sweet and a flask of wine also and the needments for the little maid cried david only do you keep up good heart perchance sweet the child may amend soon and the others will soon acquit nay weep not poor lass poor lass thou haste me whatever else fail thee poor solace though that be and i will fetch thee my mother right speedily she has ever set a great store by the little maid and knows much about ailments and i doubt not that they will soon acquit they say my mother will said sarah tearfully and benjamin is acquit now but had best kept for a season out of salem village but my father will not be acquit he has spoken his mind too boldly before them all nay sweetheart said david carr mounting twill all have passed soon tis but a madness go in to the little maid and be of good comfort sarah went sobbing into the house but her face was quite calm when she stood over little abigail the child was still asleep and she could rouse her only for a moment to take a few spoonfuls of milk 
then she turned her head on the pillow with weary obstinacy and shut her eyes again she still held the poor corn-cob poppet fast sarah washed herself braided her hair and changed her prison dress for a clean blue linen one then she sat beside abigail and waited for david carr and his mother who came within the hour goodwife carr was renowned through salem village for her knowledge of medicinal herbs and her nursing she had a gentle sobriety and decision of manner which placed her firmly in her neighbors confidences they seeing how she abode firmly in her own and arguing from that then she had too the good fortune to have made no enemies consequently her ability had not incurred for her the suspicion of being a witch goodwife carr brought a goodly store of healing herbs of bread and cakes and meat and she brewed drinks and bent her face pale and soberly faithful in her close white cap untiringly over abigail proctor but the little maid never rose again a fever engendered by starvation and fright and grief had seized upon her and she lay in the bed with her little corn-cob baby for a few days longer and then died they made a straight white gown for her and dressed her in it and after washing her and smoothing her yellow hair and she lay looking longer and older than in life all set about with flowers pinks and lilacs and roses from goodwife carr's garden until she was buried and they had the ipwich minister come for the funeral for david carr cried out in fury that minister paris who had prosecuted this witchcraft business was her murderer and blood would flow from her little body if he stood beside it and that was the same with minister noise and sarah proctor's pale face had flushed up fiercely in assent the morning after the little maid abigail proctor was buried joseph bailey and his wife anne came riding down the road from boston and they were in brave company and needed to have but little fear of witches for the great minister cotton mathers rode with them his excellency the governor of the colony two worshipful magistrates and two other ministers all on their way to a witch trial in salem as they neared the proctor house there was much discourse concerning it and the inmates thereof many strange and dreadful accounts and much godly denunciation and as they reached the little curve in the road they came suddenly in sight of a young man and a tall fair maid standing together at the side of some white flowering bushes and sarah proctor even with her little sister abigail dead and her parents in danger of death was smiling for a second space in david carr's face for the love and hope in tragedy that make god possible and the selfishness of love that makes life possible were upon her in spite of herself then she saw the cavalcade approaching saw the gleam of rich raiment and heard the tramp and jingling the smile faded straightway from her face and she stood behind david in the white alder bushes and david stood before her and gazed with a stern and defiant scowl at the gentry as they passed by and the great cotton mathers gazed back at that beautiful white face rising like another flower out of the bushes and he speculated with himself if it were the face of a witch but goodwife ann bailey thought only of the little maid at the door and when they came to the proctor house she leaned eagerly from the pillion and she smiled and kissed her hand why do you thus ann her husband asked looking about her see you not the little maid in the door she whispered low for fear of the godly company i trow she looks better than she did the roses are in her cheek and they have combed her yellow hair and put a clean white gown on her she holds a little doll too i see nobody said joseph bailey wondering nay but she stands there i never saw naught shine like her hair and her white gown the sunlight lies full at the door see see she is smiling i trow all her griefs be well over the cavalcade passed the proctor house but goodwife ann bailey's sweet face was turned backwards till it was out of sight towards the little maid in the door end the little maid at the door by mary e wilkins freeman read by jennifer dolman The Devil by Guy de Maupassant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Devil The peasant and the doctor stood on opposite sides of the bed, beside the old dying woman. She was calm and resigned, and her mind quite clear, as she looked at them and listened to their conversation. She was going to die, and she did not revel at it, for her time was come, and she was ninety-two. The July sun streamed in at the window and the open door and cast its hot flames on the uneven brown clay floor, which had been stamped down by four generations of clodhoppers. The smell of the fields came in also, driven by the sharp wind and parched by the noontide heat. The grasshoppers chirped themselves hoarse, and filled the country with their shrill noise, which was like that of the wooden toys which are sold to children at fair time. The doctor raised his voice and said, Honor, you cannot leave your mother in this state. She may die at any moment. And the peasant, in great distress, replied, But I must get in my wheat, for it has been lying on the ground a long time and the weather is just right for it. What do you say about it, mother? And the dying old woman, still tormented by her Norman avariciousness, replied yes with her eyes and her forehead, and thus urged her son to get in his wheat and to leave her to die alone. But the doctor got angry, and stamping his foot, he said, You are no better than a brute, do you hear? And I will not allow you to do it, do you understand? And if you must get in your wheat today, go and fetch Rappé's wife and make her look after your mother. I will have it, do you understand me? And if you do not obey me, I will let you die like a dog when you are ill in your turn, do you hear? The peasant, a tall, thin fellow, with slow movements, who was tormented by indecision, by his fear of the doctor and his fierce love of saving, hesitated, calculated, and stammered out. How much does La Rappe charge for attending sick people? How should I know? the doctor cried. That depends on how long she's needed. Settle it with her by heaven, but I want her to be here within an hour, do you hear? So the man decided. I will go for her, he replied. Don't get angry, doctor. And the latter left, calling out as he went, Be careful, be very careful. You know for I do not joke when I am angry. As soon as they were alone, the peasant turned to his mother and said in a resigned voice, I will go and fetch La Rappe, as the man will have it. Don't worry till I get back. And he went out in his turn. La Rappe, who was an old washerwoman, watched the dead and the dying of the neighborhood, and then, as soon as she had sewn her customers into that linen cloth from which they would emerge no more, she went and took up her iron to smooth out the linen of the living. Wrinkled like a last year's apple, spiteful, envious, avaricious with a phenomenal avarice, bent double, as if she had been broken in half across the loins by the constant motion of passing the iron over the linen, one might have said that she had a kind of abnormal and cynical love of a death struggle. She never spoke of anything but of the people she had seen die of the various kinds of deaths at which she had been present, and she related with the greatest minuteness details which were always similar, just as a sportsman recounts his luck. When Honor Bonton entered her cottage, he found her preparing the starch for the collars of the women villagers, and he said, Good evening. I hope you are pretty well, Mother Rappé. She turned her head round to look at him and said, As usual, as usual, and you... Oh, as for me, I am as well as I could wish, but my mother is not well. Your mother? Yes, my mother. What is the matter with her? She is going to turn up her toes. That's what's the matter with her. The old woman took her hands out of the water and asked with sudden sympathy, Is she as bad as all that? The doctor says she will not last till morning. And she certainly is very bad. Honor hesitated, for he wanted to make a few preparatory remarks before coming to his proposition. But as he could hit upon nothing, 
he made up his mind suddenly. "'How much will you ask to stay with her till the end? You know that I am not rich, and I cannot even afford to keep a servant girl. It is just that which has brought my poor mother to this state, too much worry and fatigue. She did the work of ten in spite of her ninety-two years. We don't find any maid of that stuff nowadays.' La Rappe answered gravely, "'There are two prices, forty sous by day and three francs by night for the rich, and twenty sous by day and forty by night for the others. You shall pay me the twenty and forty. But the peasant reflected, for he knew his mother well. He knew how tenacious of life, how vigorous and unyielding she was, and she might last another week, in spite of the doctor's opinion. And so he said resolutely, No, I would rather you fix a price for the whole time until the end. I will take my chance one way or the other. The doctor says she will die very soon. If that happens, so much the better for you, and so much the worse for her. But if she holds out till tomorrow or longer, so much the better for her, and so much the worse for you. The nurse looked at the man in astonishment, for she had never treated a death as a speculation, and she hesitated, tempted by the idea of the possible gain. But she suspected that he wanted to play her a trick. "'I can say nothing until I have seen your mother,' she replied. "'Then come with me and see her.' She washed her hands and went with him immediately. They did not speak on the road. She walked with short, hasty steps, while he strode on with his long legs as if he were crossing a brook at every step. The cows lying down in the fields, overcome by the heat, raised their heads heavily and lowed feebly at the two passers-by, as if to ask them for some green grass. When they got near the house, Honor Bonton murmured, Suppose it is all over, and his unconscious wish that it might be so showed itself in the sound of his voice. But the old woman was not dead. She was lying on her back, on her wretched bed, her hands covered with a purple cotton counterpane, horribly thin, knotty hands like the claws of strange animals, like crabs, half closed by rheumatism, fatigue, and the work of nearly a century which she had accomplished. La Rappe went up to the bed and looked at the dying woman, felt a pulse, tapped her on the chest, listened to her breathing, and asked her questions so as to hear her speak, and then, having looked at her for some time, she went out of the room, followed by Honore. Her decided opinion was that the old woman would not last till night. He asked, Well? And the sick nurse replied, Well, she may last two days, perhaps three. You will have to give me six francs, everything included. Six francs? Six francs? he shouted. Are you out of your mind? I tell you she cannot last more than five or six hours. And they disputed angrily for some time. But as the nurse said she must go home, as the time was going by, and as his wheat would not come to the farmyard of its own accord, he finally agreed to her terms. Very well, then. That is settled. Six francs, including everything, until the corpse is taken out. And he went away with long strides, to his wheat which was lying on the ground under the hot sun which ripens the grain, while the sick nurse went in again to the house. She had brought some work with her, for she worked without ceasing by the side of the dead and dying, sometimes for herself, sometimes for the family which employed her as seamstress and paid her rather more in that capacity. Suddenly she asked, "'Have you received the last sacraments, Mother Bonton?' The old peasant woman shook her head, and La Rappe, who was very devout, got up quickly. "'Good heavens, is it possible? I will go and fetch the curé.' And she rushed off to the parsonage so quickly that the urchins in the street thought some accident had happened when they saw her running. The priest came immediately in his surplice, preceded by a choir-boy who rang a bell to announce the passage of the host through the parched and quiet country. Some men who were working at a distance took off their large hats and remained motionless until the white vestment had disappeared behind some farm buildings. 
the women who were making up the sheaves stood up to make the sign of the cross the frightened black hens ran away along the ditch until they reached a well-known hole through which they suddenly disappeared while a foal which was tied in the meadow took fright at the sight of the surplus and began to gallop round and round kicking out every now and then the acolyte in his red cassock walked quickly and the priest with his head inclined toward one shoulder and his square biretta on his head followed him muttering some prayers while last of all came la rape bent almost double as if she wished to prostrate herself as she walked with the folded hands as they do in church honor saw them pass in the distance and he asked where is the priest going his man who was more intelligent replied he is taking the sacrament to your mother of course the peasant was not surprised and said that may be and went on with his work mother bonton confessed received absolution and communion and the priest took his departure leaving the two women alone in the suffocating room while la rape began to look at the dying woman and to ask herself whether it could last much longer the day was on the wane and gusts of cooler air began to blow causing a view of epinal which was fastened to the wall by two pins to flap up and down the scanty window curtains which had formerly been white but were now yellow and covered with fly specks looked as if they were going to fly off as if they were struggling to get away like the old woman's soul lying motionless with her eyes open she seemed to await with indifference that death which was so near and which yet delayed its coming her short breathing whistled in her constricted throat it would stop altogether soon and there would be one woman less in the world no one would regret her at nightfall honor returned and when he went up to the bed and saw that his mother was still alive he asked how is she just as he had done formerly when she had been ailing and then he sent la rape away saying to her tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock without fail and she replied tomorrow at 5 o'clock she came at daybreak and found honor eating his soup which he had made himself before going to work and the sick nurse asked him well is your mother dead she is rather better on the contrary he replied with a sly look out of the corner of his eyes and he went out la rape seized with anxiety went up to the dying woman who remained in the same state lethargic and impassive with her eyes open and her hands clutching the counterpane the nurse perceived that this might go on thus for two days four days eight days and her avaricious mind was seized with fear while she was furious at the sly fellow who had tricked her and at the woman who would not die nevertheless she began to work and waited looking intently at the wrinkled face of mother bonton when honor returned to breakfast he seemed quite satisfied and even in a bantering humor he was decidedly getting in his wheat under very favorable circumstances la rape was becoming exasperated every minute now seemed to her so much time and money stolen from her she felt a mad inclination to take this old woman this headstrong old fool this obstinate old wretch and to stop that short rapid breath which was robbing her of her time and money by squeezing her throat a little but then she reflected on the danger of doing so and other thoughts came into her head so she went up to the bed and said have you ever seen the devil mother bonton murmured no then the sick nurse began to talk and to tell her tales which were likely to terrify the weak mind of the dying woman some minutes before one dies the devil appears she said to all who are in the death throes he has a broom in his hand a saucepan on his head and he utters loud cries when anybody sees him all is over and that person has only a few moments longer to live she then enumerated all those to whom the devil had appeared that year josephine loisel eulalie chatier sophie padagno seraphine grospied mother bonton who had at last become disturbed in mind moved about wrung her hands and tried to turn her head to look toward the end of the room suddenly la rape disappeared at the foot of the bed she took a sheet out of the cupboard and wrapped herself up in it she put the iron saucepan on her head 
so that its three short bent feet rose up like horns, and she took a broom in her right hand and a tin pail in her left, which she threw up suddenly so that it might fall to the ground noisily. When it came down, it certainly made a terrible noise. Then, climbing upon a chair, the nurse lifted up the curtain which hung at the bottom of the bed and showed herself gesticulating and uttering shrill cries into the iron saucepan which covered her face, while she menaced the old peasant woman who was nearly dead with her broom. Terrified, with an insane expression on her face, the dying woman made a superhuman effort to get up and escape. She even got her shoulders and chest out of bed. Then she fell back with a deep sigh. All was over, and La Rappe calmly put everything back into its place. The broom into the corner by the cupboard, the sheet inside it, the saucepan on the hearth, the pail on the floor, and the chair against the wall. Then, with professional movements, she closed the dead woman's large eyes, put a plate on the bed, and poured some holy water into it, placing in it the twig of boxwood that had been nailed to the chest of drawers, and kneeling down, she fervently repeated the prayers for the dead, which she knew by heart, as a matter of business. And when Honor returned in the evening, he found her praying, and he calculated immediately that she had made twenty sows out of him, for she had only spent three days and one night there, which made five francs altogether, instead of the six which he owed her. End of The Devil by Guy de Maupassant Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama A Tale of the Ragged Mountains by Edgar Allan Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto A Tale of the Ragged Mountains During the fall of the year 1827, while residing near Charlottesville, Virginia, I casually made the acquaintance of Mr. Augustus Bedloe. This young gentleman was remarkable in every respect, and excited in me a profound interest and curiosity. I found it impossible to comprehend him either in his moral or his physical relations. Of his family I could obtain no satisfactory account. Whence he came I never ascertained. Even about his age, although I called him a young gentleman, there was something which perplexed me in no little degree. He certainly seemed young, and he made a point of speaking about his youth, Yet there were moments when I should have had little trouble in imagining him a hundred years of age. But in no regard was he more peculiar than in his personal appearance. He was singularly tall and thin. He stooped much. His limbs were exceedingly long and emaciated. His forehead was broad and low. His complexion was absolutely bloodless. His mouth was large and flexible, and his teeth were more wildly uneven although sound, than I had ever before seen teeth in a human head. The expression of his smile, however, was by no means unpleasing, as might be supposed, but it had no variation whatsoever. It was one of profound melancholy, of a faceless and unceasing gloom. His eyes were abnormally large, and round like those of a cat. The pupils, too, upon any accession or diminution of light, underwent contraction or dilation, just such as is observed in the feline tribe. In moments of excitement the orbs grew bright to a degree almost inconceivable, seeming to emit luminous rays, not of a reflected, but of an intrinsic luster, as does a candle or the sun. Yet their ordinary condition was so totally vapid, filmy, and dull, as to convey the idea of the eyes of a long interred corpse. These peculiarities of person appeared to cause him much annoyance, and he was continually alluding to them in a sort of half-explanatory, half-apologetic strain, which, when I first heard it, impressed me very painfully. I soon, however, grew accustomed to it, and my uneasiness wore off. It seemed to be his design rather to insinuate than directly to assert that, physically, 
he had not always been what he was, that a long series of neuralgic attacks had reduced him from a condition of more than usual personal beauty to that which I saw. For many years past he had been attended by a physician named Templeton, an old gentleman, perhaps seventy years of age, whom he had first encountered at Saratoga, and from whose attention, while there, he either received or fancied that he received great benefit. The result was that Bedlow, who was wealthy, had made an arrangement with Dr. Templeton, by which the latter, in consideration of a liberal annual allowance, had consented to devote his time and medical experience exclusively to the care of the invalid. Dr. Templeton had been a traveller in his younger days, and at Paris had become a convert in great measure to the doctrines of Mesmer. It was altogether by means of magnetic remedies that he had succeeded in alleviating the acute pains of his patient, and this success had very naturally inspired the latter with a certain degree of confidence in the opinions from which the remedies had been educed. The doctor, however, like all enthusiasts, had struggled hard to make a thorough convert of his pupil, and finally so far gained his point as to induce the sufferer to submit to numerous experiments. By a frequent repetition of these, a result had arisen, which of late days had become so common as to attract little or no attention, but which, at the period of which I write, had very rarely been known in America. I mean to say that between Dr. Templeton and Bedloe there had grown up, little by little, a very distinct and strongly marked rapport or magnetic relation. I am not prepared to assert, however, that this rapport extended beyond the limits of the simple sleep-producing power, but this power itself had attained great intensity. At the first attempt to induce the magnetic somnolency, the mesmerist entirely failed. In the fifth or sixth he succeeded very partially, and after long continued effort, only at the twelfth was the triumph complete. After this, the will of the patient succumbed rapidly to that of the physician, so that, when I first became acquainted with the two, sleep was brought about almost instantaneously by the mere volition of the operator, even when the invalid was unaware of his presence. It is only now, in the year 1845, when similar miracles are witnessed daily by thousands, that I dare venture to record this apparent impossibility as a matter of serious fact. The temperature of Bedloe was, in the highest degree, sensitive, excitable, enthusiastic. His imagination was singularly vigorous and creative, and no doubt it derived additional force from the habitual use of morphine, which he swallowed in great quantity, and without which he would have found it impossible to exist. It was his practice to take a very large dose of it immediately after breakfast, each morning, or rather immediately after a cup of strong coffee, for he ate nothing in the forenoon, and then set forth alone, or attended only by a dog, upon a long ramble among the chain of wild and dreary hills that lie westward and southward of Charlottesville, and are there dignified by the title of the Ragged Mountains. Upon a dim, warm, misty day, toward the close of November, and during the strange interregnum of the seasons which in America is termed the Indian summer, Mr. Bedloe departed as usual for the hills. The day passed, and still he did not return. About eight o'clock at night, having become seriously alarmed at his protracted absence, we were about setting out in search of him, when he unexpectedly made his appearance, in health no worse than usual, and in rather more than ordinary spirits. The account which he gave of his expedition, and of the events which had detained him, was a singular one indeed. You will remember, said he, that it was about nine in the morning when I left Charlottesville. I bent my steps immediately to the mountains, and about ten entered a gorge which was entirely new to me. I followed the windings of this pass with much interest. The scenery which presented itself on all sides, although scarcely entitled to be called grand, had about it an indescribable and to me a delicious aspect of dreary desolation. The solitude seemed absolutely virgin. I could not help believing that the green sods and the grey rocks upon which I trod had been trodden never before by the foot of a human being. 
so entirely secluded and in fact inaccessible except through a series of accidents is the entrance of the ravine that it is by no means impossible that i was indeed the first adventurer the very first and sole adventurer who had ever penetrated its recesses the thick and peculiar mist or smoke which distinguishes the indian summer and which now hung heavily over all objects served no doubt to deepen the vague impressions which these objects created so dense was this pleasant fog that i could at no time see more than a dozen yards of the path before me this path was excessively sinuous and as the sun could not be seen i soon lost all idea of the direction in which i journeyed in the meantime the morphine had its customary effect that of enduing all the external world with an intensity of interest in the quivering of a leaf in the hue of a blade of grass in the shape of a trefoil in the humming of a bee in the gleaming of a dewdrop in the breathing of the wind in the faint odours that came from the forest there came a whole universe of suggestion a gay and motley train of rhapsodical and immethodical thought busied in this i walked on for several hours during which the mist deepened around me to so great an extent that at length i was reduced to an absolute groping of the way and now an indescribable uneasiness possessed me a species of nervous hesitation and tremor i feared to tread lest i should be precipitated into some abyss i remembered too strange stories told about these ragged hills and of the uncouth and fierce races of men who tenanted their groves and caverns a thousand vague fancies oppressed and disconcerted me fancies the more distressing because vague very suddenly my attention was arrested by the loud beating of a drum my amazement was of course extreme a drum in these hills was a thing unknown i could not have been more surprised at the sound of the trump of the archangel but a new and still more astounding source of interest and perplexity arose there came a wild rattling or jingling sound as if of a bunch of large keys and upon the instant a dusky visaged and half-naked man rushed past me with a shriek he came so close to my person that i felt his hot breath upon my face he bore in one hand an instrument composed of an assemblage of steel rings and shook them vigorously as he ran scarcely had he disappeared in the mist before panting after him with open mouth and glaring eyes there darted a huge beast i could not be mistaken in its character it was a hyena the sight of this monster rather relieved than heightened my terrors for i now made sure that i dreamed and endeavoured to arouse myself to waking consciousness i stepped boldly and briskly forward i rubbed my eyes i called aloud i pinched my limbs a small spring of water presented itself to my view and here stooping i bathed my hands and my head and neck this seemed to dissipate the equivocal sensations which had hitherto annoyed me i arose as i thought a new man and proceeded steadily and complacently on my unknown way at length quite overcome by exertion and by a certain oppressive closeness of the atmosphere i seated myself beneath a tree presently there came a feeble gleam of sunshine and the shadow of the leaves of the tree fell faintly but definitely upon the grass at this shadow i gazed wonderingly for many minutes its character stupefied me with astonishment i looked upward the tree was a palm i now arose hurriedly and in a state of fearful agitation for the fancy that i dreamed would serve me no longer i saw i felt that i had perfect command of my senses and these senses now brought to my soul a world of novel and singular sensation the heat became all at once intolerable a strange odour loaded the breeze a low continuous murmur like that arising from a full but gently flowing river came to my ears intermingled with the peculiar hum of multitudinous human voices while i listened in an extremity of astonishment which i need not attempt to describe a strong and brief gust of wind bore off the incumbent fog as if by the wand of an enchanter i found myself at the foot of a high mountain and looking down into a vast plain through which wound a majestic river on the margin of the river stood an eastern-looking city such as we read of in the arabian tales 
but of a character even more singular than any there described. From my position, which was far above the level of the town, I could perceive its every nook and corner, as if delineated on a map. The streets seemed innumerable and crossed each other irregularly in all directions, but were rather long winding alleys and streets, and absolutely swarmed with inhabitants. The houses were wildly picturesque. On every hand was a wilderness of balconies, of verandas, of minarets, of shrines, and fantastically carved orioles. Bazaars abounded and in these were displayed rich wares in infinite variety and profusion, silks, muslins, the most dazzled cutlery, the most magnificent jewels and gems. Besides these things were seen on all sides banners and palanquins, litters with stately dames close-veiled, elephants gorgeously caparisoned, idols grotesquely hewn, drums, banners and gongs, spears, silver and gilded maces, and amid the crowd and the clamour and the general intricacy and confusion, amid the million of black and yellow men turbaned and robed, and of flowing beard, there roamed a countless multitude of holy filleted bulls, while vast legions of the filthy but sacred ape clambered, chattering and shrieking, about the cornices of the mosques, or clung to the minarets and orioles. From the swarming streets to the banks of the river, there descended innumerable flights of steps leading to bathing places while the river itself seemed to force a passage with difficulty through the vast fleets of deeply burthened ships that far and wide encountered its surface. Beyond the limits of the city arose in frequent majestic groups the palm and the cocoa, with other gigantic and weird trees of vast age, and here and there might be seen a field of rice, the thatched hut of a peasant, a tank, a stray temple, a gypsy camp, or a solitary graceful maiden taking her way with a pitcher upon her head to the banks of the magnificent river. You will say now, of course, that I dreamed, but not so. What I saw, what I heard, what I felt, what I thought, had about it nothing of the unmistakable idiosyncrasy of the dream. All was rigorously self-consistent. At first doubting that I was really awake, I entered into a series of tests, which soon convinced me that I really was. Now, when one dreams, and in the dream suspects that he dreams, the suspicion never fails to confirm itself, and the sleeper is almost immediately aroused. Thus Novalis errs not in saying that we are near waking when we dream, that we dream. Had the vision occurred to me as I describe it, without my suspecting it as a dream, then a dream it might absolutely have been, but occurring as it did, and suspected and tested as it was, I am forced to class it among other phenomena. In this I am not sure that you are wrong, observed Dr. Templeton, but proceed. You arose and descended into the city. I arose, continued Bedloe, regarding the doctor with an air of profound astonishment. I arose, as you say, and descended into the city. On my way I fell in with an immense populace, crowding through every avenue, all in the same direction, and exhibiting in every action the wildest excitement. Very suddenly, and by some inconceivable impulse, I became intensely imbued with personal interest in what was going on. I seemed to feel that I had an important part to play, without exactly understanding what it was. Against the crowd which environed me, however, I experienced a deep sentiment of animosity. I shrank from amid them, and swiftly, by a circuitous path, reached and entered the city. Here all was the wildest tumult and contention. A small party of men, clad in garments half Indian, half European, and officered by gentlemen in a uniformly partly British, were engaged at great odds with the swarming rabble of the alleys. I joined the weaker party, arming myself with the weapons of a fallen officer, and fighting I knew not whom with the nervous ferocity of despair. We were soon overpowered by numbers, and driven to seek refuge in a species of kiosk. Here we barricaded ourselves, and for the present were secure. From a loophole near the summit of the kiosk, I perceived a vast crowd in furious agitation, surrounding and assaulting a gay palace that overhung the river. Presently, from an upper window of this place, they descended an effeminate-looking person by means of a string made of the turbans of his attendants. 
a boat was at hand, in which he escaped to the opposite bank of the river. And now a new object took possession of my soul. I spoke a few hurried but energetic words to my companions, and having succeeded in gaining over a few of them to my purpose, made a frantic sally from the kiosk. We rushed amid the crowd that surrounded it. They retreated, at first, before us. They rallied, fought madly, and retreated again. In the meantime, we were borne far from the kiosk, and became bewildered and entangled among the narrow streets of tall overhanging houses, into the recesses of which the sun had never been able to shine. The rabble pressed impetuously upon us, harassing us with their spears, and overwhelming us with flights of arrows. These latter were very remarkable, and resembled in some respects to the writhing crease of the Malay. They were made to imitate the body of a creeping serpent, and were long and black with a poisoned barb. One of them struck me upon the right temple. I reeled and fell, and instantaneously a dreadful sickness seized me. I struggled. I gasped. I died. You will hardly persist now, said I, smiling, that the whole of your adventure was not a dream. You are not prepared to maintain that you are dead? When I said these words, I, of course, expected some lively sally from Bedloe in reply. But, to my astonishment, he hesitated, trembled, became fearfully pallid, and remained silent. I looked toward Templeton. He sat erect and rigid in his chair. His teeth chattered, and his eyes were starting from their sockets. Proceed, he at length said hoarsely to Bedloe. For many minutes, continued the latter, my sole sentiment, my sole feeling, was that of darkness and non-entity, with the consciousness of death. At length there seemed to pass a violent and sudden shock through my soul, as if of electricity. With it came the sense of elasticity and of light. This latter I felt, not saw. In an instant I seemed to rise from the ground. But I had no bodily, no visible, audible, or palpable presence. The crowd had departed. The tumult had ceased. The city was in comparative repose. Beneath me lay my corpse, with the arrow in my temple, the whole head greatly swollen and disfigured. But all these things I felt, not saw. I took interest in nothing. Even the corpse seemed a matter in which I had no concern. Volition I had none, but appeared to be impelled into motion and flitted buoyantly out of the city, retracing the circuitous path by which I had entered it. When I had attained that point of the ravine in the mountains at which I had encountered the hyena, I again experienced a shock as of a galvanic battery, the sense of weight, of volition, of substance, returned. I became my original self, and bent my steps eagerly homeward. But for the past had not lost the vividness of the real, and for now, even for an instant, can I compel my understanding to regard it as a dream. Nor was it, said Templeton with an air of deep solemnity. Yet it would be difficult to say how otherwise it should be termed. Let us suppose only that the soul of the man of today is upon the verge of some stupendous cycle discoveries. Let us content ourselves with this supposition. For the rest, I have some explanation to make. Here is a watercolour drawing which I should have shown you before, but which an accountable sentiment of horror has hitherto prevented me from showing. We looked at the picture which he presented. I saw nothing in it of an extraordinary character, but its effect upon Bedloe was prodigious. He nearly fainted as he gazed, and yet it was but a miniature portrait, a miraculously accurate one, to be sure of his own very remarkable features. At least this was my thought as I regarded it. You will perceive, said Templeton, the date of this picture. It is here, scarcely visible, in this corner. 1780. In this year was the portrait taken. It is the likeness of a dead friend, a Mr. Oldeb, to whom I became much attached at Calcutta during the administration of Warren Hastings. I was then only twenty years old. When I first saw you, Mr. Bedloe, at Saratoga, it was the miraculous similarity which existed between yourself and the painting which induced me to accost you, to seek your friendship and to bring about those arrangements which resulted in my becoming your constant companion. In accompanying this point, 
I was urged partly, and perhaps principally, by a regretful memory of the deceased, but also, in part, by an uneasy and not altogether horrorless curiosity respecting yourself. In your detail of the vision which presented itself to you amid the hills, you have described with the minutest accuracy the Indian city of Benares upon the Holy River. The riots, the combat, the massacre, were the actual events of the insurrection of the Chaite Singh, which took place in 1780, when Hastings was put in imminent peril of his life. The man escaping by the string of turbans was Chaite Singh himself. The party in the kiosk were sepoys and British officers headed by Hastings. Of this party I was one, and did all I could to prevent the rash and fatal sally of the officer who fell in the crowded alleys by the poisoned arrow of a Bengali. That officer was my dearest friend. It was Oldeb. You will perceive by these manuscripts. Here the speaker produced a notebook, in which several pages appeared to have been freshly written, that, at the very period in which you fancied these things amid the hills, I was engaged in detailing them upon paper here at home. In about a week after this conversation, the following paragraphs appeared in a Charlottesville paper. We have the painful duty of announcing the death of Mr. Augustus Bedloe, a gentleman whose amiable manners and many virtues have long endeared him to the citizens of Charlottesville. Mr. B. for some years past has been subject to neuralgia, which has often threatened to terminate fatally, but this can be regarded only as the mediate cause of his disease. The proximate cause was one of special singularity. In an excursion to the ragged mountains a few days since, a slight cold and fever were contracted, attended with great determination of blood to the head. To relieve this, Dr. Templeton resorted to topical bleeding. Leeches were applied to the temples. In a fearfully brief period, the patient died, when it appeared that in the jar containing the leeches had been introduced by accident one of the venomous vermicular sanctuaries which are now and then found in the neighboring ponds. This creature fastened itself upon a small artery in the right temple. Its close resemblance to the medicinal leech caused the mistake to be overlooked until too late. N.B. The poisonous sanctuary of Charlottesville may always be distinguished from the medicinal leech by its blackness, and especially by its writhing or vermicular motions, which very nearly resemble those of a snake. I was speaking with the editor of the paper in question upon the topic of this remarkable accident, when it occurred to me to ask how it happened that the name of the deceased had been given as Bedloe. I presume, I said, you have authority for the spelling, but I have always supposed the name to be written with an E at the end. Authority? No, he replied. It is a mere typographical error. The name is Bedloe with an E all the world over and I never knew it to be spelt otherwise in my life. Then, said I mutteringly, as I turned upon my heel, then indeed has it come to pass that one truth is stranger than any fiction for Bedloe without the E, what is it but Old Deb, conversed. And this man tells me that it is a typographical error. End of A Tale of the Ragged Mountains by Edgar Allan Poe Read for you by Chiquito Crasto Birmingham, Alabama. Fragments from the Journal of a Solitary Man by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Clark. Fragments from the Journal of a Solitary Man by Nathaniel Hawthorne. 1. My poor friend Oberon. See the sketch or story entitled The Devil in Manuscript in The Snow Image and Other Twice Told Tales. For let me be allowed to distinguish him by so quaint a name. Sleeps with the silent ages. He died calmly. Though his disease was pulmonary, his life did not flicker out like a wasted lamp, sometimes shooting up into a strange temporary brightness. But the tide of being ebbed away, and the moon of his existence waned till, in the simple phraseology of Scripture, he was not. The last words he said to me were, Burn my papers! 
all that you can find in yonder escritoire, for I fear there are some there which you may be betrayed into publishing. <coughs> I have published enough. As for the old disconnected journal in your possession, But here my poor friend was checked in his utterance by that same hollow cough which would never let him alone. So he coughed himself tired and sank to slumber. I watched from that midnight hour till high noon on the morrow for his waking. The chamber was dark, till, longing for light, I opened the window shutter, and the broad day looked in on the marble features of the dead. I religiously obeyed his instructions with regard to the papers in the escritoire, and burned them in a heap without looking into one, though sorely tempted. But the old journal I kept. Perhaps in strict conscience I ought also to have burned that. But casting my eye over some half-torn leaves the other day, I could not resist an impulse to give some fragments of it to the public. To do this satisfactorily, I am obliged to twist this thread, so as to string together into a semblance of order my Oberon's random pearls. If anybody that holds any commerce with his fellow men can be called solitary, Oberon was a solitary man. He lived in a small village at some distance from the metropolis, and never came up to the city except once in three months for the purpose of looking into a bookstore, and of spending two hours and a half with me. In that space of time I would tell him all that I could remember of interest which had occurred in the interim of his visits. He would join very heartily in the conversation, but as soon as the time of his usual tarrying had elapsed, he would take up his hat and depart. He was unequivocally the most original person I ever knew. His style of composition was very charming. No tales that have ever appeared in our popular journals have been so generally admired as his. But a sadness was on his spirit, and this, added to the shrinking sensitiveness of his nature, rendered him not misanthropic, but singularly averse to social intercourse. Of the disease, which was slowly sapping the springs of his life, he first became fully conscious after one of those long abstractions in which he was wont to indulge. It is remarkable, however, that his first idea of this sort— instead of deepening his spirit with a more melancholy hue, restored him to a more natural state of mind. He had evidently cherished a secret hope that some impulse would at length be given him, or that he would muster sufficient energy of will to return into the world, and act a wiser and happier part than his former one. But life never called the dreamer forth. It was death that whispered him. It is to be regretted, that this portion of his old journal contains so few passages relative to this interesting period, since the little which he has recorded, though melancholy enough, breathes the gentleness of a spirit newly restored to communion with its kind. If there be anything bitter in the following reflections, its source is in human sympathy, and its sole object is himself. It is hard to die without one's happiness, to none more so than myself whose early resolution it had been to partake largely of the joys of life, but never to be burdened with its cares. Vain philosophy! The very hardships of the poorest laborer, whose whole existence seems one long toil, has something preferable to my best pleasures. Merely skimming the surface of life, I know nothing by my own experience of its deep and warm realities. I have achieved none of those objects which the instinct of mankind especially prompts them to pursue, and the accomplishment of which must therefore beget a native satisfaction. The truly wise, after all their speculations, will be led into the common path, and, in homage to the human nature that pervades them, will gather gold, and till the earth, and set out trees, and build a house. But I have scorned such wisdom." I have rejected also the settled, sober, careful gladness of a man by his own fireside, with those around him whose welfare is committed to his trust, and all their guidance to his fond authority. Without influence among serious affairs, my footsteps were not imprinted on the earth, but lost in air. And I shall leave no son to inherit my share of life, 
with a better sense of its privileges and duties when his father should vanish like a bubble, so that few mortals, even the humblest and the weakest, have been such ineffectual shadows in the world or die so utterly as I must. Even a young man's bliss has not been mine. With a thousand vagrant fantasies I have never truly loved, and perhaps shall be doomed to loneliness throughout the eternal future, because here on earth my soul has never married itself to the soul of woman. Such are the repinings of one who feels, too late, that the sympathies of his nature have avenged themselves upon him. They have frustrated, with a joyless life and the prospect of a reluctant death, my selfish purpose to keep aloof from mortal disquietudes, and be a pleasant idler among care-stricken and laborious men. I have other regrets, too, savoring more of my old spirit. The time has been when I meant to visit every region of the earth, except the Poles and Central Africa. I had a strange longing to see the pyramids, to Persia and Arabia, and all the gorgeous east I owed a pilgrimage for the sake of their magic tales, and England, the land of my ancestors. Once I had fancied that my sleep would not be quiet in the grave unless I should return, as it were, to my home of past ages, and see the very cities and castles and battlefields of history, and stand within the holy gloom of its cathedrals, and kneel at the shrines of its immortal poets, there asserting myself their hereditary countrymen. This feeling lay among the deepest in my heart. Yet... With this homesickness for the fatherland, and all these plans of remote travel, which I yet believe that my peculiar instinct appelled me to form and upbraided me for not accomplishing, the utmost limit of my wanderings has been little more than six hundred miles from my native village. Thus, in whatever way I consider my life, or what must be termed such, I cannot feel as if I have lived at all. I am possessed also with the thought that I have never yet discovered the real secret of my powers, that there has been a mighty treasure within my reach, a mine of gold beneath my feet, worthless because I have never known how to seek for it, and for want of perhaps one fortunate idea, I am to die, unwept, unhonored, and unsung. Once, amid the troubled and tumultuous enjoyment of my life, there was one dreary thought that haunted me, the terrible necessity imposed on mortals to grow old or die. I could not bear the idea of losing one youthful grace. True, I saw other men who had once been young and now were old, enduring their age with equanimity, because each year reconciled them to its own added weight. But for myself... I felt that age would not be less miserable, creeping upon me slowly, than if it fell at once. I sometimes looked in the glass and endeavored to fancy my cheeks yellow and interlaced with furrows, my forehead wrinkled deeply across, the top of my head bald and polished, my eyebrows and side locks iron gray, and a grisly beard sprouting on my chin. Shuddering at the picture, I changed it for the dead face of a young man, with dark locks clustering heavily round its pale beauty, which would decay, indeed, but not with years, nor in the sight of men. The latter visage shocked me least. Such a repugnance to the hard conditions of long life is common to all sensitive and thoughtful men, who minister to the luxury, the refinements, the gaiety and lightsomeness, to anything, in short, but the real necessities of their fellow creatures. He who has a part in the serious business of life, though it be only as a shoemaker, feels himself equally respectable in youth and in age, and therefore is content to live and look forward to wrinkles and decrepitude in their due season. It is far otherwise with the busy idlers of the world. I was particularly liable to this torment, being a meditative person in spite of my levity. The truth could not be concealed, nor the contemplation of it avoided. With deep inquietude I became aware 
that what was graceful now, and seemed appropriate enough to my age of flowers, would be ridiculous in middle life, and that the world, so indulgent to the fantastic youth, would scorn the bearded man, still telling love tales, loftily ambitious of a maiden's tears, and squeezing out, as it were, with his brawny strength, the essence of roses. And in his old age the sweet lyrics of Anacreon made the girls laugh at his white hairs the more. With such sentiments, conscious that my part in the drama of life was fit only for a youthful performer, I nourished a regretful desire to be summoned early from the scene. I set a limit to myself. The age of twenty-five. Few years, indeed, but too many to be thrown away. Scarcely had I thus fixed the term of my mortal pilgrimage than the thought grew into a presentiment that, when the space should be completed, the world would have one butterfly the less by my far flight. Oh, how fond I was of life, even while allotting, as my proper destiny, an early death! I loved the world, its cities, its villages, its grassy roadsides, its wild forests, its quiet scenes, its gay, warm, enlivening bustle. In every aspect I loved the world so long as I could behold it with young eyes, and dance through it with a young heart. The earth had been made so beautiful that I longed for no brighter sphere, but only in every youthful eternity in this. I clung to earth as if my beginning and ending were to be there unable to imagine any but an earthly happiness, and choosing such with all its imperfections, rather than perfect bliss which might be alien from it. Alas, I had not yet known that weariness by which the soul proves itself ethereal. Turning over the old journal, I open by chance upon a passage which affords a signal instance of the morbid fantasies to which Oberon frequently yielded himself. Dreams like the following were probably engendered by the deep gloom sometimes thrown over his mind by his reflections on death. I dreamed that one bright forenoon I was walking through Broadway and seeking to cheer myself with the warm and busy life of that far-famed promenade. Here a coach thundered over the pavement and there an unwieldy omnibus with spruce gigs rattling past, and horsemen prancing through all the bustle. On the sidewalk people were looking at the rich display of goods, the plate and jewelry, or the latest caricature in the bookseller's windows, while fair ladies and whiskered gentlemen tripped gaily along, nodding mutual recognitions, or shrinking from some rough countryman or sturdy laborer whose contact might have ruffled their finery. I found myself in this animated scene, with a dim and misty idea that it was not my proper place, or that I had ventured into the crowd with some singularity of dress or aspect which made me ridiculous. Walking in the sunshine, I was yet cold as death. By degrees, too, I perceived myself the object of universal attention, and as it seemed of horror and a fright. Every face grew pale. The laugh was hushed, and the voices died away in broken syllables. The people in the shops crowded to the doors with a ghastly stare, and the passengers on all sides fled as from an embodied pestilence. The horses reared and snorted. An old beggar woman sat before St. Paul's Church, with her withered palm stretched out to all, but drew it back from me, and pointed to the graves and monuments in that populous churchyard. Three lovely girls whom I had formerly known ran shrieking across the street. A personage in black, whom I was about to overtake, suddenly turned his head and showed the features of a long-lost friend. He gave me a look of horror, and was gone. I passed not one step farther, but threw my eyes on a looking-glass, which stood deep within the nearest shop. At first glimpse of my own figure I awoke, with a horrible sensation of self-terror and self-loathing. No wonder that the affrighted city fled. 
I had been promenading Broadway in my shroud. I should be doing injustice to my friend's memory were I to publish other extracts even nearer to insanity than this from the scarcely legible papers before me. I gather from them, for I do not remember that he ever related to me the circumstances, that he once made a journey, chiefly on foot to Niagara. Some conduct of the friends among whom he resided in his native village was construed by him into oppression. These were the friends to whose care he had been committed by his parents, who died when Oberon was about twelve years of age. Though he had always been treated by them with the most uniform kindness, and though a favorite among the people of the village rather on account of the sympathy which they felt in his situation than from any merit of his own, such was the waywardness of his temper, that on a slight provocation he ran away from the home that sheltered him, expressing openly his determination to die sooner than return to the detested spot. A severe illness overtook him after he had been absent about four months. While ill, he felt how unsoothing were the kindest looks and tones of strangers. He rose from his sick bed a better man, and determined upon a speedy self-atonement by returning to his native town. There he lived, solitary and sad, but forgiven and cherished by his friends till the day he died. That part of the journal which contained a description of this journey is mostly destroyed. Here and there is a fragment. I cannot select, for the pages are very scanty, but I do not withhold the following fragments, because they indicate a better and more cheerful frame of mind than the foregoing. On reaching the ferry house, a rude structure of boards at the foot of the cliff, I found several of those wretches devoid of poetry, and lost some of my own poetry by contact with them. The hut was crowded by a party of provincials, a simple and merry set who had spent the afternoon fishing near the falls, and were bartering black and white bass and eels for the ferryman's whiskey. A greyhound and three spaniels, brutes of much more grace and decorous demeanor than their masters, sat at the door. A few yards off, yet wholly unnoticed by the dogs, was a beautiful fox, whose countenance betokened all the sagacity attributed to him in ancient fable. He had a comfortable bed of straw in an old barrel, whither he retreated, flourishing his bushy tail as I made a step towards him, but soon came forth and surveyed me with a keen and intelligent eye. The Canadians bartered their fish and drank their whiskey and were loquacious on trifling subjects and merry at simple jests, with as little regard to the scenery as they could have shown to the flattest part of the Grand Canal. Nor was I entitled to despise them, for I amused myself with all those foolish matters of fishermen and dogs and fox, just as if sublimity and beauty were not married at that place and moment, as if their nuptial band were not the brightest of all rainbows on the opposite shore, as if the grey precipice were not frowning above my head and Niagara thundering around me. The grim ferryman, a black-whiskered giant, half-drunk withal, now thrust the Canadians by main force out of his door, launched a boat, and bade me sit in the stern sheets. Where we crossed, the river was white with foam, but did not offer much resistance to a straight passage, which brought us close to the outer edge of the American Falls. The rainbow vanished as we neared its misty base, and when I leaped ashore, the sun had left all Niagara in shadow. A sound of merriment, sweet voices, and girlish laughter came dancing through the solemn roar of waters. In old times, when the French, and afterward the English, held garrisons near Niagara, it used to be deemed a feat worthy of a soldier, a frontier man, or an Indian, to cross the rapids to Goat Island. As the country became less rude and warlike, a long space intervened, in which it was but half believed by a faint and doubtful tradition that mortal foot had never trod this wild spot of precipice and forest clinging between two cataracts. The island is no longer a tangled forest, but a grove of stately trees, with grassy intervals about their roots and woodland paths among their trunks. There was neither soldier nor Indian here now, but a vision of three lovely girls 
running brief races through the broken sunshine of the grove, hiding behind the trees and pelting each other with the cones of the pine. When their sport had brought them near me, it so happened that one of the party ran up and shook me by the hand, a greeting which I heartily returned, and would have done the same had it been tenderer. I had known this wild little black-eyed lass in my youth and her childhood before I commenced my rambles. We met on terms of freedom and kindness, which elder ladies might have thought unsuitable with a gentleman of my description. When I alluded to the two fair strangers, she shouted after them by their Christian names, at which summons with grave dignity they drew near and honored me with a distant curtsy. They were from the upper part of Vermont, whether sisters or cousins, or at all related to each other, I cannot tell, but they are planted in my memory like two twin roses on one stem, with the fresh dew in both their bosoms, and when I would have pure and pleasant thoughts, I think of them. Neither of them could have seen seventeen years. They both were of a height, and that a moderate one. The rose bloom of their cheeks could hardly be called bright in her who was the rosiest, nor faint, though a shade less deep in her companion. Both had delicate eyebrows, not strongly defined, yet somewhat darker than their hair. Both had small, sweet mouths, maiden mouths, of not so warm and deep a tint as ruby, but only red as the reddest rose. Each had those gems, the rarest, the most precious, a pair of clear, soft, bright blue eyes, their style of dress was similar. One had on a black silk gown, with a stomacher of velvet and scalloped cuffs of the same from the wrist to the elbow. The other wore cuffs and stomacher of the like pattern and material, over a gown of crimson silk. The dress was rather heavy for their slight figures, but suited to September. They and the darker beauty all carried their straw bonnets in their hands. I cannot better conclude these fragments than with poor Oberon's description of his return to his native village after his slow recovery from his illness. How beautifully does he express his penitential emotions! A beautiful moral may be indeed drawn from the early death of a sensitive recluse, who had shunned the ordinary avenues of distinction, and with splendid abilities sank to rest into an early grave, almost unknown to mankind, and without any record save what my pen hastily leaves upon these tear-blotted pages. 2. My Home Return When the stage-coach had gained the summit of the hill, I alighted to perform the small remainder of my journey on foot. There had not been a more delicious afternoon than this in all the train of summer, the air being a sunny perfume made up of balm and warmth and gentle brightness. The oak and walnut trees over my head retained their deep masses of foliage, and the grass though for months the pasturage of stray cattle had been revived with the freshness of early June by the autumnal rains of the preceding week. The garb of autumn, indeed, resembled that of spring. Dandelions and buttercups were sprinkled along the roadside like drops of brightest gold in greenest grass, and a star-shaped little flower of blue with a golden center. In a rocky spot, and rooted under the stone walk, there was one wild rose-bush bearing three roses, very faintly tinted, but blessed with a spicy fragrance. The same tokens would have announced that the year was brightening into the glow of summer. There were violets, too, though few and pale ones. But the breath of September was diffused through the mild air, and became perceptible, too thrillingly for my enfeebled frame, whenever a little breeze shook out the latent coolness. I was standing on the hill at the entrance of my native village, whence I had looked back to bid farewell, and forward to the pale mist bow that overarched my path, and was the omen of my fortunes. How I had misinterpreted that augury, the ghost of hope, with none of hope's bright hues, nor could I deem that all its portents were yet accomplished, though from the same western sky the declining sun shone brightly in my face. But I was calm and not depressed. Turning to the village, so dim and dreamlike at my last view, I saw the white houses and brick stores, the intermingled trees, the footpaths with their wide borders of grass, and the dusty road between, all a picture of peaceful gladness in the sunshine. 
Why have I never loved my home before? thought I, as my spirit reposed itself on the quiet beauty of the scene. On the site of the opposite hill was the graveyard, sloping towards the farther extremity of the village. The sun shone as cheerfully there as on the abodes of the living, and showed all the little hillocks and the burial stones, white marble or slate, and here and there a tomb, with the pleasant grass all about them. A single tree was tinged with glory from the west, and threw a pensive shade behind. Not far from where it fell was the tomb of my parents, whom I had hardly thought of in bidding adieu to the village, but had remembered them more faithfully among the feelings that drew me homeward. At my departure their tomb had been hidden in the morning mist. Beholding it in the sunshine now, I felt a sensation through my frame as if a breeze had thrown the coolness of September over me, though not a leaf was stirred, nor did the thistle down take flight. Was I to roam no more through this beautiful world, but only to the other end of the village? Then let me lie down near my parents, but not with them, because I love a green grave better than a tomb. Moving slowly forward, I heard shouts and laughter and perceived a considerable throng of people who came from behind the meeting house and made a stand in front of it. Thither all the idlers in the village were congregated to witness the exercises of the engine company, this being the afternoon of their monthly practice. They deluged the roof of the meeting house till the water fell from the eaves in a broad cascade. Then the stream beat against the dusty windows like a thunderstorm, and sometimes they flung it up beside the steeple, sparkling in an ascending shower about the weathercock. For variety's sake, the engineer made it undulate horizontally, like a great serpent flying over the earth. As his last effort, being roguishly inclined, he seemed to take aim at the sky, falling short rather of which, down came the fluid, transformed to drops of silver on the thickest crowd of spectators. Then ensued a prodigious rout and mirthful uproar, with no little wrath of the surly ones, whom this is an infallible method of distinguishing. The joke afforded infinite amusement to the ladies at the windows, and some old people under the hay scales. I also laughed at a distance, and was glad to find myself susceptible, as of old, to the simple mirth of such a scene. But the thoughts that it excited were not all mirthful. I had witnessed hundreds of such spectacles in my youth, and one precisely similar only a few days before my departure. And now, the aspect of the village being the same and the crowd composed of my old acquaintances, I could hardly realize that years had passed, or even months, or that the very drops of water were not falling at this moment which had been flung up then. But I pressed the conviction home that, brief as the time appeared, it had been long enough for me to wander away and return again with my fate accomplished, and little more hope in this world." The last throb of an adventurous and wayward spirit kept me from repining. I felt as if it were better, or not worse, to have compressed my enjoyments and sufferings into a few wild years, and then to rest myself in an early grave, than to have chosen the untroubled and ungladdened course of the crowd before me, whose days were all alike, and a long lifetime like each day. But the sentiment startled me. For a moment I doubted whether my dear but wisdom were anything but the incapacity to pursue fresh follies, and whether, if health and strength could be restored that night, I should be found in the village after tomorrow's dawn. Among other novelties, I had noticed that the tavern was now designated as a temperance house, in letters extending across the whole front, with a smaller sign promising hot coffee at all hours, and spruce beer to lodgers gratis. There were few new buildings except a Methodist chapel and a printing office, with a bookstore in the lower story. The golden mortar still ornamented the apothecary's door, nor had the Indian chief with his gilded tobacco stock been relieved from doing sentinel's duty before Dominicus Pike's grocery. The gorgeous silks, though of later patterns, were still flaunting like a banner in front of Mr. Nightingale's dry goods store. Some of the signs introduced me to strangers, whose predecessors had failed, or emigrated to the west, or removed merely to the other end of the village, transferring their names from the signboards to slabs of marble or slate. 
But, on the whole, death and vicissitude had done very little. There were old men, scattered about the street, who had been old in my earliest reminiscences, and as if the venerable forms were permanent parts of the creation, they appeared to be hale and hearty old men yet. The less elderly were more altered, having generally contracted a stoop, with hair woefully thinned and whitened. Some I could hardly recognize. At my last glance they had been boys and girls, but were men and women when I looked again. And there were happy little things, too, rolling about on the grass, whom God had made since my departure. But now in my lingering course I had descended the hill, and began to consider, painfully enough, how I should meet my townspeople, and what reception they would give me. Of many an evil prophecy, doubtless, had I been the subject. And would they salute me with a roar of triumph, or a low hiss of scorn, on beholding their worst anticipations more than accomplished? No, said I, they will not triumph over me. And should they ask the cause of my return, I will tell them that a man may go far and tarry long away, if his health be good and his hopes high but that when flesh and spirit begin to fail, he remembers his birthplace and the old burial ground, and hears a voice calling him to come home to his father and mother. They will know, by my wasted frame and feeble step, that I have heard the summons and obeyed. And the first greetings over, they will let me walk among them unnoticed, and linger in the sunshine while I may, and steal into my grave in peace." With these reflections I looked kindly at the crowd, and drew off my glove, ready to give my hand to the first that should put forth his. It occurred to me, also, that some youth among them, now at the crisis of his fate, might have felt his bosom thrill at my example, and be emulous of my wild life and worthless fame. But I would save him. He shall be taught, said I, by my life and by my death, that the world is a sad one for him who shrinks from its sober duties. My experience shall warn him to adopt some great and serious aim, such as manhood will cling to, that he may not feel himself, too late, a cumberer of this overladen earth, but a man among men. I will beseech him not to follow an eccentric path, nor by stepping aside from the highway of human affairs to relinquish his claim upon human sympathy. And often, as a text of deep and varied meaning, I will remind him that he is an American. By this time I had drawn near the meeting-house and perceived that the crowd were beginning to recognize me. These are the last words traced by his hand. Has not so chastened a spirit found true communion with the pure in heaven? Until of late, I could never believe that I was seriously ill. The past, I thought, could not extend its misery beyond itself. Life was restored to me, and should not be misused again. I had daydreams even of wedded happiness. Still, as the days wear on, a faintness creeps through my frame and spirit, recalling the consciousness that a very old man might as well nourish hope and young desire as I, at twenty-four. Yet the consciousness of my situation does not always make me sad. Sometimes I look upon the world with a quiet interest, because it cannot concern me personally, and a loving one for the same reason, because nothing selfish can interfere with the sense of brotherhood. Soon to be all spirit, I have already a spiritual sense of human nature, and see deeply into the hearts of mankind. Discovering what is hidden from the wisest, the loves of young men and virgins are known to me before the first kiss, before the whispered word, with the birth of the first sigh. My glance comprehends the crowd and penetrates the breast of the solitary man. I think better of the world than formerly, more generously of its virtues more mercifully of its faults, with a higher estimate of its present happiness, and brighter hopes of its destiny. My mind has put forth a second crop of blossoms, as the trees do in the Indian summer. No winter will destroy their beauty, for they are fanned by the breeze, 
and freshened by the shower that breathes and falls in the gardens of paradise. End of Fragments from the Journal of a Solitary Man The Last Ascent by Anonymous This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last Ascent by Anonymous The extraordinary rapidity with which a successful airman may achieve fame was well shown in the case of my friend, Radcliffe Thorpe. One week known merely to a few friends as a clever young engineer, the next his name was on the lips of the civilised world. His first success was followed by a series of remarkable feats, of which his flight above the Atlantic, his race with the torpedo boat destroyers across the North Sea, and his sensational display during the military manoeuvres on Salisbury Plain, impressed his name and personality firmly upon the fickle mind of the public, and explains the tremendous excitement caused by his inexplicable disappearance during the great aviation meeting at Attercliffe near London, towards the end of the summer. Few people, I suppose, have forgotten the facts. For some time previously he had been devoting himself more especially to ascending to as great a height as possible, he held all the records for height, and it was known that at Attercliffe he meant to endeavour to eclipse his own achievements. It was a lovely day, not a breath of wind stirring, not a cloud in the sky. We saw him start. We saw him fly up and up in great sweeping spirals. We saw him climb higher and ever higher into the azure space. We watched him, those of us whose eyes could bear the strain, as he dwindled to a dot and a speck, till at last he passed beyond sight. It was a stirring thing to see a man thus storm, as it were, the walls of heaven, and probe the very mysteries of space. I remember I felt quite annoyed with someone who was taking a cinematograph record. It seemed such a sordid, business-like thing to be doing at such a moment. Presently the aeroplane came into sight again, and was greeted with a sudden roar of cheering. He is doing a glide down, someone cried excitedly, and though someone else declared that a glide from such a height was unthinkable and impossible, yet it was soon plain that the first speaker was right down through unimaginable thousands of feet straight and swift swept the machine making such a sweep as the eagle in its pride would never have dared people held their breath to watch expecting every moment some catastrophe but the machine kept on an even keel and in a few moments i joined with the others in a wild rush to the field at a little distance where the machine like a mighty bird had alighted easily and safely. But when we reached it, we doubted our own eyes, our own sanity. There was no sign anywhere of Radcliffe Thorpe. No one knew what to say. We looked blankly at our neighbours, and one man got down on his hands and knees and peered under the body of the machine, as if he suspected Radcliffe of hiding there. Then the chairman of the meeting, lord fallowfield made a curious discovery look he said in a high shaken voice the steering wheel is jammed it was true the steering wheel had been carefully fastened in one position and the lever controlling the planes had also been fixed so as to hold them at the right angle for a downward glide that was strange enough but in face of the mystery of Radcliffe's disappearance, little attention was paid it. Where, then, was its pilot? That was the question that was filling everybody's mind. He had vanished as utterly as vanishes the mist one sees rising in the sunshine. 
it was supposed he must have fallen from his seat but as to how that had happened how it was that no fragment of his body or his clothing was ever found above all how it was that his aeroplane had returned the engine cut off the planes secured in correct position no even moderately plausible explanation was ever put forward the loss to aeronautics was felt to be severe from childhood radcliffe had shown that in addition to this he had a marked aptitude for drawing usually held at the service of his profession but now and again exercised in producing sketches of his friends among those who knew him privately he was fairly popular though not perhaps so much so as he deserved certainly he had a way of talking shop which was a trifle tiring to those who did not figure the world as one vast engineering problem while with women he was apt to be brusque and short-mannered my surprise then can be imagined when calling one afternoon on him and having to wait a little i had noticed lying on his desk a crayon sketch of a woman's face it was a very lovely face the features almost perfect and yet there was about it something unearthly and spectral that was curiously disturbing smitten at last i asked jestingly and yet aware of a certain odd discomfort when he saw what i was looking at he went very pale who is it i asked oh just someone he answered he took the sketch from me looked at it frowned and locked it away as he seemed unwilling to pursue the subject i went on to talk of the business i had come about and i congratulated him on his flight of the day before in which he had broken the record for height as i was going he said by the way that sketch what did you think of it why that you had better be careful i answered laughing or you'll be falling from your high estate of bachelordom he gave so violent a start his face expressed so much of apprehension and dismay that i stared at him blankly recovering himself with an effort he stammered out it's not i mean it's an imaginary portrait then i said amazed in my turn you've a jolly sight more imagination than any one ever credited you with the incident remained in my mind as a matter of fact practical radcliffe thorpe absorbed in questions of strain and ease his head full of cylinders and wheels and ratchets and the lord knows what else would have seemed to me the last man on earth to create that haunting strange unearthly face human in form but not in expression it was about this time that radcliffe began to give so much attention to the making of very high flights his favourite time was in the early morning as soon as it was light then in the chill dawn he would rise and soar and wing his flight high and ever higher up and up till the eye could no longer follow his ascent i remember he made one of these strange solitary flights when i was spending the weekend with him at his cottage near the attercliffe aviation grounds i had come down from town somewhat late the night before and i remember that just before we went to bed we went out for a few minutes to enjoy the beauty of a perfect night the moon was shining in a clear sky not a sound or a breath disturbed the sublime quietude in the south one wondrous star gleamed low on the horizon neither of us spoke it was enough to drink in the beauty of such rare perfection and i noticed how radcliffe kept his eyes fixed upwards on the dark blue vault of space are you longing to be up there i asked him jestingly he started and flushed and he then went very pale and to my surprise i saw that he was shivering you are getting cold i said we had better go in he nodded without answering and as we turned to go in 
i heard quite plainly and distinctly a low strange laugh a laugh full of a honeyed sweetness that yet thrilled me with great fear what's that i said stopping short what radcliffe asked someone laughed i said and i stared all round and then upwards i thought it came from up there i said in a bewildered way pointing upwards he gave me an odd look and without answering went into the cottage he had said nothing of having planned any flight for the next morning but in the early morning the chill and grey dawn i was roused by the drumming of his engine at once i jumped up out of bed and ran to the window the machine was raising itself lightly and easily from the ground i watched him wing his godlike way up through the still soft air till he was lost to view then after a time i saw him emerge again from those immensities of space he came down in one long majestic sweep and alighted in a field a little way away from the house leaving the aeroplane for his mechanics to fetch up presently hello i greeted him why didn't you tell me you were going up as i spoke i heard plainly and distinctly as plainly as ever i heard anything in my life that low strange laugh that i had heard before so silvery sweet and yet somehow so horrible what's that i said stopping short and staring blankly upwards for absurd though it seems that weird sound seemed to come floating down from an infinite height above us not high enough he muttered like a man in an ecstasy not high enough yet he walked away from me then without another word when i entered the cottage he was seated at the table sketching a woman's face the same face i had seen in that other sketch of his spectral unreal and lovely what on earth i began nothing on earth he answered in a strange voice then he laughed and jumped up and tore his sketch across he seemed quite his old self again chatty and pleasant and with his old passion for talking shop he launched into a long explanation of some scheme he had in mind for securing automatic balancing i never told anyone about that strange mocking laugh in fact i had almost forgotten the incident altogether when something brought every detail back to my memory i had a letter from a person who signed himself george barnes barnes it seemed was the operator who had taken the pictures of that last ascent and as he understood i had been mr thorpe's greatest friend he wanted to see me certain expressions in the letter aroused my curiosity i replied he asked for an appointment at a time that was not very convenient and finally i arranged to call at his house one evening it was one of those smart little six-room villas of which so many have been put up in the london suburbs of late barnes was buying it on the instalment system and i quite won his heart by complimenting him on it but for that i doubt if anything would have come of my visit for he was plainly nervous and ill at ease and very repentant of ever having said anything but after my compliment to the house we got on better it's on my mind he said i shan't be easy till someone else knows we were in the front room where a good fire was burning in my honour i guessed for the apartment had not the air of being much used on the table were some photographs barnes showed them me they were enlargements from those he had taken of poor radcliffe's last ascent they've been shown all over the world he said millions of people have seen them well i said but there's one no one has seen no one except me he produced another print and gave it to me i glanced at it 
it seemed much like the others having been apparently one of the last of the series taken when the aeroplane was at a great height the only thing in which it differed from the others was that it seemed a trifle blurred a poor one i said it's misty look at the mist he said i did so slowly very slowly i began to see that that misty appearance had a shape a form even as i looked i saw the features of a human countenance and yet not human either so spectral was it so unreal and strange i felt the blood run cold in my veins and the hair bristle on the scalp of my head for i recognized beyond all doubt that this face on the photograph was the same as that radcliffe had sketched the resemblance was absolute no one who had seen the one could mistake the other you see it barnes muttered and his face was almost as pale as mine there's a woman i stammered a woman floating in the air by his side her arms are held out to him yes barnes said who was she the print slipped from my hands and fluttered to the ground barnes picked it up and put it in the fire was it fancy or as it flared up and burnt and was consumed did i really hear a faint laugh floating downwards from the upper air i destroyed the negative barnes said and i told my boss something had gone wrong with it no one has seen that photograph but you and me and now no one ever will End of The Last Ascent The Damned Thing by Ambrose Bierce This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emily Sherrill The Damned Thing by Ambrose Bierce by the light of a tallow candle, which had been placed on one end of a rough table, a man was reading something written in a book. It was an old account book, greatly worn, and the writing was not apparently very legible, for the man sometimes held the page close to the flame of the candle to get a stronger light upon it. The shadow of the book would then throw into obscurity a half of the room, darkening a number of faces and figures, for besides the reader, eight other men were present. Seven of them sat against the rough log walls, silent and motionless, and the room being small, not very far from the table. By extending an arm, any one of them could have touched the eighth man, who lay on the table, face upward, partly covered by a sheet, his arms at his sides. He was dead. The man with the book was not reading aloud, and no one spoke. All seemed to be waiting for something to occur. The dead man only was without expectation. From the blank darkness outside came in, through the aperture that served for a window, all the ever unfamiliar noises of night in the wilderness, the long nameless note of a distant coyote, the stilly pulsing thrill of tireless insects in trees, strange cries of night birds, so different from those of the birds of day, the drone of great blundering beetles and all that mysterious chorus of small sounds that seem always to have been but half heard, but when they have suddenly ceased, as if conscious of an indiscretion. But nothing of all this was noted in that company. Its members were not over much addicted to idle interest in matters of no practical importance. That was obvious in every line of their rugged faces, obvious even in the dim light of the single candle. They were evidently men of the vicinity, farmers and woodmen the person reading was a trifle different one would have said of him that he was of the world worldly albeit there was that in his attire which attested a certain fellowship with the organisms of his environment 
His coat could hardly have passed muster in San Francisco. His footgear was not of urban origin, and the hat that lay by him on the floor, he was the only one uncovered, was such that if one had considered it an article of mere personal adornment, he would have missed its meaning. In countenance, the man was rather prepossessing, with just a hint of sternness though that he may have assumed or cultivated as appropriate to one in authority. For he was a coroner. It was by virtue of his office that he had possession of the book in which he was reading. It had been found among the dead man's effects, in his cabin, where the inquest was now taking place. When the coroner had finished reading, he put the book into his breast pocket. At that moment the door was pushed open and a young man entered. He, clearly, was not of mountain birth and breeding. He was clad as those who dwell in cities. His clothing was dusty, however, as from travel. He had, in fact, been riding hard to attend the inquest. The coroner nodded and no one else greeted him. "'We have waited for you,' said the coroner. "'It is necessary to have done with his business tonight.' The young man smiled. "'I am sorry to have kept you,' he said. "'I went away, not to evade your summons, "'but to post to my newspaper "'an account of what I suppose I am called back to relate.' "'The coroner smiled. "'The account that you posted to your newspaper,' he said, "'differs probably from that which you will give here under oath.' "'That,' replied the other, rather hotly and with a visible flush, "'is as you choose.' I used manifold paper and have a copy of what I sent. It was not written as news, for it is incredible, but as fiction. It may go as a part of my testimony under oath. But you say it is incredible. That is nothing to you, sir, if I also swear that it is true. The coroner was apparently not greatly affected by the young man's manifest resentment. He was silent for some moments, his eyes upon the floor. The men about the sides of the cabin talked in whispers, but seldom withdrew their gaze from the face of the corpse. Presently the coroner lifted his eyes and said, We will resume the inquest. The men removed their hats. The witness was sworn. What is your name? the coroner asked. William Harker. Age? Twenty-seven. You knew the deceased, Hugh Morgan? Yes. You were with him when he died? Near him. How did that happen? Your, your presence, I mean. I was visiting him at this place to shoot and fish. A part of my purpose, however, was to study him. And his odd, solitary way of life. He seemed a good model for a character in fiction. I sometimes write stories. I sometimes read them. Thank you. Stories in general, not yours. Some of the jurors laughed. Against a sombre background, humour shows highlights. Soldiers in the intervals of battle laugh easily, and a jest in the death chamber conquers by surprise. Relate the circumstances of this man's death, said the coroner. You may use any notes or memoranda that you please. The witness understood. Pulling a manuscript from his breast pocket, he held it near the candle, and turning the leaves until he found the passage that he wanted, began to read. The sun had hardly risen when we left the house. We were looking for quail, each with a shotgun, but we had only one dog. Morgan said that our best ground was beyond a certain ridge that he pointed out, and we crossed it by a trail through the chaparral. On the other side was a comparatively level ground, thickly covered with wild oats. As we emerged from the chaparral, Morgan was but a few yards in advance. Suddenly we heard, at a little distance to our right, and partly in front, a noise of some animal thrashing about in the bushes, which we could see were violently agitated. "'We've started a deer,' I said. "'I wish we'd brought a rifle.' Morgan, who had stopped and was intently watching the agitated chaparral, said nothing, but had cocked both barrels of his gun and was holding it in readiness to aim. I thought him a trifle excited, which surprised me, for he had a reputation for exceptional coolness, 
even in moments of sudden and imminent peril. Oh, come, I said. You're not going to fill up a deer with quail shot, are you? Still he did not reply, but catching sight of his face as he turned it slightly toward me, I was struck by the pallor of it. Then I understood that we had serious business on hand, and my first conjecture was that we had jumped a grizzly. I advanced to Morgan's side, cocking my piece as I moved. The bushes were now quiet and the sounds had ceased, but Morgan was as attentive to the place as before. "'What is it? What the devil is it?' I asked. "'That damned thing!' he replied, without turning his head, whose voice was husky and unnatural. He trembled visibly. I was about to speak further when I observed the wild oats near the place of the disturbance moving in the most inexplicable way. I can hardly describe it. It seemed as if stirred by a streak of wind which not only bent it but pressed it down, crushed it so that it did not rise, and this movement was slowly prolonging itself directly towards us. Nothing that I had ever seen had affected me so strangely as this unfamiliar and unaccountable phenomenon. Yet I am unable to recall any sense of fear. I remember, and tell it here because, singularly enough, I recollected it then that once, in looking carelessly out of an open window, I momentarily mistook a small tree close at hand for one of a group of larger trees at a distance away. It looked the same size as the others, but being more distinctly and sharply defined in mass and detail, seemed out of harmony with them. It was a mere falsification of the law of aerial perspective, but it startled, almost terrified me. We so rely upon the orderly operation of familiar natural laws that any seeming suspension of them is noted as a menace to our safety, a warning of unthinkable calamity. So now the apparently causeless movement of the herbage and the slow, undeviating approach of the line of disturbance were distinctly disquieting. My companion appeared actually frightened, and I could hardly credit my senses when I saw him suddenly throw his gun to his shoulders and fire both barrels at the agitated grass. Before the smoke of the discharge had cleared away, I heard a loud, savage cry, a scream like that of a wild animal, and, flinging his gun upon the ground, Morgan sprang away and ran swiftly from the spot. At the same instant, I was thrown violently to the ground by the impact of something unseen in the smoke some soft, heavy substance that seemed thrown against me with great force. Before I could get up on my feet and recover my gun, which seemed to have been struck from my hands, I heard Morgan crying out as if in mortal agony, and mingling with his cries was such hoarse, savage sounds as one hears from fighting dogs. Inexpressibly terrified, I struggled to my feet and looked in the direction of Morgan's retreat, and may heaven in mercy spare me from another sight like that. At a distance of less than thirty yards was my friend, down upon one knee, his head thrown back at a frightful angle, hatless, his long hair in disorder and his whole body in violent movement from side to side, backward and forward. His right arm was lifted and seemed to lack the hand, at least I could see none. The other arm was invisible. At times, as my memory now reports this extraordinary scene, I could discern but a part of his body. It was as if he had been partly blotted out. I cannot otherwise express it. Then a shifting of his position would bring it all into view again. All this must have occurred within a few seconds, yet in that time Morgan assumed all the postures of a determined wrestler vanquished by a superior weight and strength. I saw nothing but him and him not always distinctly. During the entire incident, his shouts and curses were heard as if through an enveloping uproar of such sounds of rage and fury as I'd never heard from the throat of a man or brute. For a moment only I stood irresolute. Then, throwing down my gun, I ran forward to my friend's assistance. I had a vague belief that he was suffering from a fit or some form of convulsion, before I could reach his side, he was down and quiet. All sounds had ceased, but with a feeling of such terror as even these awful events had not inspired, I now saw the same mysterious movement of the wild oats prolonging itself from the trampled area about the prostrate man toward the edge of a wood.
It was only when it had reached the wood that I was able to withdraw my eyes and look at my companion. He was dead. The coroner rose from his seat and stood beside the dead man. Lifting an edge of the sheet, he pulled it away, exposing the entire body, altogether naked and showing in the candlelight a clay-like yellow. It had, however, broad maculations of bluish-black, obviously caused by extravasated blood from contusions. The chest and sides looked as if they had been beaten with a bludgeon. There were dreadful lacerations. The skin was torn in strips and shreds. The coroner moved around to the end of the table and undid a silk handkerchief, which had been passed under the chin and knotted on the top of the head. When the handkerchief was drawn away, it exposed what would have been a throat. Some of the jurors who had risen to get a better view repented their curiosity and turned away their faces. Witness Harker went to the open window and leaned out across the sill, faint and sick. Dropping the handkerchief upon the dead man's neck, the coroner stepped to an angle of the room and from a pile of clothing produced one garment after another, each of which he held up for a moment for inspection. All were torn, stiff, with blood. The jurors did not make a closer inspection. They seemed rather uninterested. They had, in truth, seen all this before. The only thing that was new to them was Harker's testimony. Gentlemen, the coroner said, we have no more evidence, I think. Your duty has been already explained to you. If there is nothing you wish to ask, you may go outside and consider your verdict. The foreman rose, a tall, bearded man of sixty, coarsely clad. I should like to ask one question, Mr. Coroner, he said. What asylum did this year last witness come from? Mr. Harker, said the coroner, gravely and tranquilly. From what asylum did you last escape? Harker flushed crimson again and said nothing, and the seven jurors rose and solemnly filed out of the cabin. If you have done insulting me, sir, said Harker, as soon as he and the officer were left alone with the dead man, I suppose I am at liberty to go? Yes. Harker started to leave, but paused with his hand on the door latch. The habit of his profession was strong in him, stronger than his sense of personal dignity. He turned about and said, The book you have there, I recognise it as Morgan's diary. You seem greatly interested in it. You read in it while I was testifying. May I see it? The public would like... The book will cut no figure in this matter, replied the official, slipping it into his coat pocket. All the entries in it were made before the writer's death. As Harker passed out of the house, the jury re-entered and stood about the table on which the now-covered corpse showed under the sheet with sharp definition. The foreman seated himself near the candle, produced from his breast pocket a pencil and a scrap of paper, and wrote rather laboriously the following verdict which with various degrees of effort all signed. We, the jury, do find the remains come to their death at the hands of a mountain lion, but some of us thinks all the same they had fits. In the diary of the late Hugh Morgan are certain interesting entries having possibly a scientific value as suggestions. At the inquest upon his body, the book was not put into evidence, Possibly the coroner thought it not worth while to confuse the jury. The date of the first of the entries mentioned cannot be ascertained. The upper part of the leaf is torn away. The part of the entry remaining is as follows. Would run in a half circle, keeping his head turned always toward the centre and again he would stand still, barking furiously. At last he ran away into the brush as fast as he could go. I thought at first that he had gone mad but on returning to the house found no other alteration in his manner than what was obviously due to fear of punishment. Can a dog see with his nose? Do odours impress some olfactory centre with images of the thing emitting them? Looking at the stars last night as they rose above the crest of the ridge east of the house, 
I observed them successively disappear from left to right. Each was eclipsed by an instant, and only a few at the same time, but along the entire length of the ridge, all that were within a degree or two of the crest were blotted out. It was as if something had passed along between me and them, but I could not see it, and the stars were not thick enough to define its outline. Ugh, I don't like this. Several weeks' entries are missing, three leaves being torn from the book. September 27. It has been about here again. I find evidences of its presence every day. I watched again all of last night in the same cover, gun in hand, double charged with buckshot. In the morning the fresh footprints were there, as before. Yet I would have sworn that I did not sleep. Indeed, I hardly slept at all. It is terrible, insupportable. If these amazing experiences are real, I shall go mad. If they are fanciful, I am mad already. I shall not go. It shall not drive me away. No, this is my house, my land. God hates a coward. October the 5th. I can stand it no longer. I have invited Harker to pass a few weeks with me. He has a level head. I can judge from his manner if he thinks me mad. October 7. I have the solution of the problem. It came to me last night, suddenly, as if by revelation. How simple, how terribly simple. There are sounds that we cannot hear. At either end of the scale are notes that stir no chord of that imperfect instrument, the human ear. They're too high or too grave. I have observed a flock of blackbirds occupying an entire treetop, the tops of several trees, and all in full song. Suddenly, in a moment, at absolutely the same instant, all spring into the air and fly away. How? They could not all see one another. A whole treetops intervened. At no point could a leader have been visible to all. There must have been a signal of warning or command, high and shrill above the din, but by me unheard. I have observed, too, the same simultaneous flight when all was silent among not only blackbirds but other birds. Quail, for example, widely separated by bushes, even on opposite sides of a hill. It is known to seamen that a school of whales basking or sporting on the surface of the ocean miles apart with the convexity of the earth between them, will sometimes dive at the same instant, all gone out of sight in a moment. The signal has been sounded, too grave for the ear of the sailor at the masthead and his comrades on the deck, who nevertheless feel its vibrations in the ship as the stones of the cathedral are stirred by the bass of the organ. As with sounds, so with colours. At each end of the solar spectrum, the chemist can detect the presence of what are known as actinic rays. They represent colours, integral colours in the composition of light, which we are unable to discern. The human eye is an imperfect instrument. Its range is but a few octaves of the real chromatic scale. I'm not mad. There are colours that we cannot see. And God help me, the damned thing is of such a colour. The End of The Damned Thing by Ambrose Bierce Recorded by Emily Sherrill Who Knows? by Guy de Maupassant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Clark Who Knows? by Guy de Maupassant My God! My God! I'm going to write down at last what has happened to me. But how can I? How dare I? The thing is so bizarre, so inexplicable, so incomprehensible, so silly. If I were not perfectly sure of what I have seen, sure, that there was not in my reasoning any defect, any error in my declarations, 
any lacuna in the inflexible sequence of my observations, I should believe myself to be the dupe of a simple hallucination, the sport of a singular vision. After all, who knows? Yesterday, I was in a private asylum, but I went there voluntarily, out of prudence and fear. Only one single human being knows my history, and that is the doctor of the said asylum. I am going to write to him. I really do not know why. To disembarrass myself? Yea, I feel as though weighed down by an intolerable nightmare. Let me explain. I have always been a recluse, a dreamer, a kind of isolated philosopher, easy-going, content with but little, harboring ill-feeling against no man, and without even a grudge against heaven. I have constantly lived alone. Consequently, a kind of torture takes hold of me when I find myself in the presence of others. How is this to be explained? I do not know. I am not averse to going out into the world, to conversation, to dining with friends, but when they are near me for any length of time, even the most intimate of them, they bore me, fatigue me, enervate me, and I experience an overwhelming, torturing desire to see them get up and go to take themselves away and to leave me by myself. That desire is more than a craving. It is an irresistible necessity. And if the presence of people with whom I find myself were to be continued, if I were compelled not only to listen, but also to follow for any length of time their conversation, a serious accident would assuredly take place. What kind of accident? <laughs> who knows? Perhaps a slight paralytic stroke? Probably. I like solitude so much that I cannot even endure the vicinage of other beings sleeping under the same roof. I cannot live in Paris, because there I suffer the most acute agony. I lead a moral life, and am therefore tortured in body and in nerves by that immense crowd which swarms and lives even when it sleeps. Ah! The sleeping of others is more painful still than their conversation, and I can never find repose when I know and feel that on the other side of a wall several existences are undergoing these regular eclipses of reason. Why am I thus? Who knows? The cause of it is very simple, perhaps. I get tired very soon of everything that does not emanate from me, and there are many people in similar case. We are, on earth, two distinct races, those who have need of others, whom others amuse, engage, soothe, whom solitude harasses, pains, stupefies, like the movement of a terrible glacier or the traversing of the desert, and those, on the contrary, whom others weary, tire, bore, silently torture, whom isolation calms and bathes in the repose of independency, and plunges into the humors of their own thoughts. In fine, there is here a normal, physical phenomenon. Some are constituted to live a life outside of themselves, others to live a life within themselves. As for me, my exterior associations are abruptly and painfully short-lived, and, as they reach their limits, I experience in my whole body and in my whole intelligence an intolerable uneasiness. As a result of this, I became attached, or rather had become much attached, to inanimate objects, which have for me the importance of beings, and my house has, or had, become a world in which I lived an active and solitary life, surrounded by all manner of things, furniture, familiar knick-knacks, as sympathetic in my eyes as the visages of human beings. I had filled my mansion with them. Little by little, I had adorned it with them, and I felt an inward content and satisfaction I was more happy than if I had been in the arms of a beloved girl, whose wanted caresses had become a soothing and delightful necessity. I had had this house constructed in the center of a beautiful garden, which hid it from the public highways, and which was near the entrance to a city where I could find, on occasion, the resources of society for which, at moments, I had a longing. 
all my domestics slept in a separate building, which was situated at some considerable distance from my house, at the far end of the kitchen garden, which in turn was surrounded by a high wall. The obscure envelopment of night, in the silence of my concealed habitation, buried under the leaves of great trees, was so reposeful and so delicious that before retiring to my couch I lingered every evening for several hours in order to enjoy the solitude a little longer. One day Signet had been playing at one of the city theatres. It was the first time that I had listened to that beautiful, musical, and fairy-like drama, and I had derived from it the liveliest pleasures. I returned home on foot with a light step, my head full of sonorous phrases, and my mind haunted by delightful visions. It was night, the dead of night, and so dark that I could hardly distinguish the broad highway, and consequently I stumbled into the ditch more than once. From the custom house, at the barriers, to my house, was about a mile, perhaps a little more, a leisurely walk of about twenty minutes. It was one o'clock in the morning, one o'clock or maybe half-past one. The sky had by this time cleared somewhat, and the crescent appeared, the gloomy crescent of the last quarter of the moon. The crescent of the first quarter is that which rises about five or six o'clock in the evening and is clear, gay, and fretted with silver. But the one which rises after midnight is reddish, sad, and desolating. It is the true Sabbath crescent. Every prowler by night has made the same observation. The first, though slender as a thread, throws a faint, joyous light which rejoices the heart and lines the ground with distinct shadows. The last sheds hardly a dying glimmer, and is so wan that it occasions hardly any shadows. In the distance I perceived the somber mass of my garden, and, I know not why, was seized with a feeling of uneasiness at the idea of going inside. I slackened my pace and walked very softly, the thick cluster of trees having the appearance of a tomb in which my house was buried. I opened my outer gate and entered the long avenue of sycamores which ran in the direction of the house, arranged vault-wise like a high tunnel, traversing opaque masses and winding round the turf lawns, on which baskets of flowers, in the pale darkness, could be indistinctly discerned. While approaching the house, I was seized by a strange feeling. I could hear nothing. I stood still. Through the trees there was not even a breath of air stirring. What is the matter with me? I said to myself. For ten years I had entered and re-entered in the same way, without ever experiencing the least inquietude. I never had any fear at nights. The sight of a man, a marauder, or a thief would have thrown me into a fit of anger, and I would have rushed at him without any hesitation. Moreover, I was armed. I had my revolver. But I did not touch it for I was anxious to resist that feeling of dread with which I was seized. What was it? Was it a presentiment? That mysterious presentiment which takes hold of the senses of men who have witnessed something which, to them, is inexplicable? Perhaps? Who knows? In proportion as I advanced, I felt my skin quiver more and more. And when I was close to the wall, near the outhouses of my large residence, I felt that it would be necessary for me to wait a few minutes before opening the door and going inside. I sat down, then, on a bench under the windows of my drawing-room. I rested there, a little disturbed, with my head leaning against the wall my eyes wide open under the shade of the foliage. For the first few minutes I did not observe anything unusual around me. I had a humming noise in my ears, 
but that has happened often to me. Sometimes it seemed to me that I heard trains passing, that I heard clocks striking, that I heard a multitude on the march. Very soon those humming noises became more distinct, more concentrated, more determinable. I was deceiving myself. It was not the ordinary tingling of my arteries which transmitted to my ears these rumbling sounds, but it was a very distinct, though confused noise which came, without any doubt whatever, from the interior of my house. Through the walls I distinguished this continued noise. I should rather say agitation than noise, an indistinct moving about, of a pile of things, as if people were tossing about, displacing, and carrying away surreptitiously all my furniture. I doubted, however, for some considerable time yet, the evidence of my ears. But having placed my ear against one of the outhouses, the better to discover what this strange disturbance was inside my house, I became convinced certain that something was taking place in my residence which was altogether abnormal and incomprehensible. I had no fear, but I was, how shall I express it, paralyzed by astonishment. I did not draw my revolver, knowing very well that there was no need of my doing so. I listened a long time but could come to no resolution, my mind being quite clear, though in myself I was naturally anxious. I got up and waited, listening always to the noise, which gradually increased and at intervals grew very loud and which seemed to become an impatient, angry disturbance, a mysterious commotion. Then, suddenly, ashamed of my timidity, I seized my bunch of keys. I selected the one I wanted, guided it into the lock, turned it twice, and pushing the door with all my might, sent it banging against the partition. The collision sounded like the report of a gun, and there responded to that explosive noise, from roof to basement of my residence, a formidable tumult. It was so sudden, so terrible, so deafening, that I recoiled a few steps, and though I knew it to be wholly useless, I pulled my revolver out of its case. I continued to listen for some time longer. I could distinguish now an extraordinary pattering upon the steps of my grand staircase, on the waxed floors, on the carpets, not of boots, or of naked feet of iron and wooden crutches which resounded like cymbals, then I suddenly discerned on the threshold of my door an armchair, my large reading easy chair, which set off, waddling. It went away through my garden. Others followed it, those of my drawing room, then my sofas, dragging themselves along like crocodiles on their short paws. Then all my chairs, bounding like goats, and the little footstools, hopping like rabbits. Oh, what a sensation! I slunk back into a clump of bushes, where I remained crouched up, watching, meanwhile, my furniture defile past. For everything walked away, the one behind the other, briskly or slowly, according to its weight or size. My piano, my grand piano, bounded past with the gallop of a horse and a murmur of music in its sides. The smaller articles slid along the gravel like snails. My brushes, crystal, cups, and saucers, which glistened in the moonlight. I saw my writing desk appear, a rare curiosity of the last century, which contained all the letters I had ever received, all the history of my heart, an old history from which I have suffered so much. Besides, there were inside of it a great many cherished photographs. Suddenly, I no longer had any fear, 
I threw myself on it, seized it as one would seize a thief, as one would seize a wife about to run away, but it pursued its irresistible course, and despite my efforts, and despite my anger, I could not even retard its pace. As I was resisting in desperation that insuperable force, I was thrown to the ground. It then rolled me over, trailed me along the gravel, and the rest of my furniture which followed it began to march over me, tramping on my legs and injuring them. When I loosed my hold, other articles had passed over my body, just as a charge of cavalry does over the body of a dismounted soldier. Seized at last with terror, I succeeded in dragging myself out of the main avenue, and in concealing myself again among the shrubbery, so as to watch the disappearance of the most cherished objects, the smallest, the least striking, the least unknown which had once belonged to me. I then heard, in the distance, noises which came from my apartments, which sounded now as if the house were empty, a loud noise of shutting of doors. They were being slammed from top to bottom of my dwelling, even the door which I had just opened myself unconsciously, and which had closed of itself when the last thing had taken its departure. I took flight also, running toward the city, and only regained my self-composure on reaching the boulevards where I met belated people. I rang the bell of a hotel where I was known. I had knocked the dust off my clothes with my hands, and I told the porter that I had lost my bunch of keys, which included also that to the kitchen garden, where my servants slept in a house standing by itself on the other side of the wall of the enclosure which protected my fruits and vegetables from the raids of marauders. I covered myself up to the eyes in the bed which was assigned to me, but could not sleep. And I waited for dawn listening to the throbbing of my heart. I had given orders that my servants were to be summoned to the hotel at daybreak, and my valet de chambre knocked at my door at seven o'clock in the morning. His countenance bore a woeful look. "'A great misfortune has happened during the night, monsieur,' said he. "'What is it?' "'Somebody has stolen the whole of Monsieur's furniture. "'All. Everything, even to the smallest articles. "'This news pleased me. "'Why? Who knows? "'I was complete master of myself, "'bent on dissimulating, on telling no one of anything I had seen.' determined on concealing and in burying in my heart of hearts a terrible secret. I responded, They must then be the same people who have stolen my keys. The police must be informed immediately. I am going to get up, and I will join you in a few moments. The investigation into the circumstances under which the robbery might have been committed lasted for five months. Nothing was found, not even the smallest of my knick-knacks, nor the least trace of the thieves. Good gracious, if I had only told them what I knew, if I had said, I should have been locked up, I, not the thieves, for I was the only person who had seen everything from the first. Yes, but I knew how to keep silence. I shall never refurnish my house. That were indeed useless. The same thing would happen again. I had no desire even to re-enter the house, and I did not re-enter it. I never visited it again. I moved to Paris, to the hotel, and consulted doctors in regard to the condition of my nerves, which had disquieted me a good deal ever since that awful night. They advised me to travel, and I followed their counsel. I began by making an excursion into Italy. The sunshine did me much good. For six months I wandered about from Genoa to Venice, from Venice to Florence, from Florence to Rome, from Rome to Naples. Then I traveled over Sicily, 
a country celebrated for its scenery and its monuments, relics left by the Greeks and the Normans. Passing over into Africa, I traversed at my ease that immense desert, yellow and tranquil, in which camels, gazelles, and Arab vagabonds roam about, where, in the rare and transparent atmosphere, there hover no vague hauntings, where there is never any night but always day. I returned to France by Marseille, and in spite of all its provincial gaiety, the diminished clearness of the sky made me sad. I experienced, in returning to the continent, the peculiar sensation of an illness which I believed had been cured, and a dull pain which predicted that the seeds of the disease had not been eradicated. I then returned to Paris. At the end of a month, I was very dejected. It was in the autumn, and I determined to make, before winter came, an excursion through Normandy, a country with which I was unacquainted. I began my journey in the best of spirits at Rouen, and for eight days I wandered about, passive, ravished, and enthusiastic in that ancient city, that astonishing museum of extraordinary Gothic monuments. But one afternoon, about four o'clock, as I was sauntering slowly through a seemingly unattractive street, by which there ran a stream as black as the ink, called Eau de Robec, my attention, fixed for the moment on the quaint, antique appearance of some of the houses, was suddenly attracted by the view of a series of second-hand furniture shops, which followed one another, door after door. Ah! They had carefully chosen their locality, these sordid traffickers and antiquities, in that quaint little street, overlooking the sinister stream of water, under those tile and slate-pointed roofs, on which still grinned the veins of bygone days. At the end of these grim storehouses you saw piled up sculptured chests, Rouen, Sèvres, and Moustier's pottery, painted statues, others of oak, Christ's, virgins, saints, church ornaments, chasubles, capes, even sacred vases, and an old gilded wooden tabernacle, where a god had hidden himself away. What singular caverns there are in those lofty houses, crowded with objects of every description, where the existence of things seems to be ended, things which had survived their original possessors, their century, their times, their fashions, in order to be bought as curiosities by new generations. My affection for antiques was awakened in that city of antiquaries. I went from shop to shop, crossing in two strides the rotten four-plank bridges thrown over the nauseous current of the Eau de Robec. Heaven protect me! What a shock! at the end of a vault which was crowded with articles of every description and which seemed to be the entrance to the catacombs of a cemetery of ancient furniture, I suddenly descried one of my most beautiful wardrobes. I approached it, trembling in every limb, trembling to such an extent that I dared not touch it. I put forth my hand. I hesitated. Nevertheless, it was indeed my wardrobe, a unique wardrobe of the time of Louis the Thirteenth, recognizable by any one who had seen it only once. Casting my eyes suddenly a little farther, toward the more somber depths of the gallery, I perceived three of my tapestry-covered chairs, and, farther on still, my two Henry the Second tables, such rare treasures that people came all the way from Paris to see them. Think, only think in what state of mind I now was. I advanced, haltingly, quivering with emotion. But I advanced, for I am brave. I advanced like a knight of the Dark Ages. At 
every step I found something that belonged to me. My brushes, my books, my tables, my silks, my arms, everything except the bureau full of my letters, and that I could not discover. I walked on, descending to the dark galleries, in order to ascend next to the floors above. I was alone. I called out. Nobody answered. I was alone. There was no one in that house, a house as vast and tortuous as a labyrinth. Night came on, and I was compelled to sit down in the darkness on one of my own chairs, for I had no desire to go away. From time to time I shouted, Hello! Hello! Somebody! I had sat there, certainly, for more than an hour when I heard steps, steps soft and slow. I knew not where. I was unable to locate them, but bracing myself up, I called out anew, whereupon I perceived a glimmer of light in the next chamber. "'Who is there?' said a voice. "'A buyer,' I responded. "'It is too late to enter thus into a shop. "'I have been waiting for you for more than an hour,' I answered. "'You can come back tomorrow. "'Tomorrow I must quit Rouen.' "'I dared not advance, and he did not come to me.' I saw always the glimmer of his light, which was shining on a tapestry, on which were two angels flying over the dead on a field of battle. It belonged to me also. I said, Well, come here. I am at your service, he answered. I got up and went toward him. Standing in the center of a large room was a little man, very short, and very fat. Phenomenally fat. A hideous phenomenon. He had a singular straggling beard, white and yellow, and not a hair on his head. Not a hair. As he held his candle aloft at arm's length in order to see me, his cranium appeared to me to resemble a little moon in that vast chamber encumbered with old furniture. His features were wrinkled and blown, and his eyes could not be seen. I bought three chairs, which belonged to myself, and paid at once a large sum for them, giving him merely the number of my room at the hotel. They were to be delivered the next day before nine o'clock. I then started off. He conducted me with much politeness as far as the door. I immediately repaired to the commissaire's office at the central police depot and told the commissaire of the robbery which had been perpetrated and of the discovery I had just made. He required time to communicate by telegraph with the authorities who had originally charge of the case for information, and he begged me to wait in his office until an answer came back. An hour later... An answer came back, which was in accord with my statements. "'I am going to arrest and interrogate this man at once,' he said to me, "'for he may have conceived some sort of suspicion "'and smuggled away out of sight what belongs to you. "'Will you go and dine and return in two hours? "'I shall then have the man here, "'and I shall subject him to a fresh interrogation in your presence.' Most gladly, monsieur. I thank you with my whole heart. I went to dine at my hotel, and I ate better than I could have believed. I was quite happy now, thinking that man was in the hands of the police. Two hours later, I returned to the office of the police functionary, who was waiting for me. Well, monsieur, said he on perceiving me, we have not been able to find your man. My agents cannot put their hands on him. Ah, oh, 
I felt my heart sinking. But you have at least found his house? I asked. Yes, certainly. And, what is more, it is now being watched and guarded until his return. As for him, he has disappeared. Disappeared? Yes, disappeared. He ordinarily passes his evenings at the house of a female neighbor, who is also a furniture broker, a queer sort of sorceress, the widow Bidouin. She has not seen him this evening, and cannot give any information in regard to him. We must wait until tomorrow. I went away. Ah! How sinister the streets of Rouen seemed to me, now troubled and haunted. I slept so badly that I had a fit of nightmare every time I went off to sleep. As I did not wish to appear too restless or eager, I waited till ten o'clock the next day before reporting myself to the police. The merchant had not reappeared. His shop remained closed. The commissary said to me, I have taken all the necessary steps. The court has been made acquainted with the affair. We shall go together to that shop and have it opened, and you shall point out to me all that belongs to you. We drove there in a cab. Police agents were stationed round the building. There was a locksmith, too, and the door of the shop was soon opened. On entering... I could not discover my wardrobes, my chairs, my tables. I saw nothing, nothing of that which had furnished my house. No, nothing, although on the previous evening I could not take a step without encountering something that belonged to me. The chief commissary, much astonished, regarded me at first with suspicion. "'My God, monsieur,' said I to him, "'the disappearance of these articles of furniture "'coincides strangely with that of the merchant.' "'He laughed. "'That is true. <laughs> uh, "'You did wrong in buying and paying for the articles "'which were your own property yesterday. "'It was that which gave him the cue.' "'What seems to me incomprehensible?' I replied, is that all the places that were occupied by my furniture are now filled by other furniture. Oh, responded the commissary, he has had all night, and has, no doubt, been assisted by accomplices. This house must communicate with its neighbors. But have no fear, monsieur, I will have the affair promptly and thoroughly investigated. The brigand shall not escape us for long, seeing that we are in charge of the den. Ah, oh, my heart, my heart, my poor heart, how it beats. I remained a fortnight at Rouen. The man did not return. Heavens, good heavens. That man, what was it that could have frightened and surprised him? But... On the sixteenth day, early in the morning, I received from my gardener, now the keeper of my empty and pillaged house, the following strange letter. Monsieur, I have the honor to inform monsieur that something happened the evening before last, which nobody can understand, and the police no more than the rest of us. The whole of the furniture has been returned. Not one piece is missing. Everything is in its place, up to the very smallest article. The house is now the same in every respect as it was before the robbery took place. It is enough to make one lose one's head. The thing took place during the night Friday, Saturday. The roads are dug up as though the whole fence had been dragged from its place up to the door. The same thing was observed the day after the disappearance of the furniture. We are anxiously expecting monsieur, whose very humble and obedient servant I am, Philippe Rodet. 
Oh, no, no. <laughs> ah, never, never. <laughs> no, I shall never return there. I took the letter to the commissary of police. It is a very clever restitution, said he. Let us bury the hatchet. We shall nip the man one of these days. But he has never been nipped. No, they have not nipped him. And I am afraid of him now, as of some ferocious animal that has been let loose behind me. Inexplicable. It is inexplicable, this chimera of a moonstruck skull. We shall never solve or comprehend it. I shall not return to my former residence. What does it matter to me? I am afraid of encountering that man again, and I shall not run the risk. And, even if he returns, if he takes possession of his shop, who is to prove that my furniture was on his premises? There is only my testimony against him, and I feel that it is not above suspicion. <sighs> no. This kind of existence has become unendurable. I have not been able to guard the secret of what I have seen. I could not continue to live like the rest of the world, with the fear upon me that those scenes might be reenacted. So I have come to consult the doctor who directs this lunatic asylum, and I have told him everything. After questioning me for a long time, he said to me, Will you consent, monsieur, to remain here for some time? Most willingly, monsieur. You have some means? Yes, monsieur. Will you have isolated apartments? Yes, monsieur. Would you care to receive any friends? No, monsieur. No! Nobody! The man from Rouen might take it into his head to pursue me here, to be revenged on me. I have been alone. Alone. All. All alone for three months. I am growing tranquil by degrees. I have no longer any fears. If the antiquary should become mad... And if he should be brought into this asylum, <laughs> even prisons themselves are not places of security. End of Who Knows by Guy de Maupassant. The Torture of Hope by Velia de Lila Adome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Many years ago, as evening was closing in, the venerable Pedro Arbuez de Spila, sixth prior of the Dominicans of Segovia and third Grand Inquisitor of Spain, followed by a fra redemptor and preceded by two familiars of the holy office the latter carrying lanterns made their way to a subterranean dungeon the bolt of a massive door creaked and they entered a mephitic in pace where the dim light revealed between rings fastened to the wall a blood-stained rack a brazier and a jug on a pile of straw loaded with fetters and his neck encircled by an iron carcan sat a haggard man of uncertain age clothed in rags this prisoner was no other than rabbi osner abarbanel a jew of aragon who accused of usury and pitiless scorn for the poor had been daily subjected to torture for more than a year yet quote, his blindness was as dense as his hide and he refused to abjure his faith proud of affiliation dating back thousands of years proud of his ancestors for all jews worthy of the name are vain of their blood 
he descended talmudically from athoniel and consequently from ipsiboa the wife of the last judge of israel a circumstance which had sustained his courage amid incessant torture with tears in his eyes at the thought of this resolute soul rejecting salvation the venerable pedro arbues de spila approaching the shuddering rabbi addressed him as follows my son rejoice your trials here below are about to end if in the presence of such obstinacy i was forced to permit with deep regret the use of great severity my task of fraternal correction has its limits you are the fig tree which having failed so many times to bear fruit at last withered but god alone can judge your soul perhaps infinite mercy will shine upon you at the last moment we must hope so there are examples so sleep in peace to-night to-morrow you will be included in the auto da fe that is you will be exposed to the quemadero the symbolical flames of the everlasting fire it burns as you know only at a distance my son and death is at least two hours often three in coming on account of the wet iced bandages with which we protect the heads and hearts of the condemned there will be forty-three of you placed in the last row you will have time to invoke god and to offer him this baptism of fire which is of the holy spirit hope in the light and rest with these words having signed to his companions to unchain the prisoner the prior tenderly embraced him then came the turn of the fra redemptor who in a low tone entreated the jew's forgiveness for what he had made him suffer for the purpose of redeeming him then the two familiars silently kissed him this ceremony over the captive was left solitary and bewildered in the darkness rabbi Asser abarbanel with parched lips and visage worn by suffering at first gazed at the closed door with vacant eyes closed the word unconsciously roused a vague fancy in his mind the fancy that he had seen for an instant the light of the lanterns through a chink between the door and the wall a morbid idea of hope due to the weakness of his brain stirred his whole being he dragged himself toward the strange appearance then very gently and cautiously slipping one finger into the crevice he drew the door toward him marvelous by an extraordinary accident the familiar who closed it had turned the huge key an instant before it struck the stone casing so that the rusty bolt not having entered the hole the door again rolled on its hinges the rabbi ventured to glance outside by the aid of a sort of luminous dusk he distinguished at first a semicircle of walls indented by winding stairs and opposite to him at the top of five or six stone steps a sort of black portal opening into an immense corridor whose first arches only were visible from below stretching himself flat he crept to the threshold yes it was really a corridor but endless in length a wan light illumined it lamps suspended from the vaulted ceiling lightened at intervals the dull hue of the atmosphere the distance was veiled in shadow not a single door appeared in the whole extent only on one side the left heavily grated loopholes sunk in the walls admitted a light which must be that of evening for crimson bars at intervals rested on the flags of the pavement what a terrible silence yet yonder at the far end of that passage there might be a doorway of escape the jew's vacillating hope was tenacious for it was the last without hesitating he ventured on the flags keeping close under the loopholes trying to make himself part of the blackness of the long walls he advanced slowly dragging himself along on his breast forcing back the cry of pain when some raw wound sent a keen pang through his whole body suddenly the sound of a sandaled foot approaching reached his ears he trembled violently fear stifled him his sight grew dim well it was over no doubt he pressed himself into a niche and half lifeless with terror 
waited. It was a familiar hurrying along. He passed swiftly by, holding in his clenched hand an instrument of torture, a frightful figure, and vanished. The suspense which the rabbi had endured seemed to have suspended the functions of life, and he lay nearly an hour, unable to move. Fearing an increase of tortures if he were captured, he thought of returning to his dungeon. But the old hope whispered in his soul that divine perhaps which comforts us in our sorest trials. A miracle had happened. He could doubt no longer. He began to crawl toward the chance of escape. Exhausted by suffering and hunger, trembling with pain, he pressed onward. The sepulchral corridor seemed to lengthen mysteriously, while he, still advancing, gazed into the gloom where there must be some avenue of escape. Oh, oh! He again heard footsteps, but this time they were slower, more heavy. The white and black forms of two inquisitors appeared, emerging from the obscurity beyond. They were conversing in low tones, and seemed to be discussing some important subject, for they were gesticulating vehemently. At this spectacle, Rabbi Osner Abarbanel closed his eyes. His heart beat so violently that it almost suffocated him. His rags were damp with the cold sweat of agony. He lay motionless by the wall, his mouth wide open under the rays of a lamp, praying to the God of David. Just opposite to him, the two inquisitors paused under the light of the lamp, doubtless owing to some accident due to the course of their argument. One, while listening to his companion, gazed at the rabbi, and beneath that look, whose absence of expression the hapless man did not at first notice. He fancied he again felt the burning pincers scorch his flesh. He was to be once more a living wound. Fainting, breathless, with fluttering eyelids, he shivered at the touch of the monk's floating robe. But strange yet natural fact, the inquisitor's gaze was evidently that of a man deeply absorbed in his intended reply, engrossed by what he was hearing. His eyes were fixed, and seemed to look at the Jew without seeing him. In fact, after the lapse of a few minutes, the two gloomy figures slowly pursued their way, still conversing in low tones, toward the place whence the prisoner had come. He had not been seen. Amid the horrible confusion of the rabbi's thoughts, the idea darted through his brain. Can I be already dead that they did not see me? A hideous impression roused him from his lethargy, and looking at the wall against which his face was pressed, he imagined he beheld two fierce eyes watching him. He flung his head back in a sudden frenzy of fright, his hair fairly bristling. Yet, no, no. His hand groped over the stones. It was the reflection of the Inquisitor's eyes, still retained in his own, which had been reflected from two spots on the wall forward. He must hasten toward that goal which he fancied, absurdly no doubt, to be deliverance, toward the darkness from which he was now barely thirty paces distant. He pressed forward faster on his knees, his hands at full length, dragging himself painfully along, and soon entered the dark portion of this terrible corridor. Suddenly the poor wretch felt a gust of cold air on the hands resting upon the flags, it came from under the little door to which the two walls led. Oh, heaven, if that door should open outward! Every nerve in the miserable fugitive's body thrilled with hope. He examined it from top to bottom, though scarcely able to distinguish its outlines in the surrounding darkness. He passed his hand over it. No bolt, no lock, a latch. He started up. The latch yielded to the pressure of his thumb. The door silently swung open before him. Hallelujah, murmured the rabbi in a transport of gratitude as, standing on the threshold, he beheld the scene before him. The door had opened into the gardens, above which arched a starlit sky into spring, liberty, life. It revealed the neighboring fields stretching toward the Sierras, whose sinuous blue lines were relieved against the horizon. Yonder lay freedom. 
oh, to escape. He would journey all night through the lemon groves whose fragrance reached him. Once in the mountains, and he was safe. He inhaled the delicious air. The breeze revived him. His lungs expanded. He felt in his swelling heart the vinifrous of Lazarus, and to thank once more the God who had bestowed this mercy upon him, he extended his arms, raising his eyes toward heaven. It was an ecstasy of joy. Then he fancied he saw the shadow of his arms approach him, fancied that he felt these shadowy arms enclose, embrace him, and that he was pressed tenderly to someone's breast. A tall figure actually did stand directly before him. He lowered his eyes and remained motionless, gasping for breath, dazed with fixed eyes, fairly driveling with terror. Horror! He was in the class with the Grand Inquisitor himself, the venerable Pedro Arbuez de Spila, who gazed at him with tearful eyes, like a good shepherd who had found his stray lamb. The dark-robed priest pressed the hapless Jew to his heart with so fervent an outburst of love that the edge of the monocle haircloth rubbed the Dominican's breast, and while Acer a Barbanel with protruding eyes gasped in agony in the ascetic's embrace, vaguely comprehending that all the phases of this fateful evening were only a prearranged torture that of hope the grand inquisitor with an accent of touching reproach and a look of consternation murmured in his ear his breath parched and burning from long fasting what my son on the eve perchance of salvation you wished to leave us end of the torture of hope recording by david mack The Devil in Manuscript by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Clark. The Devil in Manuscript by Nathaniel Hawthorne. On a bitter evening of December, I arrived by mail in a large town which was then the residence of an intimate friend, one of those gifted youths who cultivate poetry and the belles lettres, and call themselves students at law. My first business, after supper, was to visit him at the office of his distinguished instructor. As I have said, it was a bitter night, clear starlight, but cold as Nova Zembla, the shop windows along the street being frosted so as almost to hide the lights while the wheels of coaches thundered equally loud over frozen earth and pavements of stone. There was no snow either on the ground or the roofs of the houses. The wind blew so violently that I had but to spread my cloak like a mainsail and scud along the street at the rate of ten knots, greatly envied by other navigators who were beating slowly up with the gale right in their teeth. One of these I capsized but was gone on the wings of the wind before he could even vociferate an oath. After this picture of an inclement night, behold us, seated by a great blazing fire, which looked so comfortable and delicious, that I felt inclined to lie down and roll among the hot coals. The usual furniture of a lawyer's office was around us. Rows of volumes in sheepskin, and a multitude of writs, summonses, and other legal papers scattered over the desks and tables but there were certain objects which seemed to intimate that we had little dread of the intrusion of clients, or of the learned counsellor himself, who, indeed, was attending court in a distant town. A tall, decanter-shaped bottle stood on the table, between two tumblers, and beside a pile of blotted manuscripts, altogether dissimilar to any law documents recognized in our courts. My friend, whom I shall call Oberon, it was a name of fancy and friendship between him and me. My friend Oberon looked at these papers with a peculiar expression of disquietude. I do believe, said he soberly, or at least I could believe, if I chose, that there is a devil in this pile of blotted papers. 
You have read them and know what I mean. That conception in which I endeavored to embody the character of a fiend, as represented in our traditions and the written records of witchcraft. Oh, I have a horror of what was created in my own brain, and shudder at the manuscripts in which I gave that dark idea a sort of material existence. Would they were out of my sight. And of mine, too, thought I. You remember continued Oberon, how the hellish thing used to suck away the happiness of those who, by a simple concession that seemed almost innocent, subjected themselves to his power. Just so my peace is gone, and all by these accursed manuscripts. Have you felt nothing of the same influence? Nothing, replied I, unless the spell be hid in a desire to turn novelist after reading your delightful tales. Novelist? exclaimed Oberon, half seriously. Then, indeed, my devil has his claw on you. You are gone. You cannot even pray for deliverance. But we will be the last and only victims. For this night I mean to burn the manuscripts and commit the fiend to his retribution in the flames. Burn your tales? repeated I, startled at the desperation of the idea. Even so, said the author despondingly. You cannot conceive what an effect the composition of these tales has had on me. I have become ambitious of a bubble and careless of solid reputation. I am surrounding myself with shadows which bewilder me by aping the realities of life. They have drawn me aside from the beaten path of the world and led me into a strange sort of solitude. A solitude in the midst of men, where nobody wishes for what I do, nor thinks, nor feels as I do. The tales have done all this. When they are ashes, perhaps I shall be as I was before they had existence. Moreover, the sacrifice is less than you may suppose, since nobody will publish them. That does make a difference, indeed, said I. They have been offered by letter, continued Oberon, reddening with vexation, to some seventeen booksellers. It would make you stare to read their answers, and read them you should, only that I burned them as fast as they arrived. One man publishes nothing but school books. Another has five novels already under examination. What a voluminous mass the unpublished literature of America must be, cried I. Oh, the Alexandrian manuscripts were nothing to it, said my friend. Well... Another gentleman is just giving up business on purpose, I verily believe, to escape publishing my book. Several, however, would not absolutely decline the agency on my advancing half the cost of an addition and giving bonds for the remainder, besides a high percentage to themselves, whether the book sells or not. Another advises a subscription. The villain! exclaimed I. A fact! said Oberon. In short, of all the seventeen booksellers, only one has vouchsafed even to read my tales. And he, a literary dabbler himself, I should judge, has the impertinence to criticize them, proposing what he calls vast improvements, and concluding, after a general sentence of condemnation, with the definitive assurance that he will not be concerned on any terms. It might not be amiss to pull that fellow's nose, remarked I. If the whole trade had one common nose, there would be some satisfaction in pulling it, answered the author. But there does seem to be one honest man among those seventeen unrighteous ones, and he tells me fairly that no American publisher will meddle with an American work. Seldom, if by a known writer and never, if by a new one, unless at the writer's risk. The paltry rogues, cried I. Will they live by literature, and yet risk nothing for its sake? But, after all, you might publish on your own account. And so I might, replied Oberon. But the devil of the business is this. These people have put me so out of conceit with the tales that I loathe the very thought of them, and actually experience a physical sickness of the stomach whenever I glance at them on the table. I tell you, there is a demon in them. 
I anticipate a wild enjoyment in seeing them in the blaze, such as I should feel in taking vengeance on an enemy or destroying something noxious. I did not strenuously oppose this determination, being privately of opinion, in spite of my partiality for the author, that his tales would make a more brilliant appearance in the fire than anywhere else. Before proceeding to execution, we broached the bottle of champagne which Oberon had provided for keeping up his spirits in this doleful business. We swallowed each a tumblerful in sparkling commotion. It went bubbling down our throats and brightened my eyes at once, but left my friend sad and heavy as before. He drew the tails toward him with a mixture of natural affection and natural disgust, like a father taking a deformed infant into his arms. Pooh! Psh! Psha! exclaimed he, holding them at arm's length. It was Gray's idea of heaven to lounge on a sofa and read new novels. Now, what more appropriate torture would Dante himself have contrived for the sinner who perpetuates a bad book than to be continually turning over the manuscript? It would fail of effect, said I, because a bad author is always his own great admirer. I lack that one characteristic of my tribe, the only desirable one, observed Oberon. But how many recollections throng upon me as I turn over these leaves? This scene came into my fancy as I walked along a hilly road on a starlit October evening in the pure and bracing air. I became all soul and felt as if I could climb the sky and run a race along the Milky Way. Here is another tale in which I wrapped myself during a dark and dreary night ride in the month of March, till the rattling of the wheels and the voices of my companions seemed like faint sounds of a dream, and my visions a bright reality. That scribbled page describes shadows which I summoned to my bedside at midnight. They would not depart when I bade them. The grey dawn came and found me, wide awake and feverish, the victim of my own enchantments. There must have been a sort of happiness in all this, said I, smitten with a strange longing to make proof of it. There may be happiness in a fever fit, replied the author, and then the various moods in which I wrote. Sometimes my ideas were like precious stones under the earth, requiring toil to dig them up, and care to polish and brighten them. But often a delicious stream of thought would gush out upon the page at once, like water sparkling up suddenly in the desert. And when it had passed, I gnawed my pen hopelessly, or blundered on with cold and miserable toil, as if there were a wall of ice between me and my subject. Do you now perceive a corresponding difference? inquired I, between the passages which you wrote so coldly, and those fervid flashes of the mind? No, said Oberon, tossing the manuscripts on the table. I find no traces of the golden pen with which I wrote in characters of fire. My treasure of fairy coin is changed to worthless dross. My picture, painted in what seemed the loveliest hues, presents nothing but a faded and indistinguishable surface. I have been eloquent and poetical and humorous in a dream, and behold, it is all nonsense now that I am awake. My friend now threw sticks of wood and dry chips upon the fire, and seeing it blaze like Nebuchadnezzar's furnace, seized the champagne bottle and drank two or three brimming bumpers successively. The heady liquor combined with his agitation to throw him into a species of rage. He laid violent hands on the tails. In one instant more, their faults and beauties would alike have vanished in a glowing purgatory. But, all at once, I remembered passages of high imagination, deep pathos, original thoughts, and points of such varied excellence that the vastness of the sacrifice struck me most forcibly. I caught his arm. Surely you do not mean to burn them! I exclaimed. Let me alone! cried Oberon, his eyes flashing fire. I will burn them! Not a scorched syllable shall escape! Would you have me a damned author to undergo sneers, taunts, abuse, and cold neglect, and faint praise bestowed 
for pity's sake against the giver's conscience. A hissing and a laughing stock to my own traitorous thoughts. An outlaw from the protection of the grave. One whose ashes every careless foot might spurn, unhonored in life and remembered scornfully in death. Am I to bear all this when yonder fire will ensure me from the hole? No! There go the tales. May my hand wither when it would write another. The deed was done. He had thrown the manuscripts into the hottest of the fire, which at first seemed to shrink away, but soon curled round them and made them a part of its own fervent brightness. Oberon stood gazing at the conflagration and shortly began to soliloquize in the wildest strain, as if fancy resisted and became riotous at the moment when he would have compelled her to ascend that funeral pile. His words described objects which he appeared to discern in the fire, fed by his own precious thoughts, perhaps the thousand visions which the writer's magic had incorporated with these pages became visible to him in the dissolving heat, bringing forth air they vanished forever. While the smoke, the vivid sheets of flame, the ruddy and whitening coals caught the aspect of a varied scenery. They blaze, said he, as if I had steeped them in the intensest spirit of genius. There I see my lovers clasped in each other's arms. How pure the flame that bursts from their glowing hearts. And yonder, the features of a villain writhing in the fire that shall torment him to eternity. My holy men, my pious and angelic women, stand like martyrs amid the flames, their mild eyes lifted heavenward. Ring out the bells, a city is on fire. See, destruction roars through my dark forests while the lakes boil up in steaming bellows and the mountains are volcanoes and the sky kindles with a lurid brightness. All elements are but one pervading flame. Ha! The fiend! I was somewhat startled by this latter exclamation. The tales were almost consumed but just then threw forth a broad sheet of fire, which flickered as with laughter, making the whole room dance in its brightness, and then roared potentiously up the chimney. "'You saw him! You must have seen him!' cried Oberon. "'How he glared at me and laughed in that last sheet of flame, with just the features that I imagined for him! Well, the tales are gone!' The papers were indeed reduced to a heap of black cinders, with a multitude of sparks hurrying confusedly among them, the traces of the pen being now represented by white lines, and the whole mass fluttering to and fro in the draughts of air. The destroyer knelt down to look at them. "'What is more potent than fire?' said he in his gloomiest tone. "'Even thought, invisible and incorporeal as it is, cannot escape it.' In this little time, it has annihilated the creations of long nights and days, which I could no more reproduce in their first glow and freshness than cause ashes and whitened bones to rise up and live. There, too, I sacrificed the unborn children of my mind. All that I had accomplished, all that I planned for future years, has perished by one common ruin, and left only this heap of embers. The deed has been my fate, and what remains? A weary and aimless life, a long repentance of this hour, and at last an obscure grave where they will bury and forget me. As the author concluded his dolorous moan, the extinguished embers arose and settled down, and arose again, and finally flew up the chimney like a demon with sable wings. Just as they disappeared, there was a loud and solitary cry in the street below us. Fire! Fire! Other voices caught up that terrible word, and it speedily became the shout of a multitude. Oberon started to his feet in fresh excitement. A fire on such a night? cried he. The wind blows a gale, and wherever it whirls the flames, the roofs will flash up like gunpowder. Every pump is frozen up, and boiling water would turn to ice the moment it was flung from the engine. In an hour, this wooden town will be one great bonfire. What a glorious scene for my next... Pfft! 
The street was now all alive with footsteps, and the air full of voices. We heard one engine thundering round a corner, and another rattling from a distance over the pavements. The bells of three steeples clanged out at once, spreading the alarm to many a neighboring town, and expressing hurry, confusion, and terror so inimitably that I could almost distinguish in their peal the burden of the universal cry, FIRE! 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 "'What is so eloquent as their iron tongues?' exclaimed Oberon. "'My heart leaps and trembles, but not with fear. "'And that other sound, too, deep and awful as a mighty organ, "'the roar and thunder of the multitude on the pavement below. "'Come, we are losing time. "'I will cry out in the loudest of the uproar "'and mingle my spirit with the wildest of the confusion "'and be a bubble on the top of the ferment.' From the first outcry, my forebodings had warned me of the true object and center of alarm. There was nothing now but uproar, above, beneath, and around us. Footsteps stumbling pell-mell up the public staircase, eager shouts and heavy thumps at the door, the whiz and dash of water from the engines, and the crash of furniture thrown upon the pavement. At once the truth flashed upon my friend. His frenzy took the hue of joy. And, with a wild gesture of exultation, he leaped almost to the ceiling of the chamber. "'My tails!' cried Oberon. "'The chimney! The roof! The fiend has gone forth by night and startled thousands in fear and wonder from their beds. Here I stand, a triumphant author! Huzzah! Huzzah! My brain has set the town on fire! Ha-ha!' End of The Devil in Manuscript Nyarlathotep by H.P. Lovecraft. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Randall Lazenby. Nyarlathotep by H.P. Lovecraft. Nyarlathotep, the crawling chaos. I am the last. I will tell the audient void. I do not recall distinctly when it began, but it was months ago. The general tension was horrible. To a season of political and social upheaval was added a strange and brooding apprehension of hideous physical danger, a danger widespread and all-embracing, such a danger as may be imagined only in the most terrible phantasms of the night. I recall that the people went about with pale and worried faces, and whispered warnings and prophecies which no one dared consciously repeat or acknowledge to himself that he had heard. A sense of monstrous guilt was upon the land, and out of the abysses between the stars swept chill currents that made men shiver in dark and lonely places. There was a demoniac alteration in the sequence of the seasons. The autumn heat lingered fearsomely, and everyone felt that the world and perhaps the universe had passed from the control of known gods or forces to that of gods or forces which were unknown. And it was then that Nyarlathotep came out of Egypt. Who he was, none could tell, but he was of the old native blood and looked like a pharaoh. The fellahin knelt when they saw him, yet could not say why. He said he had risen up out of the blackness of twenty-seven centuries, and that he had heard messages from places not on this planet. Into the lands of civilization came Nyarlathotep, swarthy, slender, and sinister, always buying strange instruments of glass and metal and combining them into instruments yet stranger. He spoke much of the sciences, of electricity and psychology, and gave exhibitions of power which sent his spectators away speechless, yet which swelled his fame to exceeding magnitude. Men advised one another to see Nyarlathotep, and shuddered, and where Nyarlathotep went, rest vanished for the small hours were rent with the screams of nightmare. Never before had the screams of nightmare been such a public problem. Now the wise men almost wished they could forbid sleep in the small hours, that the shrieks of cities might less horribly disturb the pale, pitying moon as it glimmered on green waters, gliding under bridges, and old steeples crumbling against a sickly sky. I remember when Nyarlathotep came to my city, the great, the old, the terrible city of unnumbered crimes. My friend had told me of him, and of the impelling fascination and allurement of his revelations, and I burned with eagerness to explore his uttermost mysteries. 
My friends said they were horrible and impressive beyond my most fevered imaginings, and what was thrown on a screen in the darkened room prophesied things none but Nyarlathotep dared prophesy, and in the sputter of his sparks there was taken from men that which had never been taken before, yet which showed only in the eyes. And I heard it hinted abroad that those who knew Nyarlathotep looked on sights which others saw not. It was in the hot autumn that I went through the night with the restless crowds to see Nyarlathotep, through the stifling night and up the endless stairs into the choking room, and shadowed on a screen I saw hooded forms amidst ruins and yellow evil faces peering from behind fallen monuments, and I saw the world battling against blackness, against the waves of destruction from ultimate space, whirling, churning, struggling around the dimming, cooling sun. Then the sparks played amazingly around the heads of the spectators, and hair stood up on end whilst shadows more grotesque than I can tell came out and squatted on the heads. And when I, who was colder and more scientific than the rest, mumbled a trembling protest about imposture and static electricity, Nyarlathotep drove us all out, down the dizzy stairs into the damp, hot, deserted midnight streets. I screamed aloud that I was not afraid, that I never could be afraid, and others screamed with me for solace. We swore to one another that the city was exactly the same, and still alive, and when the electric lights began to fade we cursed the company over and over again, and laughed at the queer faces we made. I believe we felt something coming down from the greenish moon, for when we began to depend on its light we drifted into curious involuntary marching formations, and seemed to know our destinations, though we dared not think of them. Once we looked at the pavement and found the blocks loose and displaced by grass, with scarce a line of rusted metal to show where the tramways had run, and again we saw a tram-car, lone, windowless, dilapidated, and almost on its side. When we gazed around the horizon we could not find the third tower by the river, and noticed that the silhouette of the second tower was ragged at the top. Then we split up into narrow columns, each of which seemed drawn in a different direction. One disappeared in a narrow alley to the left, leaving only the echo of a shocking moan. Another filed down a weed-choked subway entrance, howling with a laughter that was mad. My own column was sucked toward the open country, and presently I felt a chill which was not of the hot autumn, for as we stalked out on the dark moor, we beheld around us the hellish moon-glitter of evil snows. Trackless, inexplicable snows swept asunder in one direction only, where lay a gulf all the blacker for its glittering walls. The column seemed very thin indeed as it plodded dreamily into the gulf. I lingered behind, for the black rift in the green-litten snow was frightful, and I thought I had heard the reverberations of a disquieting wail as my companions vanished. But my power to linger was slight. As if beckoned by those who had gone before, I half floated between the titanic snowdrifts, quivering and afraid, into the sightless vortex of the unimaginable. Screamingly sentient, dumbly delirious, only the gods that were can tell, a sickened, sensitive shadow writhing in hands that are not hands, and whirled blindly past ghastly midnights of rotting creation, corpses of dead worlds with sores that were cities, charnel winds that brush the pallid stars and make them flicker low. Beyond the world's vague ghosts of monstrous things, half-seen columns of unsanctified temples that rest on nameless rocks beneath space and reach up to dizzy vacua above the spheres of light and darkness. And through this revolting graveyard of the universe the muffled, maddening beating of drums and thin, monotonous whine of blasphemous flutes from inconceivable, unlighted chambers beyond time, the detestable pounding and piping whereunto dance slowly, awkwardly, and absurdly the gigantic, tenebrous, ultimate gods, the blind, voiceless, mindless gargoyles whose soul is Nyarlathotep. End of Nyarlathotep by H. P. Lovecraft The Barn on the Marsh by Charles G. D. Roberts This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Barn on the Marsh by Charles G. D. Roberts It had not always stood on the marsh. 
when i was a little boy of seven it occupied the rear of our neighbour's yard not a stone's throw from the rectory gate on one of the windy sunshiny spurs of south mountain a perpetual eyesore to the rector but i cannot help thinking as i view it now in the concentrated light of memory that it did artistic service in the way of a foil to the loveliness of the rectory garden this garden was the rector's delight but to my restless seven years it was a sort of gay-coloured and ever-threatening bugbear weeding and especially such thorough radical weeding as alone would satisfy the rector's conscience was my detestation and moreover just at the time of being called upon to weed there was sure to be something else of engrossing importance which my nimble little wits had set themselves upon doing but i never found courage to betray my lack of sympathy in all its iciness the sight of the rector's enthusiasm filled me ever with a sense of guilt and i used to weed quite diligently at times one morning the rector had lured me out early before breakfast while the sun yet hung low above the shining marshes we were working cheerfully together at the carrot beds the smell of the moist earth and of the dewy young carrot plants bruised by my hasty fingers comes vividly upon my senses even now suddenly i heard the rector cry bother in a tone which spoke volumes i saw he had broken his hoe short off at the handle i stopped work with alacrity and gazed with commiserating interest while i began wiping my muddy little fingers on my knickerbockers in bright anticipation of some new departure which should put a pause to the weeding in a moment or two the vexed wrinkles smoothed themselves out of the rector's brow and he turned to me with the proposal that we should go over to our neighbours and repair the damage one end of the barn as we knew was used for a workshop we crossed the road let down the bars put to flight a flock of pigeons that were feeding among the scattered straw and threw open the big barn doors there just inside hung the dead body of our neighbour his face distorted and purple and while i stood sobbing with horror the rector cut him down with the draw knife which he had come to borrow soon after this tragedy the barn was moved down to the marsh to be used for storing hay and farm implements and by the time the scene had faded from my mind the rector gave up the dear delights of his garden and took us off to a distant city parish not until i had reached eighteen and the dignity of college cap and gown did i revisit the salty breezes of south mountain then i came to see friends who were living in the old rectory about two miles away by the main road dwelt certain other friends with whom i was given to spending most of my evenings and who possessed some strange charm which would never permit me to say good night at anything like a seasonable hour the distance as i said to these friends was about two miles if you followed the main road but there was a short cut a road across the marsh used chiefly by the haymakers and the fishermen not pleasant to travel in wet weather but good enough for me at all times in the frame of mind in which i found myself this road on either hand was bordered by a high rail fence along which rose here and there the bleak spire of a ghostly and perishing lombardy poplar this is the tree of all least suited to those wind-beaten regions but none other will the country people plant close up to the road at one point curved a massive sweep of red dyke and further to the right stretched the miles on miles of naked marsh till they lost themselves in the lonely shifting waters of the basin about twenty paces back from the fence with its big doors opening toward the road a conspicuous landmark in all my nightly walks stood the barn i remembered vividly enough 
but in a remote impersonal sort of way the scene on that far-off sunny summer morning as night after night i swung past the ancient doors my brain in a pleasant confusion i never gave the remembrance any heed finally i ceased to recall it and the rattling of the wind in the time-warped shingles fell on utterly careless ears one night as i started homeward upon the verge of twelve the marsh seemed all alive with flying gleams the moon was past the full white and high the sky was thick with small black clouds streaming dizzily across the moon's face and a moist wind piped steadily in from the sea i was walking swiftly not much alive to outward impressions scarce noticing even the strange play of the moon shadows over the marshes and had got perhaps a stone's throw past the barn when a creeping sensation about my skin and a thrill of nervous apprehension made me stop suddenly and take a look behind the impulse seized me unawares or i should have laughed at myself and gone on without yielding to such a weakness but it was too late my gaze darted unerringly to the barn whose great doors stood wide open there swaying almost imperceptibly in the wind hung the body of our neighbour as i had seen it that dreadful morning long ago for a moment i could hear again my childish sobs and the remembrance of that horror filled me with self-pity then as the roots of my hair began to stir my feet set themselves instinctively for flight this instinct however i promptly and sternly repressed i knew all about these optical illusions and tried to congratulate myself on this opportunity for investigating one so interesting and vivid at the same time i gave a hasty side thought to what would have happened had i been one of the superstitious farm hands or fishermen of the district i should have taken to my heels in desperate terror and been ever after faithfully persuaded of having looked upon a veritable ghost i said to myself that the apparition if i looked upon it steadfastly would vanish as i approached or more probably resolve itself into some chance combination of moonlight and shadows in fact my reason was perfectly satisfied that the ghostly vision was due solely to the association of ideas i was fresh from my classes in philosophy aided and abetted by my own pretty vivid imagination yet the natural man this physical being of mine revolted in every fibre of the flesh from any closer acquaintance with the thing i began with reluctant feet to retrace my steps but as i did so the vision only grew so much the clearer and a cold perspiration broke out upon me step by step i approached till i stood just outside the fence face to face with the apparition i leaned against the fence looking through between the rails and now at this distance every feature came out with awful distinctness all so horrible in its distortion that i cannot bear to describe it as each fresh gust of wind hissed through the chinks i could see the body swing before it heavily and slowly i had to bring all my philosophy to bear else my feet would have carried me off in a frenzy of flight at last i reached the conclusion that since my sight was so helplessly deceived i should have to depend upon the touch in no other way could i detect the true basis of the illusion and this way was a hard one by much argument and self-persuasion i prevailed upon myself to climb the fence and with a sort of despairing doggedness to let myself down on the inside just then the clouds thickened over the face of the moon and the light faded rapidly to get down inside the fence with that thing was for a moment simply sickening and my eyes dilated with the intensity of my stare then common sense came to the rescue with a revulsion of feeling 
and I laughed, though not very mirthfully, at the thoroughness of my scare. With an assumption of coolness and defiance, I walked right up to the open doors, and when so close that I could have touched it with my walking stick, the thing swayed gently and faced me in the light of the reappearing moon. Could my eyes deceive me? It certainly was our neighbour. Scarcely knowing what I did, I thrust out my stick and touched it, shrinking back as I did so. What I touched, plain instantly to my sight, was a piece of wood and iron, some portion of a mowing machine or reaper, which had been, apparently, repainted and hung up across the door pole to dry. It swayed in the wind. The straying fingers of the moonbeams through the chinks penciled it strangely, and the shadows were huddled black behind it. But now it hung revealed, with no more likeness to a human body than any average well-meaning farm implement might be expected to have. With a huge sigh of relief I turned away. As I climbed the fence once more, I gave a parting glance toward the yawning doorway of the barn on the marsh. There, as plain as before I had pierced the bubble, swung the body of my neighbour. And all the way home, though I would not turn my head, I felt it at my heels. End of The Barn on the Marsh The G. Bung Polo Club by A. B. Banjo Patterson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Son of the Exiles. The G. Bung Polo Club by A. B. Banjo Patterson. It was somewhere up the country, in a land of rock and scrub, that they formed an institution called the Jeebung Polo Club. They were long and wiry natives from the rugged mountain side, and the horse was never saddled that the Jeebungs couldn't ride. But their style of playing polo was irregular and rash. They had mighty little science, but a mighty lot of dash, and they played on mountain ponies that were muscular and strong, though their coats were quite unpolished and their manes and tails were long and they used to train those ponies wheeling cattle in the scrub they were demons were the members of the Jee Bung polo club it was somewhere down the country in a city's smoke and steam that a polo club existed called the cuff and collar team as a social institution twas a marvellous success for the members were distinguished by exclusiveness and dress. They had natty little ponies that were nice and smooth and sleek, for their cultivated owners only rode them once a week. So they started up the country in pursuit of sport and fame, for they meant to show the G-Bungs how they ought to play the game. And they took their valets with them, just to give their boots a rub, ere they started operations on the G-Bung Polo Club. Now my readers can imagine how the contest ebbed and flowed. When the G-Bung boys got going, it was time to clear the road. And the game was so terrific that ere half the time was gone, a spectator's leg was broken, just from merely looking on. For they waddied one another till the plain was strewn with dead, while the score was kept so even that they neither got ahead. And the cuff and collar captain, when he tumbled off to die, was the last surviving player, so the game was called a tie. Then the captain of the G-Bungs raised him slowly from the ground. Though his wounds were mostly mortal, yet he fiercely gazed around. There was no one to oppose him, all the rest were in a trance. So he scrambled on his pony for his last expiring chance, for he meant to make an effort to get victory to his side. So he struck at goal, and missed it. Then he tumbled off and died. By the old Campaspe River, where the breezes shake the grass, 
there's a row of little gravestones that the stockmen never pass, for they bear a crude inscription saying, Stranger, drop a tear, for the cuff and collar players and the gee-bung boys lie here. And on misty moonlit evenings, while the dingoes howl around, you can see their shadows flitting down that phantom polo ground. You can hear the loud collisions as the flying players meet, and the rattle of the mallets and the rush of ponies' feet. Till the terrified spectator rides like blazes to the pub, he's been haunted by the spectres of the G-Bung Polo Club. End of the G-Bung Polo Club Recording by Son of the Exiles The Picture in the House by H. P. Lovecraft. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Picture in the House by H. P. Lovecraft. Searchers after horror haunt strange, far places. For them are the catacombs of Ptolemies and the carven mausolea of the nightmare countries. They climb to the moonlit towers of ruined Rhine castles and falter down black cobwebbed steps beneath the scattered stones of forgotten cities in Asia. The haunted wood and the desolate mountain are their shrines and they linger around the sinister monoliths on uninhabited islands. But the true epicure in the terrible, to whom a new thrill of unutterable ghastliness is the chief end and justification of existence, esteems most of all the ancient, lonely farmhouses of backwoods New England. For there the dark elements of strength, solitude, grotesqueness, and ignorance combine to form the perfection of the hideous. Most horrible of all sights are the little unpainted wooden houses remote from traveled ways, usually squatted upon some damp grassy slope or leaning against some gigantic outcropping of rock. Two hundred years and more they have leaned or squatted there, while the vines have crawled and the trees have swelled and spread. They are almost hidden now in lawless luxuriances of green and guardian shrouds of shadow, but the small-paned houses still stare shockingly, as if blinking through a lethal stupor which wards off madness by dulling the memory of unutterable things. In such houses have dealt generations of strange people whose like the world has never seen seized with a gloomy and fanatical belief which exiled them from their kind their ancestors sought the wilderness for freedom there the scions of a conquering race indeed flourished free from the restrictions of their fellows but cowered in an appalling slavery to the dismal phantasms of their own minds divorced from the enlightenment of civilization the strength of these puritans turned into singular channels and in their isolation, morbid self-repression, and struggle for life with relentless nature, there came to them dark, furtive traits from the prehistoric depths of their cold northern heritage. By necessity practical, and by philosophy stern, these folks were not beautiful in their sins. Erring as all mortals must, they were forced by their rigid code to seek concealment above all else so that they came to use less and less taste in what they concealed. Only the silent, sleepy, staring houses in the backwoods can tell all that has lain hidden since the early days, and they are not communicative, being loath to shake off the drowsiness which helps them forget. Sometimes one feels that it would be merciful to tear down these houses, for they must often dream. It was to a time-battered edifice of this description that I was driven one afternoon in November 1896 by a rain of such chilling copiousness that any shelter was preferable to exposure. 
I have been traveling for some time amongst the people of the Miskatonic Valley in quest of certain genealogical data, and from the remote, devious, and problematical nature of my course had deemed it convenient to employ a bicycle despite the lateness of the season. Now I found myself upon an apparently abandoned road which I had chosen as the shortest cut to Arkham, overtaken by the storm at a point far from any town, and comforted with no refuge save the antique and repellent wooden building which blinked with bleared windows from between two huge leafless elms near the foot of a rocky hill. Distant though it was from the remnant of a road, the house none the less impressed me unfavorably the very moment I espied it. Honest, wholesome structures do not stare at travelers so slyly and hauntingly, and in my genealogical researches I had encountered legends of a century before which biased me against places of this kind. Yet the force of the elements was such as to overcome my scruples, and I did not hesitate to wheel my machine up the weedy rise to the closed door which seemed at once so suggestive and secretive. I had somehow taken it for granted that the house was abandoned, yet as I approached it I was not so sure. For though the walks were indeed overgrown with weeds, they seemed to retain their nature a little too well to argue complete desertion. Therefore, instead of trying the door, I knocked, feeling as I did so a trepidation I could scarcely explain. As I waited on the rough, mossy rock which served as a doorstep, I glanced at the neighboring windows and panes of the transom above me, and noticed that, although old, rattling, and almost opaque with dirt, they were not broken. The building, then, must still be inhabited, despite its isolation and general neglect. However, my rapping evoked no response, so after repeating the summons, I tried the rusty latch and found the door unfastened. Inside was a little vestibule with walls from which the plaster was falling, and through the doorway came a faint but peculiarly hateful odor. I entered, carrying my bicycle, and closed the door behind me. Ahead rose a narrow staircase, flanked by a small door, probably leading to the cellar, while to the left and right were closed doors leading to rooms on the ground floor. Leaning my cycle against the wall, I opened the door at the left and crossed into a small, low-sealed chamber, but dimly lighted by its two dusty windows and furnished in the barest and most primitive possible way. It appeared to be a kind of sitting room, for it had a table and several chairs, and an immense fireplace above which ticked an antique clock on a mantel. Books and papers were very few, and in the prevailing gloom I could not readily discern the titles. What interested me was the uniform air of archaism, as displayed in every visible detail. Most of the houses in this region I had found rich in relics of the past, but here the antiquity was curiously complete, for in all the room I could not discover a single article of definitely post-revolutionary date. Had the furnishings been less humble, the place would have been a collector's paradise. As I surveyed this quaint apartment, I felt an increase in that aversion first excited by the bleak exterior of the house. Just what it was that I feared or loathed, I could by no means define, but something in the whole atmosphere seemed redolent of unhallowed age, of unpleasant crudeness, and of secrets which should be forgotten. I felt disinclined to sit down and wandered about examining the various articles which I had noticed. The first object of my curiosity was a book of medium size lying upon the table, and presenting such an antediluvian aspect that I marveled at beholding it outside a museum or library. It was bound in leather with metal fittings, and was in an excellent state of preservation, being altogether an unusual sort of volume to encounter in an abode so lowly. When I opened it to the title page my wonder grew even greater for it proved to be nothing less rare than Pigafetta's account of the Congo region, written in Latin from the notes of the sailor Lopez, 
and printed in Frankfurt in 1598. I had often heard of this work, with its curious illustrations by the brothers de Bry, hence for a moment forgot my uneasiness and my desire to turn the pages before me. The engravings were indeed interesting, drawn wholly from imagination and careless descriptions, and represented Negroes with white skins and Caucasian features. Nor would I soon have closed the book had not an exceedingly trivial circumstance upset my tired nerves and revived my sensation of disquiet. What annoyed me was merely the persistent way in which the volume tended to fall open of itself at plate twelve which represented in gruesome detail a butcher's shop of the Anzicus cannibals. I experienced some shame at my susceptibility to so slight a thing, but the drawing nevertheless disturbed me, especially in connection with some adjacent passages descriptive of Anzicus gastronomy. I had turned to a neighboring shelf and was examining its meager literary contents, an 18th century Bible, a pilgrim's progress of like period, illustrated with grotesque woodcuts, and printed by the almanac maker Isaiah Thomas, the rotting bulk of Cotton Mather's Magnalia Christi Americana, and a few other books of evidently equal age, when my attention was aroused by the unmistakable sound of walking in the room overhead. At first astonished and startled, Considering the lack of response to my recent knocking at the door, I immediately afterward concluded that the walker had just awakened from a sound sleep, and listened with less surprise as the footsteps sounded on the creaking stairs. The tread was heavy, yet seemed to contain a curious quality of cautiousness, a quality which I disliked the more because the tread was heavy. When I had entered the room, I had shut the door behind me, now, after a moment of silence, during which the walker may have been inspecting my bicycle in the hall, I heard a fumbling at the latch and saw the paneled portal door swing open again. In the doorway stood a person of such singular appearance that I should have exclaimed aloud, but for the restraints of good breeding. Old, white-bearded, and ragged, my host possessed a countenance and physique which inspired equal wonder and respect. His height could not have been less than six feet, and despite a general air of age and poverty, he was stout and powerful in proportion. His face, almost hidden by a long beard which grew high in the cheeks, seemed abnormally ruddy and less wrinkled than one might expect while over a high forehead fell a shock of white hair little thinned by the years. His blue eyes, though a trifle bloodshot, seemed inexplicably keen and burning. But for his horrible unkemptness, the man would have been as distinguished-looking as he was impressive. This unkemptness, however, made him offensive despite his face and figure. Of what his clothing consisted I could hardly tell, for it seemed to me no more than a mass of tatters surmounting a pair of high, heavy boots, and his lack of cleanliness surpassed description. The appearance of this man, and the instinctive fear he inspired, prepared me for something like enmity, so that I almost shuddered through surprise and a sense of uncanny incongruity when he motioned me to a chair and addressed me in a thin, weak voice full of fawning respect and ingratiating hospitality. His speech was very curious, an extreme form of Yankee dialect I had thought long extinct, and I studied it closely as he sat down opposite me for conversation. Catched in the rain, be ye? he greeted. Glad you was nigh the house and had the sense to come right in. I calculate I was asleep, else I'd a heard you. I ain't as young as I used to be, and I need a powerful sight of naps nowadays. Travelin' fur? I ain't seen many folks long this road since they took off the Arkham stage. I replied that I was going to Arkham, and apologized for my rude entry into his domicile, whereupon he continued. Glad to see you, young sir. 
New faces is scarce around here, and I hain't got much to cheer me up these days. Guess you hail from Boston, don't you? I never been there, but I can tell a town man when I see him. We had one for district schoolmaster in 84, but he quit sudden, and no one never heard of him since. Here the old man lapsed into a kind of chuckle and made no explanation when I questioned him. He seemed to be in an unboundingly good humor, yet to possess those eccentricities which one might guess from his grooming. For some time he rambled on with an almost feverish geniality, when it struck me to ask him how he came by so rare a book as Pigafetta's Regnum Congo. The effect of this volume had not left me, and I felt a certain hesitancy in speaking of it, but curiosity overmastered all the vague fears which had steadily accumulated since my first glimpse of the house. To my relief, the question did not seem an awkward one, for the old man answered freely and volubly. Oh, that Africa book? Cap'n Ebenezer Holt traded me that in sixty-eight. Him was as kilt in the war. Something about the name of Ebenezer Holt caused me to look up sharply. I had encountered it in my genealogical work, but not in any record since the Revolution. I wondered if my host could help me in the task at which I was laboring, and resolved to ask him about it later on. He continued, Ebenezer was on a Salem merchant man for years, and picked up a sight of queer stuff in every port. He got this in London, I guess. He used to like to buy things at the shops. I was up to his house once on the hill, trading horses, when I see this book. I relished the pictures, so he gave it in on a swap. Tis a queer book. Here, leave me get on my spectacles. The old man fumbled around his rags, producing a pair of dirty and amazingly antique glasses with small octagonal lenses and steel bows. Donning these, he reached for the volume on the table and turned the pages lovingly. Ebenezer could read a little of this. Tis Latin, but I can't. I had two or three schoolmasters read me a bit, and passing Clark, him they say got drowned in the pond. Can you make anything out in it? I told him that I could, and translated for his benefit a paragraph near the beginning. If I erred, he was not scholar enough to correct me, for he seemed childishly pleased at my English version. His proximity was becoming rather obnoxious, yet I saw no way to escape without offending him. I was amused at the childish fondness of this ignorant old man for the pictures in a book he could not read, and wondered how much better he could read the few books in English which adorned the room. This revelation of simplicity removed much of the ill-defined apprehension I had felt, and I smiled as my host rambled on. Queer how pictures can set a body thinking. Take this in here near the front. Have you ever seen trees like that with big leaves a floppin' over and down? And them men, them can't be niggers. They do beat all. Kinder look like Injuns, I guess, even if they be in Africa. Some of these here critters looks like monkeys or half monkeys and half men. But I never heard of nothing like this one. Here he pointed to a fabulous creature of the artist, which one might describe as a sort of dragon with the head of an alligator. But now I'll show ye the best un, over here nigh the middle. The old man's speech grew a trifle thicker, and his eyes assumed a brighter glow, but his fumbling hands, though seemingly clumsier than before, were entirely adequate to their mission. The book fell open, almost of its own accord, and if from frequent consultation at this place, to the repellent twelfth plate showing a butcher's shop amongst the Anzicus cannibals. My sense of restlessness returned, though I did not exhibit it. The especially bizarre thing 
was that the artist had made his Africans look like white men. The limbs and quarters hanging about the walls of the shop were ghastly, while the butcher with his axe was hideously incongruous. But my host seemed to relish the view as much as I disliked it. What do you think of this? Ain't never seen the like hereabouts, eh? When I see this, I telled Eb Holt, that's something to stir you up and make your blood tickle. When I read in scripture about slaying, like them Midianites was slew, I kinder think things, but I ain't got no picture of it. Here a body can see all they is to it. I suppose to sinful, but ain't we all born and livin' in sin? That feller being chopped up gives me a tickle every time I look at him. I have to keep looking at him. See where the butcher cut off his feet? There's the head on that bench with one arm side of it and to other arms on the ground side of the meat block. As the man mumbled on in his shocking ecstasy, the expression on his hairy, bespeckled face became indescribable. But his voice sank rather than mounted. My own sensations can scarcely be recorded. All the terror I had dimly felt before rushed upon me actively and vividly, and I knew that I loathed the ancient and abhorrent creature so near me with an infinite intensity. His madness, or at least his partial perversion, seemed beyond dispute. He was almost whispering now, with a huskiness more terrible than a scream, and I trembled as I listened. As I says, tis queer how pictures set you thinking. You know, young sir, I'm right sot on this un here. After I got the book off Ebb, I used to look at it a lot, especial when I'd heard Passin Clark rant a Sundays in his big wig. Once I tried something funny. Here, young sir, don't get scared. All I done was to look at the picture afore I killed the sheep for market. Killing sheep was kinder more fun after looking at it. The tone of the old man now sunk very low, sometimes becoming so faint that his words were hardly audible. I listened to the rain and to the rattling of the bleared small-paned windows and marked a rumbling of approaching thunder quite unusual for the season. Once a terrific flash and peal shook the frail house to its foundations, but the whisperer seemed not to notice it. Killing sheep was kinder more fun, but you know, twan't quite satisfying. Queer how a craven gets a hold on you. As you love the almighty young man, don't tell nobody. But I swear to God that picter begun to make me hungry for vittles I couldn't raise nor buy. Here, set still. What's ailing ye? I didn't do nothing, only I wondered how it would be if I did. They say meat makes blood and flesh and gives you new life. So I wondered if twouldn't make a man live longer and longer, if twas more the same. But the whisperer never continued. The interruption was not produced by my fright, nor by the rapidly increasing storm amidst whose fury I was presently to open my eyes on a smoky solitude of blackened ruins. It was produced by a very simple, though somewhat unusual, happening. The open book lay flat between us, with the picture staring repulsively upward. As the old man whispered the words, More the same, a tiny spattering impact was heard, and something showed on the yellowed paper of the upturned volume. I thought of the rain and of a leaky roof, but rain is not red. On the butcher shop of the Ancicus Cannibals, a small red spattering glistened picturesquely, lending vividness to the horror of the engraving. The old man saw it, and stopped whispering even before my expression of horror made it necessary saw it, and glanced quickly upwards toward the floor of the room he had left an hour before. 
I followed his glance and beheld just above us on the loose plaster of the ancient ceiling a large irregular spot of wet crimson which seemed to spread even as I viewed it. I did not shriek or move but merely shut my eyes. A moment later came the titanic thunderbolt of thunderbolts, blasting that accursed house of unutterable secrets and bringing the oblivion which alone saved my mind. End of The Picture in the House Recording by David Mack Letters of the Late Lord Littleton Letter 39 From 1807 By Thomas Littleton, 2nd Baron Littleton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Should you desire any information, or to find out how to volunteer, please visit www.librivox.org. Letters of the Late Lord Littleton Letter 39, 1807 Letter 39 Much of the disputes, and consequently many of the inconveniencies of this world, arise from the strange difficulty, for a strange one it is, that men find in understanding each other's meaning. Hence the never-ending game of cross-purposes, in which all of us at times are so much engaged. A leading cause of this disunion is a negligence in using terms appropriate to their object. The philosopher, it is true, must generalize his ideas to compass the views of his inquiring mind. It is by such an application of his intellectual facilities that he surmounts such a variety of obstacles that he passes from individual man to a whole people, from a people to the human race, from the time in which he lives to the ages that are to come from what he sees to that which is invisible. But in conveying the fruits of his study and reflection to others, he must condescend to weigh words, compare terms, and preclude all possibility of error in those he instructs, by using a simplicity of definition, a perspicuity of expression, where the barrenness of language denies the immediate term, a neatness of paraphrase, which not only invites, but creates conception. You are pleased, in your last letter, to charge the present age with the crime of skepticism, and you have abandoned yourself to a more than common energy on the subject. To tell you the truth, I do not very clearly perceive the tendency of your accusation. If it alludes to religion, you would, I think, find some difficulty to maintain your position. If it should glance at politics, our national submission is certainly against you or, leaving the higher concerns of the world, if you should apply your assertion to the ordinary intercourse and common transactions between man and man, you are truly unfortunate, as an extreme cullibility seems to be one of the leading features of the present times. The age in which we live does not possess so great a share, as former centuries, of that faith which is able to remove mountains, blind credulity by the insults it so long offered to reason, has in a great measure destroyed itself, or has rather become modified into that sobriety of belief which is consistent with a rational being. The gaudy, awful, and presuming phantom of papal authority has long begun to disappear. That blazing meteor, for which so many ages dazzled the superstitious world, verges toward the horizon, and grows pale before the steady, embodied light of liberal, unimpeded science. But I cannot believe, although luxury and dissipation, with their concomitant depravities, have made such enormous strides among the higher orders, that infidelity in religious matters is a leading characteristic of our times. If we turn from the church to the state, the firm confidence of a very great majority of the people in a government, which, I am forced to confess, does not possess all the wisdom that such a government ought to possess, is a circumstance which, were I to enlarge upon it, you would be perplexed to answer. In the ordinary transactions of life, the wantonness of commercial credit is well prepared to give the lie direct to any charge of incredulity, 
ask Foley, Charles Fox, and a thousand others what they think of modern infidelity, and they will tell you that the Jews themselves, that unbelieving race, have deserted from the standard of skepticism, and having borne the stigma of spiritual unbelief for upwards of seventeen hundred years, are at this moment groaning beneath the effects of temporal credulity. Credula turba sumus. We are a credulous race of beings, and the most steady professors of skepticism are deceived by others, and deceive themselves every hour of the day. Religion which commands, among its evident truths, the belief of matters which we cannot entirely comprehend, will sometimes so habituate the mind of its submissive disciple to acts of faith, that he does not know how to withhold his assent to the most improbable fictions of human fancy, and the credo quia impossible est of Tertullian is readily adopted by his yielding piety. I shall confirm the truth of this observation by a story which I have heard related, and is not more extraordinary in its nature than the tone, look, and language of belief which accompanied the relation. A traveller, benighted in a wild and mountainous country, if my recollection does not fail me, in the highlands of Scotland, at length beholds the welcoming light of a neighbouring habitation. He urges his horse toward it, when, instead of a house, he approached a kind of illuminated chapel, from whence issued the most alarming sounds he had ever heard. Though greatly surprised and terrified, he ventured to look through a window of the building, when he was amazed to see a large assembly of cats, who, arranged in solemn order, were lamenting over the corpse of one of their own species, which lay in state, and which was surrounded with the various emblems of sovereignty. Alarmed and terrified at this extraordinary spectacle, he hastened from the place with greater eagerness than he approached it, and arriving some time after at the house of a gentleman who never turned the wanderer from his gate, the impressions of what he had seen were so visible on his countenance that his friendly host inquired into the cause of his anxiety. He accordingly told his story, and having finished it, a large family cat, who had lain during the narrative before the fire, immediately started up and very articulately exclaimed, Then I am king of the cats! And, having thus announced its new dignity, the animal darted up the chimney and was seen no more. Now the man who seriously repeated this strange and singular history was a peer of the realm, had been concerned in the active scenes of life, and was held in high esteem and veneration among mankind for his talents, wisdom, and Christian piety. After this information, which I give you as a serious fact, what have you to say? It is impossible, but you must immediately withdraw your charge of infidelity against a period which could produce one such implicit believer. As for myself, I will readily confess to you that I am neither a skeptic nor a believer. I have enough of skepticism to prevent the throwing my share of faith away. At the same time, I feel within me that there is something, which I cannot very well explain, the belief whereof I ought to cultivate, and from whence I should derive much satisfaction and contentment, could I but frame my mind to the purpose. If, however, after all my reasoning, you should still continue to fix a skeptical character upon the present age, I trust that you will at least discard it from your own breast, while I assure you of the great regard with which I am your most sincere, humble servant. End of Letter 39, featuring the King of the Cats legend, by Thomas Littleton, 2nd Baron Littleton. The Isle of Pines by Ambrose Bierce This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. For many years there lived near the town of Gallipolis, Ohio, an old man named Herman Deleuze. Very little was known of his history, for he would neither speak of it himself nor suffer others. It was a common belief among his neighbors that he had been a pirate, if upon any better evidence than his collection of boarding pikes, cutlasses, and ancient flintlock pistols, no one knew. He lived entirely alone in a small house of four rooms, falling rapidly into decay and never repaired further than was required by the weather. It stood on a slight elevation in the midst of a large stony field overgrown with brambles, and cultivated in patches in only in the most primitive way. It was his only visible property. 
but could hardly have yielded him a living, simple and few as were his wants. He seemed always to have ready money, and paid cash for all his purchases at the village stores round about, seldom buying more than two or three times at the same place until the lapse of a considerable time. He got no commendation, however, for this equitable distribution of his patronage. People were disposed to regard it as an ineffectual attempt to conceal his possession of so much money, that he had great hordes of ill-gotten gold buried somewhere about his tumble-down dwelling was not reasonably to be doubted by any honest soul conversant with the facts of local tradition and gifted with a sense of the fitness of things. On the ninth of November, 1867, the old man died. At least his dead body was discovered on the 10th, and physicians testified that death had occurred about 24 hours previously, precisely how they were unable to say, for the post-mortem examination showed every organ to be absolutely healthy, with no indication of disorder or violence. According to them, death must have taken place about noonday, yet the body was found in bed. The verdict of the coroner's jury was that he came to his death by a visitation of God. The body was buried, and the public administrator took charge of the estate. A rigorous search disclosed nothing more than was already known about the dead man, and much patient excavation here and there about the premises by thoughtful and thrifty neighbors went unrewarded. The administrator locked up the house against the time when the property, real and personal, should be sold by law with a view to defraying, partly, the expenses of the sale. The night of November 20th was boisterous. A furious gale stormed across the country, scourging it with desolating drifts of sleet. Great trees were torn from the earth and hurled across the roads. So wild a night had never been known in all that region, but toward morning the storm had blown itself out of breath, and day dawned bright and clear. At about eight o'clock that morning, the Reverend Henry Galbraith, a well-known and highly esteemed Lutheran minister, arrived on foot at his house, a mile and a half from the Duluth place. Mr. Galbraith had been for a month in Cincinnati. He had come up the river in a steamboat, and landed at Gallipolis the previous evening, had immediately obtained a horse and buggy, and set out for home. The violence of the storm had delayed him overnight and in the morning the fallen trees had compelled him to abandon his conveyance and continue his journey afoot. "'But where did you pass the night?' inquired his wife, after he had briefly related his adventure. "'With old Deleuze at the Isle of Pines,' was the laughing reply, "'and a glum enough time I had of it. He made no objection to my remaining, but not a word could I get out of him.' Fortunately for the interests of truth, there was present at this conversation Mr. Robert Mosley Marin, a lawyer and literateur of Columbus, the same who wrote the delightful Mellowcraft papers. Noting, but apparently not sharing, the astonishment caused by Mr. Galbraith's answer, this ready-witted person checked by a gesture the exclamations that would naturally have followed, and tranquilly inquired, How came you to go in there? This is Mr. Marin's version of Mr. Galbraith's reply. I saw a light moving about the house, and being nearly blinded by the sleet and half frozen besides, drove in at the gate and put up my horse in the old rail stable, where it is now. I then rapped at the door, and getting no invitation, went in without one. The room was dark, but having matches, I found a candle and lit it. I tried to enter the adjoining room, but the door was fast, and although I heard the old man's heavy footsteps in there, he made no response to my calls. There was no fire on the hearth, so I made one, and lying down before it with my overcoat under my head, prepared myself for sleep. Pretty soon the door that I had tried silently opened, and the old man came in carrying a candle. I spoke to him pleasantly, apologizing for my intrusion, but he took no notice of me. He seemed to be searching for something, though his eyes were unmoved in their sockets. I wonder if he ever walks in his sleep. He took a circuit a part of the way around the room, and went out the same way he had come in. Twice more before I slept, he came back into the room, acting precisely the same way and departing as at first. In the intervals I heard him tramping all over the house, his footsteps distinctly audible in the pauses of the storm. When I woke in the morning, he had already gone out. Mr. Marin attempted some further questioning, but was unable longer to restrain the family's tongues. The story of Deleuze's death and burial came out, greatly to the good minister's astonishment. The explanation of your adventure is very simple, said Mr. Marin. 
I don't believe old Deleuze walks in his sleep, not in his present one, but you evidently dream in yours. And to this view of the matter, Mr. Galbraith was compelled reluctantly to assent. Nevertheless, a late hour of the next night found these two gentlemen, accompanied by a son of the minister, in the road in front of the old Deleuze house. There was a light inside. It appeared now at one window and now at another. The three men advanced to the door. Just as they reached it, there came from the interior a confusion of the most appalling sounds. The clash of weapons, steel against steel, sharp explosions as of firearms, shrieks of women, groans and the curses of men in combat. The investigators stood a moment, irresolute, frightened. Then Mr. Galbraith tried the door. It was fast. But the minister was a man of courage, a man, moreover, of Herculean strength. He retired a pace or two and rushed against the door, striking it with his right shoulder and bursting it from the frame with a loud crash. In a moment the three were inside. Darkness and silence. The only sound was the beating of their hearts. Mr. Marin had provided himself with matches and a candle. With some difficulty, begotten of his excitement, he made a light, and they proceeded to explore the place, passing from room to room. Everything was in orderly arrangement as it had been left by the sheriff. Nothing had been disturbed. A light coating of dust was everywhere. A back door was partly open, as if by neglect, and their first thought was that the authors of the awful revelry might have escaped. The door was opened, and the light of the candle shone through upon the ground. The expiring effort of the previous night's storm had been a light fall of snow. There were no footprints. The white surface was unbroken. They closed the door and entered the last room of the four that the house contained, that farthest from the road in an angle of the building. Here the candle in Mr. Marin's hand was suddenly extinguished as if by a draft of air. Almost immediately followed the sound of a heavy fall. When the candle had been hastily relighted, young Mr. Galbraith was seen prostrate on the floor at a little distance from the others. He was dead. In one hand the body grasped a heavy sack of coins, which later examination showed to be all of old Spanish mintage. Directly over the body as it lay, a board had been torn from its fastenings in the wall, and from the cavity so disclosed, it was evident that the bag had been taken. Another inquest was held. Another post-mortem examination failed to reveal a probable cause of death. Another verdict of, the visitation of God left all at liberty to form their own conclusions. Mr. Marin contended that the young man died of excitement. End of the Isle of Pines by Ambrose Bierce Recording by David Mack Cain's Atonement by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. So many thousands today have deliberately put self aside and are ready to yield their lives for an ideal, that it is not surprising a few of them should have registered experiences of a novel order. For to step aside from self is to enter a larger world, to be open to new impressions. If powers of good exist in the universe at all, they can hardly be inactive at the present time. The case of two men, who may be called Jones and Smith, occurs to the mind in this connection. Whether a veil actually was lifted for a moment, or whether the tension of long and terrible months resulted in an exaltation of emotion, the experience claims significance. Smith, to whom the experience came, holds the firm belief that it was real. Jones, though it involved him too, remained unaware. It is a somewhat personal story, their peculiar relationship dating from early youth. A kind of unwilling antipathy was born between them, yet an antipathy that had no touch of hate or even of dislike. It was rather in the nature of an instinctive rivalry. Some tie operated that flung them ever into the same arena with strange persistence and ever as opponents. An inevitable fate delighted to throw them together in a sense that made them rivals. Small as well as large affairs betrayed this malicious tendency of the gods. 
It showed itself in earlier days, at school, at Cambridge, in travel, even in house parties and the lighter social intercourse. Though distant cousins, their families were not intimate, and there was no obvious reason why their paths should fall so persistently together. Yet their paths did so, crossing and recrossing in the way described. Sooner or later, in all his undertakings, Smith would note the shadow of Jones darkening the ground in front of him, and later, when called to the bar in his chosen profession, he found most frequently that the learned counsel in opposition to him was the owner of this shadow, Jones. In another matter, too, they became rivals, for the same girl, oddly enough, attracted both, and though she accepted neither offer of marriage, during Smith's lifetime, the attitude between them was that of unwilling rivals, for they were friends as well. Jones, it appears, was hardly aware that any rival existed. He did not think of Smith as an opponent or as an adversary, never. He did notice, however, the constantly recurring meetings, for more than once he commented on them with good-humored amusement. Smith, on the other hand, was conscious of a depth and strength in the tie that certainly intrigued him. Being of a thoughtful, introspective nature, he was keenly sensible of the strange competition in their lives, and sought in various ways for its explanation, though without success. The desire to find out was very strong in him, and this was natural enough owing to the singular fact that, in all their battles, he was the one to lose. Invariably, Jones got the best of every conflict. Smith always paid. Sometimes he paid with interest. Occasionally, too, he seemed forced to injure himself while contributing to his cousin's success. It was very curious. He reflected much upon it. He wondered what the origin of their tie and rivalry might be, but especially why it was that he invariably lost, and why he was so often obliged to help his rival to the point even of his own detriment. Tempted to bitterness sometimes, he did not yield to it, however. The relationship remained frank and pleasant, if anything, it deepened. He remembered once, for instance, giving his cousin a chance introduction which yet led, a little later, to the third party offering certain evidence which lost him an important case, Jones, of course, winning it. The third party, too, angered at being dragged into the case, turned hostile to him, thwarting various subsequent projects. In no other way could Jones have procured this particular evidence. He did not know of its existence, even. That chance introduction did it all. There was nothing the least dishonorable on the part of Jones. It was just the chance of the dice. The dice were always loaded against Smith, and there were other instances of similar kind. About this time, moreover, a singular feeling that had lain vaguely in his mind for some years past took more definite form. It suddenly assumed the character of a conviction that yet had no evidence to support it. A voice long whispering in the depths of him, became much louder, grew into a statement that he accepted without further ado. I'm paying off a debt, he phrased it. An old, old debt is being discharged. I owe him this, my help, and so forth. He accepted it, that is, as just, and this certainty of justice kept sweet his heart and mind, shutting the door on bitterness or envy. The thought, however, though it recurred persistently with each encounter, brought no explanation. When the war broke out, both offered their services. As members of the OTC, they got commissions quickly. But it was a chance remark of Smith's that made his friend join the very regiment he himself was in. They trained together, or in the same retreats and the same advances together. Their friendship deepened. Under the stress of circumstances, the tie did not dissolve, but strengthened. It was indubitably real, therefore. Then, oddly enough, they were both wounded in the same engagement. And it was here the remarkable fate that jointly haunted them betrayed itself more clearly than in any previous incident of their long relationship. Smith was wounded in the act of protecting his cousin. How it happened is confusing to a layman but each apparently was leading a bombing party, and the two parties came together. They found themselves shoulder to shoulder, both brimmed with that pluck which is complete indifference to self. They exchanged a word of excited greeting, and the same second, 
one of those rare opportunities of advantage presented itself which only the highest courage could make use of neither certainly was thinking of personal reward it was merely that each saw the chance by which instant heroism might gain a surprise advantage for their side the risk was heavy but there was a chance and success would mean a decisive result to say nothing of high distinction for the man who obtained it if he survived smith being a few yards ahead of his cousin had the moment in his grasp he was in the act of dashing forward when something made him pause a bomb in mid-air flung from the opposing trench was falling it seemed immediately above him he saw that it would just miss himself but land full upon his cousin whose head was turned the other way by stretching out his hand smith knew he could field it like a cricket ball there was an interval of a second and a half he judged he hesitated perhaps a quarter of a second then he acted he caught it it was the obvious thing to do he flung it back into the opposing trench the rapidity of thought is hard to realize in that second and a half smith was aware of many things he saved his cousin's life unquestionably unquestionably also jones seized the opportunity that otherwise was his cousin's but it was neither of these reflections that filled smith's mind the dominant impression was another it flashed into actual words inside his excited brain i must risk it i owe it to him and more besides he was further aware of another impulse than the obvious one in the first fraction of a second it was overwhelmingly established and it was this that the entire episode was familiar to him a subtle familiarity was present all this had happened before he had already somewhere somehow seen death descending upon his cousin from the air yet with a difference the difference escaped him the familiarity was vivid that he missed the deadly detonators in making the catch or that the fuse delayed he called good luck he only remembers that he flung the gruesome weapon back whence it had come and that its explosion in the opposite trench material helped his cousin to find glory in the place of death the slight delay however resulted in his receiving a bullet through the chest a bullet he would not otherwise have received presumably it was some days later gravely wounded that he discovered his cousin in another bed across the darkened floor they exchanged remarks jones was already decorated it seemed having snatched success from his cousin's hands while little aware whose help had made it easier and once again there stole across the inmost mind of smith that strange insistent whisper i owed it to him but by god i owe more than that i mean to pay it too there was not a trace of bitterness or envy now only this profound conviction of obscurest origin that it was right and absolutely just full honest repayment of a debt incurred some ancient balance of account was being settled there was no chance injustice and caprice played no role at all and a deeper understanding of life's ironies crept into him for if everything was just there was no room for whimpering and the voice persisted above the sound of busy footsteps in the ward i owe it i'll pay it gladly through the pain and weakness the whisper died away he was exhausted there were periods of unconsciousness but there were periods of half-consciousness as well then flashes of another kind of consciousness altogether when bathed in high soft light he was aware of things he could not quite account for he saw it was absolutely real only the critical faculty was gone he did not question what he saw as he stared across at his cousin's bed he knew perhaps the beaten worn-out body let something through at last the nerves overstrained to numbness lay very still the physical system battered and depleted made no cry the clamor of the flesh was hushed he was aware however of an undeniable exaltation of the spirit in him as he lay and gazed towards his cousin's bed across the night of time it seemed to him the picture stole before his inner eye with a certainty that left no room for doubt 
It was not the cells of memory in his brain of today that gave up their dead. It was the eternal self in him that remembered and understood. The soul. With that satisfaction which is born of full comprehension, he watched the light glow and spread about the little bed. Thick matting deadened the footsteps of nurses, orderlies, doctors. New cases were brought in. Old cases were carried out. He ignored them. He saw only the light above his cousin's bed grow stronger. He lay still and stared. It came neither from the ceiling nor the floor. It unfolded like a cloud of shining smoke, and the little lamp, the sheets, the figure framed between them, all these slid cleverly away and vanished utterly. He stood in another place that had lain behind all these appearances. A landscape with wooded hills, a foaming river, the sun just sinking below the forest, and dusk creeping from a gorge along the lonely banks. In the warm air there was a perfume of great flowers and heavy-scented trees. There were fireflies, and the taste of spray from the tumbling river was on his lips. Across the water a large bird flapped its heavy wings as it moved downstream to find another fishing place for he and his companion had disturbed it as they broke out of the thick foliage and reached the river bank. The companion, moreover, was his brother. They ever hunted together. There was a passionate link between them born of blood and of affection. They were twins. It was all as clear as though of yesterday. In his heart was the lust of the hunt. In his blood was the lust of woman and thick behind these lurked the jealousy and fierce desire of a primitive day. But, though clear as of yesterday, he knew that it was of long, long ago, and his brother came up close beside him, resting his bloody spear with a clattering sound against the boulders on the shore. He saw the gleaming of the metal in the sunset. He saw the shining glitter of the spray upon the boulders. He saw his brother's eyes look straight into his own and in them shone a light that was neither the reflection of the sunset nor the excitement of the hunt just over. It escaped us, said his brother, yet I know my first spear struck. It followed the fawn that crossed, was the reply. Besides, we came down wind, thus giving it warning. Our flocks, at any rate, are safer. The other laughed significantly. It is not the safety of our flocks that troubles me just now, brother, he interrupted eagerly, while the light burned more deeply in his eyes. It is rather that she waits for me by the fire across the river, and that I would get to her. With your help added to my love, he went on in a trusting voice, the gods have shown me the favor of true happiness. He pointed with the spear to a campfire on the farther bank, turning his head as he strode to plunge into the stream and swim across. For an instant, then, the other felt his natural love turn into bitter hate. His own fierce passion, unconfessed, concealed, burst into instant flame. That the girl should become his brother's wife sent the blood surging through his veins in fury. He felt his life and all that he desired go down in ashes. He watched his brother stride towards the water, the deer skin cast across one naked shoulder when another object caught his practiced eye. In midair it passed suddenly like a shining gleam. It seemed to hang a second. Then it swept swiftly forward past his head and downward. It had leaped with a blazing fury from the overhanging bank behind. He saw the blood still streaming from its wounded flank. It must land. He saw it with a secret awful pleasure, full upon the striding figure whose head was turned away. The swiftness of that leap, however, was not so swift but that he could easily have used his spear. Indeed, he gripped it strongly, his skill, his strength, his aim, he knew them well enough. But hate and love, fastening upon his heart, held all his muscles still. He hesitated. He was no murderer, yet he paused. He heard the roar, the ugly thud, the crash, the cry for help. Too late and when, an instant afterwards, his steel plunged into the great beast's heart, the human heart and life he might have saved lay still forever. He heard the water rushing past, an icy wind came down the gorge against his naked back. He saw the fire shine upon the farther bank, 
and the figure of a girl in skins was wading across, seeking out the shallow places in the dusk and calling wildly as she came. Then darkness hid the entire landscape, yet a darkness that was deeper, bluer than the velvet of the night alone. And he shrieked aloud in his remorseful anguish, May the gods forgive me, for I did not mean it. Oh, that I might undo, that I might repay. That his cries disturbed the weary occupants in more than one bed is certain, but he remembers chiefly that a nurse was quickly by his side, and that something she gave him soothed his violent pain and helped him into deeper sleep again. There was, he noticed, anyhow, no longer the soft, clear, blazing light about his cousin's bed. He saw only the faint glitter of the oil lamps down the length of the great room. And some weeks later he went back to fight. The picture, however, never left his memory. It stayed with him as an actual reality that was neither delusion nor hallucination. He believed that he understood at last the meaning of the tie that had fettered him and puzzled him so long. The memory of those far-off days of shepherding beneath the stars of long ago remained vividly beside him. He kept his secret, however, and many a talk with his cousin beneath the nearer stars of Flanders, no word of it ever passed his lips. The friendship between them, meanwhile, experienced a curious deepening, though unacknowledged in any spoken words. Smith, at any rate, on his side, put into it an affection that was a brave man's love. He watched over his cousin, and the fighting especially, when possible, he sought to protect and shield him, regardless of his own personal safety. He delighted secretly in the honors his cousin had already won. He himself was not yet even mentioned in dispatches, and no public distinction of any kind had come his way. His V.C. eventually... Well, he was no longer occupying his body when it was bestowed. He had already left. He was now conscious, possibly, of other experiences besides that one of ancient primitive days when he and his brother were shepherding beneath other stars. But the reckless heroism which saved his cousin under fire may later enshrine another memory which, at some far future time, shall reawaken as a hallucination from a past that today is called the present. The notion, at any rate, flashed across his mind before he left. End of Cain's Atonement by Algernon Blackwood Recording by David Mack His Other Self by W. W. Jacobs this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tony Foster. His Other Self by W. W. Jacobs. They're like as two peas, him and his brother, said the night watchman, gazing blandly at the indignant face of the lighterman on the barge below. And the only way I know this one is Sam, is because Bill don't use bad language. Twins they are, but the likeness is only outside. Bill's art is as white as snow. He cut off a plug of tobacco, and placing it in his cheek, waited expectantly. White as snow, he repeated. That's me, said the lighterman, as he pushed his unwieldy craft from the jetty. I'll tell Sam your opinion of him. So long. The watchman went a shade redder than usual. That's twins all over, he said sourly, always deceiving people. It's Bill arter all, and instead of hurting his feelings, I've just been flattering of him up. It ain't the first time I've had trouble over a likeness. I've been a twin myself, in a manner of speaking. It didn't last long, but it lasted long enough for me to always be sorry for twins, and to make a lot of allowance for them. It must be very hard to have another man going about with your face on his shoulders and getting it into trouble. It was a year or two ago now. I was sitting one evening at the gate, smoking a pipe and looking at a newspaper I'd found in the office, when I see a gentleman coming along from the swing bridge. Well dressed, clean shaved chap he was, smoking a cigarette. He was walking slow, 
and looking about him, casual-like, until his eyes fell on me, when he gave a perfect jump of surprise, and after looking at me very hard, walked on a little way, and then turned back. He did it twice, and I was just going to say something to him, something I'd been getting ready for him, when he spoke to me. "'Good evening,' he says. "'Good evening,' I says, folding the paper over and looking at him rather severe. "'I hope you'll excuse me staring,' he says, very polite. "'But I've never seen such a face and figure as yours in all my life. Never!' "'Ah, you ought to have seen me a few years ago,' I says. "'I'm like everybody else. I'm getting on.' "'Rubbish,' he says. "'You couldn't be better if you tried. "'It's marvellous. Wonderful. "'It's the very thing I've been looking for. "'Why, if you'd been made to order, you couldn't have been better.' "'I thought at first he was by way of trying to get a drink out of me. "'I've been played that game afore. "'But instead of that, he asked me whether I'd do him the pleasure of having one with him.' We went over to the Albion, and I believe I could have had it in a pail, if I'd only liked to say the word. And all the time I was drinking, he was looking me up and down, till I didn't know where to look, as the saying is. "'I came down here to look for somebody like you,' he says, "'but I never dreamt I should have such luck as this. I'm an actor, and I've got to play the part of a sailor, and I've been worried some time how to make up for the part. Do you understand?' "'No,' I says, looking at him. "'I want to look the real thing,' he says, speaking low so the landlord shouldn't hear. "'I want to make myself the living image of you. "'If that don't fetch him, I'll give up the stage and grow cabbages.' "'Make yourself like me,' I says. "'Why, you're no more like me than I'm like a seasick monkey.' "'Not so much,' he says. "'That's where the art comes in.' "'He stood me another drink, and then, taking my arm in a cuddling sort of way, and calling me dear boy, he led me back to the wharf and explained. He said he would come round next evening with what he called his make-up box, and paint his face and make himself up, till people wouldn't know one from the other. And what about your figure, I said, looking at him. Well, a cushion, he says, winking, or maybe a couple. <laughs> and what about clothes? You'll have to sell me those you've got on, hat and all. "'And boots. "'I put a price on him that I thought would have finished him then and there. "'But it didn't. "'And at last, after paying me so many more compliments "'that they began to get into my head, "'he fixed up a meeting for the next night and went off. "'And mind,' he says, coming back, "'not a word to a living soul.' "'He went off again, "'and after going to the bull's head and having a pint to clear my head, "'I went and sat down in the office and thought it over. "'It seemed all right to me, as far as I could see.' But perhaps the pint didn't clear my head enough. Perhaps I ought to have had two pints. I lay awake, best part of the next day, thinking it over, and when I got up, I'd made up my mind. I put my clothes in a sack, and then I put on some others, so as much like em as possible, only perhaps a bit older, in case the missus should get asking questions. And then I sat wondering how to get out with the sack without her noticing it. She's got a very inquiring mind, and I wasn't going to tell her any lies about it, besides which... I couldn't think of one. I got out at last by playing a game on her. I pretended to drop half a dollar in the wash house, and while she was busy on her hands and knees, I went off as comfortable as you please. I got into the office with it all right, and just as it was getting dark, a cab drove up to the wharf, and the actor chap jumped out with a big leather bag. I took him into the private office, and he was so ready with his money for the clothes that I offered to throw the sack in. He changed into my clothes, first of all, and then, asking me to sit down in front of him, he took a looking-glass and a box out of his bag and began to alter his face. What with sticks of coloured paint and false-out eyebrows and a beard stuck on with gum and trimmed with a pair of scissors, it was more like a conjuring trick than anything else. Then he took a wig out of his bag and pressed it on his head, put on the cap, put some black stuff on his teeth, and there he was. We both looked into the glass together while he gave the finishing touches, and then he clapped me on the back and said I was the handsomest sailor man in England. Oh, I shall have to make up a bit heavier for when I'm behind the floats, he says, but this is enough for here. What do you think of the imitation of your voice? I think I've got it exact. If you ask me, I says, it sounds like a poll parrot with a cold in the head. 
And now for your walk, he says, looking as pleased as if I'd said something else. Come to the door and see me go up the wharf. I didn't like to hurt his feelings, but I thought I should have bust. He walked up that wharf like a dancing bear in a pair of trousers too tight for it. But he was so pleased with himself that I didn't like to tell him so. He went up and down two or three times, and I never saw anything so ridiculous in my life. It's all very well for us, he says, but what about other people? That's what I want to know. I'll go and have a drink and see whether anybody spots me. Before I could stop him, he started off to the bull's head and went in, while I stood outside and watched him. Half a pint of four ale, he says, smacking down a penny. I see the landlord draw the beer and give it to him, but he didn't seem to take no notice of him. Then, just to open his eyes a bit, I walked in and put down a penny and asked for half a pint. The landlord was just wiping down the counter at the time, and when I gave my order, he looked up and stood, staring at me, with the wet cloth held up in the air. He didn't say a word, not a single word. He stood there for a moment, smiling at us, foolish-like, and then he let go of the beer engine what he was holding in his left hand, and sat down heavy on the bar floor. We both put our heads over the counter to see what had happened to him, and he started making the most horrible noise I have ever heard in my life. I wonder it didn't bring the fire engines. The actor chap bolted out as if he'd been shot, and I was just thinking of following him when the landlord's wife and his two daughters came rushing out and asking me what I'd done to him. <laughs> it was two of him says the landlord, trembling, and holding on to his wife's arm as they helped him and got him in the chair. Two of him! Two of what? says his wife. Two! Two watchmen! says the landlord, both exactly alike, and both asking for half a pint of four ale. Yes, yes, says his wife. You come and lay down, Pa, says the gals. I tell you, there was, says the landlord, getting his colour back, with temper, "'Yes, yes, I know all about it,' says his wife. "'You come inside for a bit, and, Gertie, you bring your father in a soda, a large soda.' They got him in after a lot of trouble, but three times he came back as far as the door, holding on to them and taking a little peep at me. The last time he shook his head at me and said if I did it again I could go and get my half-pint somewhere else. I finished the beer what the actor had left, and after telling the landlord I hoped his eyesight would be better in the morning, I went outside, and after a careful look around, walked back to the wharf. I pushed the wicket open a little way and peeped in. The actor was standing just by the first crane, talking to two of the hands off of the salt tram. He'd got his back to the light, but how it was they didn't twig his voice, I can't think. They were so busy talking that I crept along by the side of the wall and got to the office without their seeing me. I went into the private office and turned out the gas there and sat down to wait for him. Then I heard a noise outside that took me to the door again and kept me there, holding on to the doorpost and gasping for me breath. The cook of the sultan was sitting on a paraffin cask playing the mouth organ, and the actor, with his arms folded across his stomach, was dancing a hornpipe as if he'd gone mad. I never saw anything so ridiculous in my life, and when I recollected that they thought it was me, I thought I should have dropped. A night watchman can't be too careful, and I knew that it'd be all over whopping next morning that I'd been dancing to a tuppy apeny mouth organ played by a ship's cook. A man that does his duty always has a lot of people ready to believe the worst of him. I went back into the dark office and waited, and by and by I heard him coming along to the gate and patting him on the back and saying he ought to be in a pantomime instead of wasting his time night watching. He left him at the gate, and then he came into the office, smiling as if he'd done something clever. "'What do you think of me for an understudy?' he says, laughing. "'They all thought it was you. It wasn't one of them. Had the slightest suspicion. Not one.' "'And what about my character?' I says, folding my arms across my chest and looking at him. "'Character?' he says, staring. "'Why, there's no harm in dancing. It's an innocent enjoyment.' It ain't one of my innocent enjoyments, I says, and I don't want the credit of it. If they ain't been sitting in a pub all evening, they'd have spotted you at once. Oh, he says, very huffy. How? Your voice, I says. You try and mimic a pole parrot and think it's like me. 
and for another thing you walk about as though your stuff was sawdust. I beg your pardon, he says. The voice and the walk are exact. Exact. What, I says, looking him up and down. You stand there and have the impudence to tell me that my voice is like that. I do, he says. Then I'm sorry for you, I says. I thought you'd got more sense. He stood looking at me and gnawing his finger and by the by, he says, are oh, you married? he says. I am, I says, very short. Where do you live? he says. I told him. Very good, he says. Perhaps I'll be able to convince you after all. By the way, what do you call your wife? Mrs? Yes, I says, staring at him. But what's it got to do with you? Nothing, he says. Nothing. Only I'm going to try the pale pot voice and the sawdust walk on her, that's all. If I can deceive her, that'll settle it. Deceive her, I says. Do you think I'm going to let you go round to my house and get me into trouble with my missus like that? Why, you must be crazy. That dancing must have got into your head. Where's the arm, he says, very sulky. Arm, I says. I won't have it, that's all. And if you knew my missus, you'd know without any telling. I'll bet you a pound to a sixpence she wouldn't know me, he says, very earnest. She won't have the chance, I says, so that's all about it. He stood there argifying for about ten minutes, but I was firm as a rock. I wouldn't move an inch, and at last, after we was both on the point of losing our tempers, he picked up his bag and said as how he must be getting off home. But ain't you going to take those things off first, I says? No, he says, smiling. I'll wait till I get home. Ta-ta. He put his bag on his shoulder and walked to the gate, with me following of him. I expect I shall see a cab soon, he says. Goodbye. What are you laughing at, I says. Only thoughts, he says. Have you got far to go, I says. No, just about the same distance as you have, he says. And he went off, spluttering like a soda water bottle. I took the broom and had a good sweep up after he'd gone, and I was just in the middle of it. When the cook and the other two chaps from the Saltram came back with three other sailormen and a brewer's drayman they had brought to see me dance. Same as you did a little while ago, Bill, says the cook, taking out his beastly mouth organ and wiping it on his sleeve. What tune would you like? I couldn't get away from them, and when I told them I'd never danced in my life, the cook asked me where I expected to go to. He told the drayman that I'd been dancing like a fairy in sea boots and they all got in front of me and wouldn't let me pass. I lost my temper at last, and after they had taken the broom away from me, and the drayman and one of the sailormen had said what they'd do to me if I was only fifty years younger, they sheared off. I locked the gate after them, and went back to the office, and I hadn't been there above half an hour, when somebody started ringing the gate bell as if they was mad. I thought it was the cook's lot come back at first, so I opened the wicket just a trifle and peered out, there was an hansom cab standing outside, and I'd hardly got my nose to the crack when the actor chap, still in my clothes, pushed the door open and nipped in. "'You've lost,' he says, pushing the door to and smiling all, all over. "'Where's your sixpence?' "'Lost,' I says, hardly able to speak. "'Do you mean to tell me you've been to my wife? Are all, are all I said to you?' "'I do,' he says, nodding and smiling again. "'They were both deceived, as easy as easy.' Both, I says, staring at him. Both what? How many wives do you think I've got? What do you mean by it? Or I left you, he says, giving me a little poke in the ribs. I picked up a cab, and first, leaving my bag at Oldgate, I drove on to your house and knocked at the door. I knocked twice, and then an angry-looking woman opened it and asked me what I wanted. It's all right, missus, I says. I've got half an hour off, and I've come to take you out for a walk. What, she says, drawing back with a start. Just a little turn round to see the shops, I says. And if there's anything in particular you'd like and it don't cost too much, you shall have it. I thought at first from the way she took it, she wasn't used to you giving her things. How dare you, she says, I'll have you looked up. How dare you insult a respectable married woman. You wait till my husband comes home. But I am your husband, I says. Don't you know me, my pretty? Don't you know your pet sailor boy? She gave a screech like a steam engine, and then she went next door and began knocking away like mad. Then I see that I'd gone to number twelve instead of number fourteen. Your wife, 
Your real wife came out to number fourteen, and she was worse than the other. But they both thought it was you. There's no doubt of that. They chased me all the way up the road, and if it hadn't have been for this cab that was just passing, I don't know what would have happened to me. He shook his head and smiled again, and after opening the wicket a trifle and telling the cabman he shouldn't be long, he turned to me and asked me for the sixpence to wear on his watch chain. Sixpence, I says. Sixpence? What do you think is going to happen to me when I go home? Oh, I haven't thought of that, he says. Yes, of course. What about my wife's jealousy, I says. What about the other and her husband, a cooper as big as an house? Well, well, he says, one can't think of everything. It'll be all the same a hundred years hence. Look here, I says, taking his shoulder in a grip of iron. You come back with me now, in that cab, and explain. Do you see? That's what you've got to do. All right, he says, certainly. Is, sir, uh, is the husband bad-tempered? You'll see, I says, but that's your business. Come along. With pleasure, he says, helping me in. Half a mo, while I tell the cabby where to drive to. He went back to the back of the cab, and afore I knew what had happened, the horse had got a flick over the head with the whip and was going along at a gallop. I kept putting the little flap up and telling the cabby to stop, but he didn't take the slightest notice. After I'd done it three times, he kept it down so I couldn't open it. There was a crowd round my door when the cab drove up, and in the middle of it was my missus, the woman next door, and her husband, what had just come home. Half a dozen of them helped me out, and before I could say a word, the cabman drove off and left me there. I dream of it now sometimes, standing there explaining and explaining until, just as I feel I can't bear it any longer, two policemen come up and help me indoors. If they had helped my missus outside, it would be an easier dream to have. End of His Other Self by W. W. Jacobs Read by Tony Foster The Finest Story in the World by Rudyard Kipling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Tony Foster The Finest Story in the World by Rudyard Kipling O oh, ever the knightly years were gone, with the old world to the grave, I was a king in Babylon, and you were a Christian slave. W. E. Henley His name was Charlie Mears. He was the only son of his mother, who was a widow, and he lived in the north of London, coming into the city every day to work in a bank. He was twenty years old, and suffered from aspirations. I met him in a public billiard saloon where the marker called him by his given name, and he called the marker Bull's Eyes. Charlie explained a little nervously that he had only come to the place to look on, and since looking on at games of skill is not a cheap amusement for the young, I suggested that Charlie should go back to his mother. That was our first step toward better acquaintance. He would call on me sometimes in the evenings, instead of running about London with his fellow clerks, and before long, Speaking of himself as a young man must, he told me of his aspirations, which were all literary. He desired to make himself an undying name, chiefly through verse, though he was not above sending stories of love and death to the drop-a-penny-in-the-slot journals. It was my fate to sit still while Charlie read me poems of many hundred lines and bulky fragments of plays that would surely shake the world. My reward was his unreserved confidence and the self-revelations and troubles of a young man are almost as holy as those of a maiden. Charlie had never fallen in love, but was anxious to do so on the first opportunity. He believed in all things good and all things honourable, but at the same time was curiously careful to let me see that he knew his way about the world, as befitted a bank clerk on twenty-five shillings a week. He rhymed dove with love and moon with June and devoutly believed that they had never been so rhymed before. The long lame gaps in his plays he filled up with hasty words of apology and description, and swept on, seeing all that he intended to do, so clearly, that he esteemed it already done, and turned to me for applause. I fancy that his mother did not encourage his aspirations, 
and I know that his writing table at home was the edge of a washstand. This he told me almost at the outset of our acquaintance, when he was ravaging my bookshelves, and a little before I was implored to speak the truth as to his chances of writing something really great, you know. Maybe I encouraged him too much, for one night he called on me, his eyes flaming with excitement, and said breathlessly, "'Do you mind? Can you let me stay here and write all evening? I, I won't interrupt you. I won't, really. There's no place for me to write in at my mother's.' "'What's the trouble?' I said, knowing well what the trouble was. "'I've a notion in my head that would make the most splendid story that was ever written. Do let me write it out here. It's such a notion.' There was no resisting the appeal. I set him a table. He hardly thanked me, but plunged into the work at once. For half an hour the pen scratched without stopping. Then Charlie sighed and tugged his hair. The scratching grew slower. There were more erasures, and at last ceased. The finest story in the world would not come forth. "'It looks such awful rot now,' he said mournfully. "'And yet it seemed so good when I was thinking about it. What's wrong?' I could not dishearten him by saying the truth, so I answered, "'Perhaps you don't feel in the mood for writing.' "'Yes, I do, except when I look at this stuff. Ugh! Read me what you've done,' I said. He read, and it was wondrous bad, and he paused at all the specially turgid sentences expecting a little approval, for he was proud of those sentences, as I knew he would be. "'It needs compression,' I suggested, cautiously. "'Oh, I hate cutting my things down. I don't think you could alter a word here without spoiling the sense. It reads better aloud than when I was writing it. Charlie, you're suffering from an alarming disease afflicting a numerous class. Put the thing by, and tackle it again in a week. I want to do it at once. What do you think of it?' How can I judge from a half-written tale? Tell me the story as it lies in your head. Charlie told, and in the telling there was everything that his ignorance had so carefully prevented from escaping into the written word. I looked at him, and wondering whether it were possible that he did not know the originality, the power of the notion that had come in his way. It was distinctly a notion among notions. Men had been puffed up with pride by notions not a tithe as excellent and practicable. But Charlie babbled on serenely, interrupting the current of pure fancy with samples of horrible sentences that he purposed to use. I heard him out to the end. It would be folly to allow his idea to remain in his own inept hands when I could do so much with it. Not all that could be done, indeed, but, oh, so much! "'What do you think?' he said at last. "'I fancy I shall call it the story of a ship.' "'I think the idea's pretty good, but you won't—' be able to handle it for ever so long. Now I—' "'Would it be of any use to you? Would you care to take it?' "'I should be proud,' said Charlie promptly. "'There are few things sweeter in this world than the guileless, hot-headed, intemperate, open admiration of a junior. Even a woman, in her blindest devotion, does not fall into the gait of a man she adores, tilt her bonnet to the angle at which he wears his hat, or interlard her speech with his pet oaths. And Charlie did all these things.' Still, it was necessary to salve my conscience before I possessed myself of Charlie's thoughts. "'Let's make a bargain. I'll give you a fiver for the notion,' I said. Charlie became a bank clerk at once. "'Oh, that's impossible. Between two pals, you know, if I may call you so. And, speaking as a man of the world, I couldn't. Take the notion, if it's any use to you. I've heaps more.' He had. None knew this better than I, but they were the notions of other men." "'Look at it as a matter of business, between men of the world,' I returned. Five pounds will buy you any number of poetry books. "'Business is business, and you may be sure I shouldn't give that price unless—' "'Oh, if you put it that way,' said Charlie, visibly moved by the thought of the books. The bargain was clinched, with an agreement that he should at, at unstated intervals come to me with all the notions that he possessed, should have a table of his own to write at— and unquestioned right to inflict upon me all his poems and fragments of poems. Then I said, "'Now, tell me how you came by this idea.' "'Came by itself?' Charlie's eyes opened a little. "'Yes, but you told me a great deal about the hero that you must have read before somewhere.' "'I haven't any time for reading, except when you let me sit here, and on Sundays. I'm on my bicycle or down the river all day. There's nothing wrong about the hero, is there?' "'Tell me again, and I shall understand clearly.' You say that your hero went pirating. How did he live? 
He was on the lower deck of this ship thing that I was telling you about. What sort of ship? It was the kind rowed with oars, and the sea spurts through the oar holes, and the men row sitting up to their knees in water. Then there's a bench running down between the two lines of oars, and an overseer with a whip walks up and down the bench to make the men work. How do you know that? It's in the table. There's a rope running overhead, looped to the upper deck, for the overseer to catch hold of when the ship rolls. When the overseer misses the rope once and falls among the rowers, remember the hero laughs at him and gets licked for it. He's chained to his oar, of course, the hero. How is he chained? With an iron band round his waist, fixed to the bench he sits on, and a sort of handcuff on his left wrist, chaining him to the oar. He's on the lower deck where the worst men are sent, and the only light comes from the hatchways and through the oar holes. Can't you imagine the sunlight just squeezing through between the handle and the hole, and wobbling about as the ship moves? I can, but I can't imagine your imagining it. How could it be any other way? Now you listen to me. The long oars on the upper deck are managed by four men to each bench, the lower ones by three, and the lowest of all by two. Remember, it's quite dark on the lowest deck, and all the men there go mad. When a man dies at his oar on that deck, he isn't thrown overboard, but cut up in his chains and stuffed through the oar hole in little pieces. Why? I demanded, amazed, not so much at the information as the tone of command which in which it was flung out. To save trouble and to frighten the others. It needs two overseers to drag a man's body up to the top deck, and if the men at the lower deck oars were left alone, of course, they'd stop rowing, and try to pull up the benches by all standing up together in their chains. You've a most provident imagination. Where have you been reading about galleys and galley slaves? Nowhere that I remember. I row a little when I get the chance, but perhaps, if you say so, I may have read something. He went away shortly afterwards to deal with booksellers, and I wondered how a bank clerk aged twenty could put into my hands with a profligate abundance of detail, all given with absolute assurance, the story of extravagant and bloodthirsty adventure, riot, piracy, and death in unnamed seas. He led his hero a desperate dance through revolt against the overseas to command a ship of his own and ultimate establishment of a kingdom on an island somewhere in the sea, you know. And, delighted with my paltry five pounds, had gone out to buy the notions of other men, that these might teach him how to write. I had the consolation of knowing that this notion was mine by right of purchase, and I thought that I could make something of it. When next he came to me he was drunk, royally drunk on many poets, for the first time revealed to him his pupils were dilated, his words tumbled over each other, and he wrapped himself in quotations. Most of all, he was drunk with Longfellow. "'Isn't it splendid! Isn't it superb!' he cried, after hasty greetings. "'Listen to this. Wouldst thou,' so the helmsman answered, "'know the secret of the sea? Only those who brave its dangers comprehend its mystery. By gum! "'Only those who brave its dangers comprehend its mystery,' he repeated twenty times, walking up and down the room and forgetting me. "'But I can understand it, too,' he said to himself. "'I don't know how to thank you for the, that fiver. "'And this, listen, I remember the black wharves and the ships, "'and the sea-tides tossing free, "'and the Spanish sailors with bearded lips, "'and the beauty and mystery of the ships, "'and the magic of the sea.' I haven't braved any dangers, but I feel as if I knew all about it. You certainly seem to have a grip of the sea. Have you ever seen it? When I was a little chap I went to Brighton once. We used to live in Coventry, though, before we came to London. I never saw it. When descends on the Atlantic the gigantic storm-wind of the equinox. He shook me by the shoulder to make me understand the passion that was shaking himself. When that storm comes, he continued, I think that all the oars in the ship that I was talking about get broken, and the rowers have their chests smashed in by the bucking oar-heads. By the way, have you done anything with that notion of mine yet? No, I was waiting to hear more of it from you. Tell me how in the world you're so certain about the fittings of the ship. You know nothing of ships. I don't know. It's as real as anything to me until I try to write it down. I was thinking about it only last night in bed after you'd loaned me Treasure Island. 
and I made up a whole lot of new things to go into the story. What sort of things? About the food the men ate, rotten figs and black beans and wine in a skin bag passed from bench to bench. Was the ship built so long ago as that? As what? I don't know whether it was long ago or not. It's only a notion. But sometimes it seems just as real as if it was true. Do I bother you with talking about it? Not in the least. Did you make up anything else? Yes, but it's nonsense, Charlie flushed a little. Never mind, let's hear about it. Well, I was thinking over the story, and after a while I got out of bed and wrote down on a piece of paper the sort of stuff the men might be supposed to scratch on their oars with the edges of their handcuffs. It seemed to make the thing more lifelike. It is so real to me, you know. Have you the paper on you? Yes, but what's the use of showing it? It's only a lot of scratches. All the same, we might have them reproduced in the book on the front page. I'll attend to those details. Show me what your men wrote. He pulled out of his pocket a sheet of note paper with a single line of scratches upon it, and I put this carefully away. What is it supposed to mean in English? I said. Oh, I don't know. Perhaps it means I'm beastly tired. It's great nonsense, he repeated. But all those men in the ship seem as real people to me. Do do something to the notion soon. I should like to see it written and printed. But all you've told me would make a long book. Make it, then. You've only to sit down and write it out. Give me a little time. Have you any more notions? Not just now. I, I'm reading all the books I've bought. They're splendid. When he left, I looked at the sheet of notepaper with the inscription upon it. Then I took my head tenderly between both hands, to make certain that it was not coming off or turning round. Then, but there seemed to be no interval between quitting my rooms and finding myself arguing with a policeman outside a door marked private in a corridor of the British Museum. All I demanded, as politely as possible, was the Greek antiquity man. The policeman knew nothing except the rules of the museum, and it became necessary to forage through all the houses and offices inside the gates. An elderly gentleman called away from his lunch, put an end to my search, by holding the note-paper between finger and thumb and sniffing at it scornfully. "'What does this mean, hm? said he. "'So far as I can ascertain, it is an attempt to write extremely corrupt Greek on the part—' Here he glared at me with intention— "'of an extremely illiterate, um, person.' He read slowly from the paper. "'Pollock, Erkman, Tauchnitz, Henniker. Four names familiar to me. "'Can you tell me what the corruption is supposed to mean? "'The gist of the thing?' I asked. "'I have been, many times, overcome with weariness in this particular employment. "'That is the meaning.' He returned me the paper, and I fled without a word of thanks, explanation, or apology. I might have been excused for forgetting much. To me, of all men had been given the chance to write the most marvellous tale in the world, nothing less than the story of a Greek galley-slave, as told by himself. Small wonder that his dreaming had seemed real to Charlie. The fates that are so careful to shut the doors of each successive life behind us had, in this case, been neglectful and Charlie was looking, though that he did not know, where never man had been permitted to look with full knowledge since time began. Above all, he was absolutely ignorant of the knowledge sold to me for five pounds, and he would retain that ignorance, for bank clerks do not understand metempsychosis, and a sound commercial education does not include Greek. He would supply me, here I capered among the dumb gods of Egypt and laughed in their battered faces, with material to make my tale sure, so sure that the world would hail it as an impudent and vamped fiction. And I, I alone would know that it was absolutely and literally true. I alone held this jewel to my hand for the cutting and polishing. Therefore I danced again among the gods, till a policeman saw me, and took steps in my direction. It remained now only to encourage Charlie to talk, and here there was no difficulty but I had forgotten those accursed books of poetry. He came to me time after time, as useless as a surcharged phonograph, drunk on Byron, Shelley, or Keats. 
knowing now what the boy had been in his past lives, and desperately anxious not to lose one word of his babble, I could not hide from him my respect and interest. He misconstrued both into respect for the present soul of Charlie Mears, to whom life was as new as it was to Adam, and interest in his readings, and stretched my patience to breaking point by reciting poetry. Not his own now, but that of others. I wished every English poet blotted out of the memory of mankind. I blasphemed the mightiest names of song, because they had drawn Charlie from the path of direct narrative, and would later spur him to imitate them. But I choked down my impatience until the first flood of enthusiasm should have spent itself, and the boy returned to his dreams. "'What's the use of my telling you what I think, when these chaps wrote things for the angels to read?' he growled one evening. "'Why don't you write something like theirs?' "'I don't think you're treating me quite fairly,' I said, speaking under strong restraint. "'I've given you the story,' he said, shortly replunging into Lara. "'But I want the details. "'The things I make up about that damned ship that you call a galley, "'they're quite easy. You can just make them up yourself. "'Turn up the gas a little. I want to go on reading.' "'I could have broken the gas-globe over his head for his amazing stupidity.' I could indeed make up things for myself, did I only know what Charlie did not know that he knew. But since the doors were shut behind me, I could only wait his youthful pleasure, and strive to keep him in good temper. One minute's want of guard might spoil a priceless revelation. Now and again he would toss his books aside. He kept them in my rooms, for his mother would have been shocked at the waste of good money had she seen them, and launched into his sea-dreams. Again I cursed all the poets of England. The plastic mind of the bank clerk had been overlaid, coloured, and distorted by that which he had read, and the result was as delivered as a confused tangle of other voices, most like the muttered song through a city telephone in the busiest part of the day. He talked of the galley, his own galley had he but known it, with illustrations borrowed from the Bride of Abydos. He pointed the experiences of his hero with quotations from The Corsair, and threw in deep and desperate moral reflections from Cain and Manfred, expecting me to use them all. Only when the talk turned on Longfellow, with a jarring cross-currents dumb, and I knew that Charlie was speaking the truth as he remembered it. "'What do you think of this?' I said one evening, as soon as I understood the medium in which his memory worked best, and before he could expostulate, read him the whole of The Saga of King Olaf. He listened, open-mouthed, flushed his hands, drumming on the back of the sofa where he lay, till I came to the songs of Imar Tamberskelva and the verse, Imar then, the arrow taking from the loosened string, answered, That was Norway breaking neath thy hand, O king. He gasped with pure delight of sound. That's better than Byron, a little, I ventured. Better? Why, it's true! How could he have known? I went back and repeated, What was that? said Olaf, standing on the quarter-deck. Something heard I like the stranding of a shattered wreck. How could he have known how the ships crash and the oars rip out and go zzzzip all along the line? Why, only the other night. Uh, but go back, please, and read the scary of shrieks again. No, I'm tired. Let's talk. What happened the other night? I had an awful nightmare about that galley of ours. I dreamed I was drowned in a fight. You see, we ran alongside another ship in harbour. The water was dead still, except where our oars whipped it up. You know where I always sit in the galley? He spoke haltingly at f first, under a fine English fear of being laughed at. No, that's news to me, I answered meekly, my heart beginning to beat. On the fourth oar from the bow, on the right side, on the upper deck, there were four of us on the oar, all chained. I remember watching the water and trying to get my handcuffs off before the row began. Then we closed up on the other ship and all their fighting men jumped over our bulwarks, and the bench broke, and I was pinned down with the three other fellows on top of me, and the big oar jammed across our backs. Well, Charlie's eyes were alive and alight. He was looking at the wall behind my chair. I don't know how we fought. The men were trampling all over my back, and I lay low. Then our rowers on the left side, tied to their oars, you know, began to yell and back water. I could hear the water sizzle, and we spun round like a cockchafer, and I knew, lying where I was, that there was a galley coming up bow on, to ram us on the left side. 
I could just lift my, up my head and see her sail over the bulwarks. We wanted to meet her bow to bow, but it was too late. We could only turn a little because the galley on our right had hooked herself on to us and stopped our moving. Then, by gum, there was a crash. Our left oars began to break, as the other galley, the moving one, you know, stuck her nose into them. Then the lower deck oars shot up through the deck planking, butt first, and one of them jumped clean up into the air and came down again close to my head. How was that managed? The moving galley's bow was plunking them back through their own oar holes, and I could hear the devil of a shindy in the decks below. Then her nose caught us neatly in the middle, and we tilted sideways, and the fellows in the right-hand galley unhitched their hooks and ropes and threw things on to our upper deck arrows and hot pitch or something that stung, and we went up and up and up on the left side, and the right side dipped, and I twisted my head round and saw the water stand still as it topped the right bulwarks, then it curled over and crashed down on the whole lot of us on the right side, and I felt it hit my back, and I woke. One minute, Charlie. When the sea topped the bulwarks, what did it look like? I had my reasons for asking. A man of my acquaintance had once gone down with a leaking ship in a still sea, and had seen the water-level pause for an instant ere it fell on the deck. It looked just like a banjo-string, drawn tight, and it seemed to stay there for years," said Charlie. Exactly. The other man had said, it looked like a silver wire laid down along the bulwarks, and I thought it was never going to break. He had paid everything except the bare life for this little valueless piece of knowledge and I had travelled ten thousand weary miles to meet him and take his knowledge at second hand. But Charlie, the bank clerk on twenty-five shillings a week, he who had never been out of sight of a London omnibus, knew it all. It was no consolation to me that once in his lives he had been forced to die for his gains. I also must have died scores of times. But behind me, because I could have used my knowledge, the doors were shut. And then, I said, trying to put away the devil of envy, the funny thing was, though, in all the mess, I didn't feel a bit astonished or frightened. It seemed as if I'd been in a good many fights, because I told my next man so when the row began. But that cad of an overseer on my deck wouldn't unloose our chains and give us a chance. He always said that we'd all be set free after a battle, but we never were. We never were. Charlie shook his head mournfully. What a scoundrel! I should say that he was. He never gave us enough to eat, and sometimes we were so thirsty that we used to drink salt water. I can taste that salt water still. Now tell me something about the harbour where the fight was fought. I didn't dream about that. I know it was a harbour, though, because we were tied up to a ring on a white wall, and all the face of the stone under water was covered with wood to prevent our ram getting chipped when the tide made us rock. That's curious. Our hero commanded the galley, didn't he? Didn't he just? He stood by the bows and shouted like a good'un. He was the man who killed the overseer. But you were all drowned together, Charlie, weren't you? I can't make that fit quite, he said, with a puzzled look. The galley must have gone down with all hands, and yet I fancy that the hero went on living afterward. Perhaps he climbed into the attacking ship. I wouldn't see that, of course. I was dead, you know. He shivered slightly and protested that he could remember no more. I did not press him further, but to satisfy myself that he lay in ignorance of the workings of his own mind, deliberately introduced him to Mortimer Collins's transmigration, and gave him a sketch of the plot before he opened the pages. "'What rot it all is!' he said, frankly, at the end of an hour. "'I don't understand his nonsense about the red planet Mars and the King and the rest of it. Chuck me the long fellow again.' I handed him the book, and wrote out as much as I could remember of his description of the sea-fight appealing to him from time to time for confirmation of fact or detail. He would answer without raising his eyes from the book, as assuredly as though all his knowledge lay before flint on the printed page. I spoke under the normal key of my voice, that the current might not be broken, and I know that he was not aware of what he was saying, for his thoughts were out on the sea with Longfellow. Charlie, I asked, when the rowers on the galleys mutinied, how did they kill their overseers? tore up the benches and brained them. That happened when a heavy sea was running. An overseer on the lower deck slipped from the centre plank and fell among the rowers. They choked him to death against the side of the ship with their chained hands, quite quietly, and it was too dark for the other overseer to see what had happened. 
when he was asked he was pulled down too and choked, and the lower deck fought their way up deck by deck, with the pieces of the broken benches banging behind them. How they howled! And what happened after that? I don't know. The hero went away, red hair and red beard and all. That was after he had captured our galley, I think. The sound of my voice irritated him, and he motioned slightly with his left hand as a man does when interruption jars. "'You never told me he was red-headed before, or that he captured your galley,' I said, after a discreet interval. Charlie did not raise his eyes. "'He was as red as a red bear,' said he, abstractedly. "'He came from the north. They said so in the galley when he looked for rowers, not slaves, but free men. Afterwards, years and years afterwards, news came from another ship, or else he came back.' His lips moved in silence. He was rapturously retasting some poem before him. Where had he been, then? I was almost whispering that the sentence might come gentle to whichever section of Charlie's brain was working on my behalf. To the beaches? The long and wonderful beaches, was the reply, after a minute of silence. To Ferdor Strandi? I asked, tingling from head to foot. Yes, to Ferdor Strandi. He pronounced the word in a new fashion. And I, too, saw the voice failed. "'Do you know what you have said?' I shouted incautiously. He lifted his eyes, fully roused now. "'No,' he snapped. "'I wish you'd let a chap go on reading. Hark to this. But, oh, there, the old sea captain, he neither paused nor stirred till the king listened, and then once more took up his pen and wrote down every word. And to the king of the Saxons, in witness of the truth, raising his noble head, he stretched his brown hand and said, "'Behold this walrus tooth! "'By Jove, what chaps these must have been "'to go sailing all over the shop, "'never knowing where they'd fetch the land! "'Ha!' "'Charlie,' I pleaded, "'if you'd only be sensible for a minute or two, "'I'll make our hero in our tale "'every inch as good as Othair. Oh, "'Longfellow wrote that poem. "'I don't care about writing things any more. "'I want to read.' "'He was thoroughly out of tune now, "'and raging over my own ill luck, "'I left him. Conceive yourself at the door of the world's treasure house, guarded by a child, an idle, irresponsible child playing knuckle bones, on whose favour depends the gift of the key, and you will imagine one half my torment. Till that evening Charlie had spoken nothing that might not lie within the experience of a Greek galley slave. But now, or there was no virtue in books, he had talked of some desperate adventure of the Vikings, of Forthen Karlsefner's sailing to Wineland, which is America, in the ninth or tenth century. The battle in the harbour he had seen, and his own death he had described, but this was a much more startling plunge into the past. Was it possible that he had skipped half a dozen lives, and was then dimly remembering some episode of a thousand years later? It was a maddening jumble, and the worst of it was, was that Charlie Mears, in his normal condition, was the last person in the world to clear it up. I could only wait and watch, but I went to bed that night full of the wildest imaginings. There was nothing that was not possible if Charlie's detestable memory only held good. I might rewrite the saga of Thorfinn Karlsefne, as if it had never been written before, might tell the story of the first discovery of America, myself the discoverer but I was entirely at Charlie's mercy, and so long as there was a three-and-sixpenny bone volume within his reach, Charlie would not tell. I dared not curse him openly. I hardly dared jog his memory, for I was dealing with the experience of a thousand years ago, told through the mouth of a boy of today, and a boy of today is affected by every change of tone and gust of opinion, so that he lies even when he desires to speak the truth. I saw no more of him for nearly a week. When next I met him it was in Gracechurch Street, with a bill-book chained to his waist. Business took him over London Bridge, and I accompanied him. He was very full of the importance of that book, and magnified it. As we passed over the Thames we paused to look at a steamer unloading great slabs of white and brown marble. A barge drifted under the steamer's stern, and a lonely cow in that barge bellowed. Charlie's face changed from the face of the bank clerk to that of an unknown and, though he would not have believed this, a much shrewder man. He flung out his arm across the parapet of the bridge, and laughing very loudly said, When they heard our bulls below, the Skrullings ran away. I waited only for an instant, 
but the barge and the cow had disappeared under the bows of the steamer before I answered, "'Charlie, what do you suppose are scrollings? "'Never heard of them before. "'They sound like a new kind of seagull. "'What a chap you are for asking questions,' <laughs> he replied. "'I have to go to the cashier of the omnibus company yonder. "'Will you wait for me and we can lunch somewhere together? "'I have a notion for a poem.' "'No, thanks. I'm off. "'You're sure you know nothing about scrollings?' "'Not unless he's been entered for the Liverpool handicap.' He nodded and disappeared in the crowd. "'Now, it is written in the saga of Eric the Red, or that of Thorfinn Karlsefne, that nine hundred years ago, when Karlsefne's galleys came into Leif's booths, which Leif had erected in the unknown land called Markland, which may or may not have been Rhode Island, the Scrollings, and the Lord, he knows who these may or may not have been, came to trade with the Vikings, and ran away, because they were frightened at the bellowing of the cattle which Thorfinn had brought with him in the ships. But what in the world could a Greek slave know of that affair? I wandered up and down the streets, trying to unravel the mystery, and the more I considered it, the more baffling it grew. One thing only seemed certain, and that certainty took away my breath for a moment. If I came to full knowledge of anything at all, it would not be one life of the soul in Charlie Mears' body, but half a dozen, half a dozen several and separate existences spent on blue water in the morning of the world. Then I walked round the situation. Obviously, if I used my knowledge, I should stand alone and unapproachable until all men were as wise as myself. That would be something, but manlike I was ungrateful. It seemed bitterly unfair that Charlie's memory should fail me when I needed it most. Great powers above. I looked up at them through the fog smoke. Did the lords of life and death know what this meant to me? Nothing less than eternal fame of the best kind that comes from one and is shared by one alone? I'd be content, remembering Clive, I stood astounded at my own moderation, with the mere right to tell one story to work out one little contribution to the light literature of the day. If Charlie were permitted full recollection for one hour, for sixty short minutes of existences that had extended over a thousand years, I would forego all profit and honour from all that I should make of his speech. I would take no share in the commotion that would follow through the particular corner of the earth that calls itself the world. The thing should be put forth anonymously. Nay, I would make other men believe that they had written it. They would hire bull-hided self-advertising Englishmen to bellow it abroad. Preachers would found a fresh conduct of life upon it, swearing that it was new and that they had lifted the fear of death from all mankind. Every Orientalist in Europe would patronise it discursively with Sanskrit and Pali texts. Terrible women would invent unclean variants of the men's belief for the elevation of their sisters. Churches and religions would war over it. Between the hailing and restarting of an omnibus, I foresaw the scuffles that would rise among half a dozen denominations, all professing the doctrine of the true metempsychosis as applied to the world and the new era, and saw, too, the respectable English newspapers shying like frightened kine over the beautiful simplicity of the tale. The mind leaped forward a hundred, two hundred, a thousand years. I saw with sorrow that men would mutilate and garble the story, that rival creeds would turn it upside down, till, at last, the Western world, which clings to the dread of death more closely than the hope of life, would set it aside as an interesting superstition, and stampede after some faith so long forgotten that it seemed altogether new. Upon this I changed the terms of the bargain that I would make with the lords of life and death. Only let me know. Let me write the story with sure knowledge that I wrote the truth, and I would burn the manuscript as a solemn sacrifice. Five minutes after the last line was written, I would destroy it all. But I must be allowed to write it with absolute certainty. There was no answer. The flaming colours of an aquarium poster caught my eye, and I wondered whether it would be wise or prudent to lure Charlie into the hands of a professional mesmerist, and whether, if he were under his power, he would speak of his past lives. If he did, and if people believed him, but Charlie would be frightened and flustered, or made conceited by the interviews. In, any, in either case he would begin to lie, through fear or vanity. He was safest in my own hands. 
"'They are very funny fools, your English,' said a voice at my elbow, and turning round I recognised a casual acquaintance, a young Bengali law student called Grish Chanda, whose father had sent him to England to become civilised. The old man was a retired native official, and on an income of five pounds a month contrived to allow his son two hundred pounds a year and the run of his teeth in a city where he could pretend to be the cadet of a royal house, and tell stories of the brutal Indian bureaucrats who ground the faces of the poor. Grishchanda was a young, fat, full-bodied Bengali, dressed with scrupulous care in frock-coat, tall hat, light trousers and tan gloves. But I had known him in the days when the brutal Indian government paid for his university education, and he contributed cheap sedition to Sachi Durpan, and intrigued with the wives of his schoolmates. "'That is very funny and very foolish,' he said, nodding at the poster. "'I am going down to the Northbrook Club. Will you come too?' I walked with him for some time. "'You are not well,' he said. "'What is there in your mind? You do not talk.' "'Chris Chunder, you have been too well educated to believe in a god, haven't you?' "'Ah, oh, yes, here. But when I go home—' I must conciliate popular superstition, and make ceremonies of purification, and my women will anoint idols, and bang up Tulsi, and feast the Purohit, and take you back into caste again, and make a good Kutri of you again, you advanced social three-thinker. And you'll eat desi food, and like it all, from the smell in the courtyard to the mustard oil over you. I shall very much like it, said Grishchanda unguardedly. Once a Hindu, always a Hindu. "'But I like to know what the English think they know.' "'I'll tell you something that one Englishman knows. "'It's an old tale to you.' "'I began to tell the story of Charlie in English, "'but Grishchanda put a question in the vernacular, "'and the history went forward naturally "'in the tongue best suited for its telling. "'After all, it could never have been told in English. "'Grishchanda heard me, nodding from time to time, "'and then came up to my rooms, where I finished the tale. "'Beshak,' he said philosophically, "'Lekin thou as a banhai.' "'Without doubt, but the door is shut. "'I have heard of this remembering of previous existences among my people. "'It is, of course, an old tale with us. "'But to happen to an Englishman, a Kaufen Malech, an outcast, "'by Jove, that is most peculiar. "'Outcast yourself, Grishchanda. You eat cow beef every day. "'Let's think the thing over. The boy remembers his incarnations.' "'Does he know that?' said Grishchanda quietly, swinging his legs as he sat at my table. He was speaking in English now. "'He does not know anything. Would I speak to you if he did? Go on.' "'There is no going on at all. If you tell that to your friends, they will say you are mad, and put it in the papers. Suppose now you prosecute for libel. Let's leave that out of the question entirely. Is there any chance of his being made to speak?' "'There is a chance. Oh, yes! "'But if he spoke, it would mean that all this world would end now. "'Instanto, fall down on your head. "'These things are not allowed, you know. "'As I said, the door is shut. "'Not a ghost of a chance. "'How can there be? "'You are a Christian, and it is forbidden to eat in your books of the Tree of Life, "'or else you would never die. "'How shall you all fear death? "'if you all know what your friend does not know that he knows. "'I am afraid to be kicked, but I am not afraid to die, "'because I know what I know. "'You are not afraid to be kicked, but you are afraid to die. "'If you are not, by God! "'You English would be all over the shop in an hour, "'upsetting the balances of power and making commotions. "'It would not be good. "'But no fear. "'He will remember a little and a little less, "'and he will call it dreams.' Then he will forget altogether. When I passed my first arts examination in Calcutta, that was all in the cram book on Wordsworth. Trailing clouds of glory, you know. This seems to be an exception to the rule. There are no exceptions to rules. Some are not so hard-looking as others, but they are all the same when you touch. If this friend of yours said so and so and so and so, indicating that he remembered all his lost lives, or one piece of a lost life, he would not be in the bank another hour. He would be what you called sack, because he was mad, and they would send him to an asylum for lunatics. You can see that, my friend. Of course I can, but I wasn't thinking of him. 
His name need never appear in the story. Aha! I see. That story will never be written. You can try. I am going to. For your own credit and for the sake of money, of course. No, for the sake of writing the story. On my honour that will be all. Even then there is no chance. You cannot play with the gods. It is a very pretty story now. As they say, let it go on that. I mean at that. Be quick. It will not last long. How do you mean? What I say. He has never so far thought about a woman. Hasn't he, though? I remembered some of Charlie's confidences. I mean no woman has thought about him. When that comes, Boshogya, all up, I know. There are millions of women here. Housemaids, for instance. I winced at the thought of my story being ruined by a housemaid, and yet nothing was more probable. Chris Chander grinned. Yes, also pretty girls, cousins of his house and perhaps not of his house. One kiss that he gives back again and remembers will cure all this nonsense or else. Or else what? Remember, he does not know that he knows. I know that, or else, if nothing happens, he will become immersed in the trade and the financial speculations like the rest. It must be so. You can see that it must be so. But the woman will come first, I think. There was a rap at the door, and Charlie charged in impetuously. He had been released from office, and by the look in his eyes I could see that he had come over for a long talk, most probably with poems in his pockets. Charlie's poems were very wearying, but sometimes they led him to talk about the galley. Grish Chunder looked at him keenly for a minute. I, I beg your pardon, Charlie said uneasily. I, I didn't know you had anyone with you. I am going, said Grish Chunder. He drew me into the lobby as he departed. That is your man, he said quickly. I tell you, he will never speak all you wish. That is rot, bosh. But he would be most good to make to see things. Suppose now we pretend that it was only play. I had never seen Grish Chunder so excited. And pour the ink pool into his hand. Eh, what do you think? I tell you that he could see anything a man could see. Let me get the ink and the camphor. He is a seer, and he will tell us very many things. He may be all you say, but I am not going to trust him to your gods and devils. It will not hurt him. He will only feel a little stupid and dull when he wakes up. You have seen boys look into the ink pool before. That's the reason why I am not going to see it any more. You'd better go, Grischander. He went, declaring far down the staircase that it was throwing away my only chance of looking into the future. This left me unmoved, for I was concerned with the past, and no peering of hypnotized boys into mirrors and ink pools would help me do that. But I recognized Grish Chunder's point of view, and sympathized with it. "'What a big black brute that was,' said Charlie when I returned to him. "'Well, look here. I've just done a poem. Did it instead of playing dominoes after lunch. May I read it?' Let me read it myself. Then you miss the proper expression. Besides, you always make my things sound as if the rhymes were all wrong. Read it aloud, then. You're like the rest of them. Charlie mouthed me his poem, and it was not much worse than the average of his verses. He had been reading his book faithfully, but he was not pleased when I told him that I preferred my Longfellow undiluted with Charlie. Then we began to go through the MS, line by line. Charlie parrying every objection and correction with, Yes, that may be better, but you don't catch what I'm driving at. Charlie was, in one way at least, very like one kind of poet. There was a pencil scrawl at the back of the paper, and, What's that, I said? Oh, that's not poetry at all. It's some rot I wrote last night before I went to bed, and it was too much bother to hunt for rhymes, so I made it a sort of blank verse instead. Here is Charlie's blank verse. We pulled for you when the wind was against us and the sails were low. Will you never let us go? We ate bread and onions, and when you took towns or ran aboard, quickly when you were beaten back by the foe. The captains walked up and down the deck in fair weather, singing songs, but we were below. We fainted with our chins on the oars, and you did not see that we were idle, for we still swung to and fro. Will you never let us go? The salt made at the oar handles like shark skin. Our knees were cut to the bone with salt cracks. Our hair was stuck to our foreheads, and our lips were cut to our gums, and you whipped us because we could not row. Will you never let us go? 
but in a little time we shall run out of portholes as the water runs along the oar blade and though you tell the others to row after us you will never catch us till you catch the oar thresh and tie up the winds in the belly of the sail aho will you never let us go mm, what's oar thresh charlie the water washed up by the oars that's the sort of song they might sing in the galley you know aren't you ever going to finish that story and give me some of the profits it depends on yourself if you had only told me more about your hero in the first instance it might have been finished by now you're so hazy in your notions i only want to give you the general notion of it the knocking about from place to place and the fighting and all that can't you fill in the rest yourself make the hero save a girl on a pirate galley and marry her or do something you're a really helpful collaborator i suppose the hero went through some few adventures before he married well then make him a very artful card a low sort of man a sort of political man who went about making treaties and breaking them a black-haired chap who hid behind the mast when the fighting began but you said the other day that he was red-haired i couldn't have make him black-haired of course you've no imagination seeing that i just discovered the entire principles upon which the half-memory falsely called imagination is based i felt entitled to laugh but forbore for the sake of the tale you're right you're the man with the imagination a black-haired chap in a decked ship i said no an open ship like a big boat this was maddening your ship has been built and designed closed and decked in you said so yourself i protested no no not that ship that was open or half decked because by jove you're right you made me think of the hero as a red-haired chap of course if he were red the ship would be an open one with painted sails surely i thought he would remember now that he had served in two galleys at least in a three-decked greek one under the black-haired political man and again in a viking's open sea serpent under the man red as a red bear who went to markland the devil prompted me to speak why of course charlie said i i don't know are you making fun of me the current was broken for the time being i took up a notebook and pretended to make many entries in it it's a pleasure to work with an imaginative chap like yourself i said after a pause the way that you've brought out the character of the hero is simply wonderful do you think so he answered with a pleased flush i often tell myself that there's more in me than my than people think there's an enormous amount in you then won't you let me send an essay on the ways of bank clerks to titbits and get the guinea prize that wasn't exactly what i meant old fellow perhaps it would be better to wait a little and go ahead with the galley story ah but i shan't get the credit of that titbits would publish my name and address if i win what are you grinning at they would i know it suppose you go for a walk i want to look through my notes about our story now this reprehensible youth who left me a little hurt and put back might for aught he or i knew have been one of the crew of the argo had certainly been slave or comrade to forth in Kalsefne. therefore he was deeply interested in guinea competitions remembering what grish chunder had said i laughed aloud the lords of life and death would never allow charlie mears to speak with full knowledge of his pasts and he and i must even piece out what he told me with my own poor inventions while charlie wrote of the ways of bank clerks i got together and placed on one file all my notes and the net result was not cheering i read them a second time there was nothing that might not have been compiled at second hand from other people's books except perhaps the story of the fight in the harbour the adventures of a viking had been written many times before the history of a greek galley slave was no new thing and though i wrote both who could challenge or confirm the accuracy of my details I might as well tell, tell a tale of two thousand years hence. The lords of life and death were as cunning as Grishchunder had hinted. They would allow nothing to escape that might trouble or make easy the minds of men. Though I was convinced of this, yet I could not leave the tale alone. Exaltation followed reaction, not once, but twenty times in the next few weeks. My moods varied with the March sunlight and flying clouds by night or in the beauty of a spring morning i perceived that i could write that tale and shift continents thereby in the wet windy afternoons i saw that the tale might indeed be written but would be nothing more than a faked false varnished sham rusted piece of wardour street work at the end then i blessed charlie in many ways 
though it was no fault of his, he seemed to be busy with prize competitions, and I saw less and less of him as the weeks went by, and the earth cracked and grew ripe to spring, and the buds swelled in their sheaths. He did not care to read or talk of what he had read, and there was a new ring of self-assertion in his voice. I hardly cared to remind him of the galley when we met, but Charlie alluded to it on every occasion, always as a story from which money was to be made. "'I think I deserve twenty-five per cent, don't I, at least?' he said, with a beautiful frankness. "'I supplied all the ideas, didn't I?' This greediness for silver was a new side in his nature. I assumed that it had been developed in the city, where Charlie was picking up the curious nasal drawl of the underbred city man. "'When the thing's done we'll talk about it. I can't make anything of it at present. Red-haired or black-haired hero are equally difficult.' He was sitting by the fire, staring at the red coals. "'I can't understand what you find so difficult. It's all as clean as mud to me,' he replied. A jet of gas puffed out between the bars, took light, and whistled softly. "'Suppose we take the red-haired hero's adventures first, from the time that he came south to my galley and captured it, and sailed to the beaches.' I knew better now than to interrupt Charlie. I was out of reach of pen and paper, and dared not move to get them, lest I should break the current. The gas-jet puffed and whinnied. Charlie's voice dropped almost to a whisper, and he told a tale of the sailing of an open galley to Fordustrandi, of sunsets on the open sea, seen under the curve of the one sail, evening after evening, when the galley's beak was notched into the centre of the sinking disk. And we sailed by that, for we had no other guide, quoth Charlie. He spoke of a landing on an island, and explorations in its woods, where the crew killed three men whom they found asleep under the pines. Their ghosts, Charlie said, followed the galley, swimming and choking in the water, and the crew cast lots and threw one of their number overboard as a sacrifice to the strange gods whom they had offended. Then they ate seaweed when their provisions failed, and their legs swelled, and their leader, the red-haired man, killed two rowers who mutinied, and after a year spent among the woods they set sail for their own country, and a wind that never failed carried them back so safely that they all slept at night. This and much more Charlie told. Sometimes the voice fell so low that I could not catch the words, though every nerve was on the strain. He spoke of their leader, the red-haired man, as a pagan speaks of his god for it was he who cheered them and slew them impartially, as he thought best for their needs, and it was he who steered them for three days among floating ice, each floe crowded with strange beasts that tried to sail with us, said Charlie, and we beat them back with the handles of the oars. The gas-jet went out, a burned coal gave way, and the fire settled down with a tiny crash to the bottom of the grate. Charlie ceased speaking, and I said no word. "'By Jove!' he said at last, shaking his head. "'I've been staring at the fire till I'm dizzy. "'What was I going to say?' "'Something about the galley. "'I remember now. "'It's twenty-five per cent of the profits, isn't it? "'It's anything you like when I've done the tale. "'I wanted to be sure of that. "'I must go now. "'I've, I've an appointment.' "'And he left me. "'Had my eyes not held, "'I might have known that that broken muttering over the fire "'was the swan-song of Charlie Mears. "'But I thought it the prelude to fuller revelation.' At last and at last I should cheat the lords of life and death. When next Charlie came to me I received him with rapture. He was nervous and embarrassed, but his eyes were very full of light. His lips parted a little. I've done a poem, he said, and then quickly. It's the best I've ever done. Read it. He thrust it into my hand and retreated to the window. I groaned inwardly. It would be the work of half an hour to criticise, that is to say, praise the poem sufficiently to please Charlie. Then I had good reason to groan, for Charlie, discarding his favourite centipede metres, had launched into shorter and choppier verse, and verse with a motive at the back of it. This is what I read. The day is most fair, the cheery wind hallows behind the hill, where bends the woods that seemeth good, and the sapling to his will. Riot, O wind, there is that in my blood that would not have thee still. She gave me herself, O earth, O sky, grey sea, she is mine alone. I let the sullen boulders hear my cry, and rejoice, though they be but stone. Mine, I have won her, O good brown earth. Make merry, tis barred on spring. Make merry, my love is doubly worth, all worship your fields can bring. Let the hind that tills you feel my mirth at the early harrowing. 
"'Yes, it's the early harrowing past a doubt,' I said, with a dread at my heart. Charlie smiled, but did not answer. "'Red cloud of the sunset, tell it abroad. I am victor. Greet me, O sun, dominant master and absolute lord, over the soul of one.' "'Well,' said Charlie, looking over my shoulder. I thought it far from well, and very evil indeed, when he silently laid a photograph on the paper, the photograph of a girl with a curly head and a foolish, slack mouth. "'Isn't it?' "'Isn't it wonderful?' he whispered, pink to the tips of his ears, wrapped in the rosy mystery of first love. "'I didn't know. I didn't think. It came like a thunderclap.' "'Yes, it comes like a thunderclap. Are you very happy, Charlie?' "'My God, she—she she loves me!' he sat down, repeating the last words to himself. I looked at the hairless face, the narrow shoulders already bowed by desk-work, and wondered when, where, and how he had loved in his past lives. "'What will your mother say?' I asked cheerfully. "'I don't care a damn what she says. "'At twenty the things for which one does not care a damn should properly be many, "'but one must not include mothers in the list. "'I told him this gently, and he described her, "'even as Adam must have described to the newly named beasts, "'the glory and tenderness and beauty of Eve. "'Incidentally I learned that she was a tobacconist's assistant "'with a weakness for pretty dress, "'and had told him four or five times already "'that she had never been kissed by a man before. "'Charlie spoke on, and on, and on, "'while I, separated from him by thousands of years, "'was considering the beginning of things. "'Now I understood why the lords of life and death "'shut the doors so carefully behind us. "'It is that we may not remember our first wooings. "'Were it not so, our world would be without inhabitants in a hundred years. "'Now, about that galley story,' I said, still more cheerfully, in a pause in the rush of the speech. Charlie looked up as though he had been hit. "'The galley? What galley? Good heavens! Don't joke, man! This is serious! You don't know how serious it is!' Grish Chanda was right. Charlie had tasted the love of a woman that kills remembrance, and the finest story in the world would never be written. End of The Finest Story in the World by Rudyard Kipling Read by Tony Foster